There's a lot of people who are I know. there. <laughs> Is the city clerk ready? I am, thank you. It says we are in a practice session. Good morning and welcome to the 1130 a.m. public portion of the closed session of the November 15th, 2022 meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council. If you would like to comment on a closed session item, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. In this part of the meeting, the council will receive public testimony. Thereafter, the public line will be closed and inaccessible. Please mute your television or streaming device once you call in and listen through the phone. Please note there is a delay in streaming, so if you continue to listen on your television or streaming device, you may miss your opportunity to speak. I would now like to ask the city clerk to please call roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council members Kalantari Johnson. Present. Council member Golder is absent. Cummings? Here. Brown? Here. Myers? Present. Vice Mayor Watkins? Here. And Mayor Bruner? Present. Thank you. The first order of business on this morning's agenda is item number one, referral to closed session for Tannery Arts Center, 890 River Street, 1000 River Street, and 1020 River Street. For members of the, of the public who are streaming this, if this is an item you wish to com comment on, now is the time to call in, and you can raise your hand by dialing star nine on your phone or selecting raise hand in the webinar controls of your computer. When it's your turn to speak, you will hear an announcement and the timer will be set to two minutes. Members of the public who are joining us here in chambers in person and wanting to comment on this item, please line up to the right of the dais and you will each have two minutes to speak. We request that you sign in to ensure correct spelling of your name in the meeting minutes, however, it's not required. I am now looking for a motion on agenda item one, referral to closed session. I will take that cue and make that motion to refer to closed session um, number one on our agenda, which is the Tannery Arts Center, 890 River Street, 1000 River Street and 1020 River Street. Okay, we have a motion by Vice Mayor Watkins. Is there a second? Okay. We have a second by Council Member Brown. May I have a roll call vote, please? Councilmember Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Boulder um, Cummings? Aye. Brown? Aye. Councilmember Myers? Aye. Vice Mayor Watkins? Aye. And Mayor Bruner? Aye. That motion passes unanimously with Councilmember Golder absent. Okay, this meeting will now adjourn to closed session and we will return at 1.30. One, Great, thank you. For those of you who are on the meeting and not part of closed session, please log off and come back at 1.30.
Welcome to our 1.30 p.m. session of the November 15th, 2022 meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council. And I would like to ask the clerk to please call roll. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Kalantari Johnson. Present. Boulder. Still absent. Cummings. Here. Brown. Here. Um, Councilmember Myers. She's joining Currently us yeah. virtually. Um, Vice Mayor Watkins. Here. And Mayor Bruner. Present. And Mayor, I don't, your camera's off. Thank you. Is Council Member Myers absent? Okay, I'm not seeing her. Okay, thank you. I just want to confirm that. Okay, our first item today, uh, we have a couple of presentations. Our first one is uh, a proclamation declaring November 26, 2022 as Small Business Saturday. Since its inception in 2010, Small Business Saturday, which falls between Black Friday and Cyber Monday, has illuminated the significance of supporting small independently owned businesses across the country. And whereas Small Business Saturday is a day dedicated to supporting the diverse range of local businesses that help create jobs, boost our economy, and keep communities thriving across the country. And whereas the city of Santa Cruz celebrates our small businesses and the contributions that they make to our local economy and community. And whereas 85% of Santa Cruz businesses are small businesses employing nine people or less. And whereas small businesses continue to recover from the impacts of the pandemic and rely on the holiday shopping season for much of their revenue and support of local shoppers to their businesses each year in order to survive. And whereas there are over 500 retail businesses in Santa Cruz providing nearly 4,800 jobs, and whereas purchasing goods and services from local and small businesses keeps those dollars local and contributes to a more vibrant and sustainable economy. And whereas the city of Santa Cruz encourages all residents and visitors to shop and dine locally and to recognize the impact that we can make when we support local small businesses. And whereas businesses across the country will be celebrating Small Business Saturday and encouraging shoppers to shop local. Now, therefore, I, Sonia Brenner, mayor of the city of Santa Cruz, do hereby proclaim Saturday, November 26, 2022, as Small Business Saturday Day in the city of Santa Cruz and encourage all citizens to join me in shopping local and throughout the year. Thank you. Our next presentation is a pro uh, proclamation. Uh, we have a special guest for this proclamation. I'd like to welcome Assembly Member Mark Stone. Would you like to step forward? Did uh, Bonnie Lipscomb, did you want to say a few words first or after I read the, okay. Uh, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Good to be here. It is my great pleasure to present this proclamation to you. Assembly member Mark Stone has a remarkable record of public service. Having served on the Scotts Valley School Board, County of Santa Cruz Board of Supervisors, California Coastal Commission, and California State Assembly for a total of nearly 25 years. And whereas as the chair of the California Assembly Judiciary Committee 
Assemblymember Mark Stone has been instrumental in passing legislation that creates a more just and equitable law enforcement and court system in California. And whereas during his years in the California legislature, Assemblymember Mark Stone has sponsored numerous legislative initiatives to improve the state's environment and protect its marine and coastal environment. And whereas in his 10 years in State Assembly, Assemblymember Mark Stone has sponsored legislation that reformed California's foster care system to ensure that there is continuing support for literally thousands of foster children, providing a path forward for successful futures. And whereas when the City of Santa Cruz requested legislative assistance, Assemblymember Mark Stone was always willing to help, no matter how small or large the request, advocating for funds for affordable housing and the restoration of the San Lorenzo River are among a few of his locally based initiatives. And whereas when the city needed assistance with various state agencies, Assemblymember Mark Stone and his district and Sacramento staff were always available to provide immediate and effective assistance. And whereas during his many years of public service, Assemblymember Mark Stone has listened to all opinions and treated all persons with respect and courtesy, no matter what their point of view, and advocated for advancements in child welfare, foster care, criminal justice, mental health, and LGBTQ plus rights that benefited the Santa Cruz community. And whereas the Santa Cruz City Council, city staff, and Santa Cruz community now congratulate Assembly Member Mark Stone on his retirement from the California State Assembly and want him to know that he is valued here as a true representative of the community and his work on behalf of our community in California is so greatly appreciated. So now therefore I, Sonia Brunner, Mayor of the City of Santa Cruz, do hereby proclaim today, November 15th, 2022, as Mark Stone Day in the City of Santa Cruz and encourage all citizens to join me in commending Assemblymember Mark Stone for his many years of providing invaluable assistance to the City of Santa Cruz and its residents. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And we have a few people who would like to say a few words. I really appreciate the opportunity to acknowledge Assemblymember Stone and his years of exceptional dedicated service to the Santa Cruz community. And I should, I should back up and say my name is Bonnie Lipscomb, I'm Director of Economic Development and Housing at the city. I first met Assemblymember Stone back in 2012, right during the demise of redevelopment, which was a pretty tumultuous time. And um, his support and understanding of kind of what we were going through at the time really helped a really challenging process um, at the state level. I was struck by his genuine interest in hearing about the issues that impacted our community, particularly around affordable housing. I was also struck by just what a pragmatist he is. We would have these regular meetings, legislative meetings, and Maureen would set them up, and periodically we would talk through, and he was just really listened. Um, you're really a good listener. He would talk through some of the issues affecting our community and give us feedback on, yeah, you, you know, you could take this to the, you know, you could make, take this forward as a bill, and probably not. This may not be the best path for this issue. So, it really gave us constructive feedback on how we could successfully sort of navigate what, you know, to us at the local government level is often, you know, a pretty challenging and unknown sort of path, you know, through through the state and through that through that process. 
He also has a great support team. Over the years, we really felt like we had a representative here through the field office with Maureen McCartney, always just sort of there for us, checking in with us periodically and really helping us move forward. Um, I also really want to acknowledge Assemblymember Stone, um, just how he's been an affordable housing advocate for us and a champion. Particularly, this goes back to AB 411, and some of you will remember our, our, our efforts to um, create that legislation that would have enabled us to take our uh, bond proceeds and our, on our capital side and turn that into affordable housing funding here in our community. We, with Assemblymember Stone's support, we navigated successfully through both the uh, both the assembly and the senate um but um unfortunately uh was vetoed by the governor um and i think that's more related to sort of redevelopment woes than the merits of of the of the bill but we wouldn't have gotten that far at all without assembly member stone and i just want to acknowledge uh, him for that and his support in um really championing that for us in our community and recognizing that affordable housing is one of the most um, important issues in our community. So um, we have a true voice and representative in Assemblymember Stone. So thank you for your years of service. Um, congratulations on your retirement, um, well-earned retirement. And uh, it's really given me sort of renewed faith over the last 10 years in just our democratic process and that we have had leaders like you. So thank you. And Public Works Director Mark Dettel. Mark, Mark Dettel, Director of Public Works, just a few words. Um, I've known Assemblymember Stone for probably 25 years. We served on the Bond Oversight Committee for the Scotts Valley High School back then. But professionally, um, the last 20 years has been great. Um, the support for the environment and our mission that we provide, um, waste reduction, um, you know, plastic, issues that we find at the beach. Um, but what goes, comes to me is his support on the Coastal Commission when we came forward with Arana Gulch. That was a huge project for us and his support helped drive that thing and get it approved and get it built. And it's really a jewel for our community and I really, that, that one stands out for me. So Mark, I wanna thank you for all your support throughout the years and I wish you all the best in your retirement. And Water Director Rosemary Menard. Hello. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting to come here and sort of maybe a little bit last on this uh, cue that you've had. Um, so many of the words that I've been hearing to describe um, Assemblymember Stone have really resonated with me when I heard them. A great listener, accessible, somebody who really cared, someone who was uh, willing to give you good advice about, uh, you know, what he thought, but really, uh, open to hearing what your concerns were and um, you know you felt even if you didn't get something when you went over there you felt when you left that you had learned something about how the process works at a in a big state where a lot of things are going on and have to be managed so I really want to say uh, ditto to everything that Bonnie said to everything that Mark said and to everything that was in that resolution and thank you so much for your service You've been a real blessing to this community. Are there any uh, council members that would like to say any words? Vice Mayor Watkins? I'll just briefly say, on behalf of education, you have always been a champion for our youth and our young people at the state and have moved tremendous policy forward, particularly for our foster youth. And locally, having been connected and am currently connected to the efforts that are happening you've changed the lives of kids. So I just really want to thank you on behalf of all of education, Maureen as well, for always being champion, champions for our kids at the state of California and wish you the absolute best. Uh, Council Member Myers, you're muted. Can you hear me now? Yes, welcome. Okay. I also just, um, on a personal note of someone who loves to be in the ocean, I want to recognize Mark as our only assembly member that has actually swum the English Channel. So that is, I think, one of his most important uh, outgoing, uh, you know, outstanding things that he has done. 
But Mark, I also just want to thank you. Um, thank you for so much of your work uh, in the environmental field. Thank you for um, caring about uh, the things that we need to be thinking about for both present generations and for future generations. And um, I also was just uh, very touched by your work, um, especially around the Pacific Station uh, items that we were working on. And uh, Maureen, your work, uh, you guys just always have um, our local communities back in Sacramento and your understated uh, way of getting things done. I just um, so appreciate it. And you are a big giant, you are a giant in our community and I, I want you to know that. And so thank you for everything you've done. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy your ocean swims from now on. <laughs> <laughs> Council member Kalantari Johnson. All right. Um, thank you so much, Mark. Everything that's been said about you, but what really stands out is your compassion for the community and your pragmatism and finding a path forward. Um, I realize I've worked with you for 17 years when you were on the Board of Supervisors, and one thread that I've always been able to go to you on is you're a champion for children, as Vice Mayor Watkins said. Um, I think the first project we worked on was a social host ordinance. Um, making sure that youth and children uh, didn't have access to alcohol. And when we were working on youth homelessness at the state level, you were accessible, you gave guidance on how our coalition can elevate this topic at the state. Um, and even, you know, Davenport school kids who needed to cross the street safely, you're accessible to help us facilitate with Caltrans. So just, you're always there along with your fantastic team member, Maureen, um, and you have been, and I know you'll continue to be a champion for children. So thank you for all your work and your leadership. Thank you, Council Member Brown. I already had my uh, hearing up moment <laughs> at the Regional Transportation Commission, so I'll keep it short. Um, echoing everything that I've heard here today, uh, I also wanna uh, thank you for standing up for for workers and and working people's issues in a way that um, is has been really meaningful um, for for a lot of people in our community and beyond and um, and I you know I just think that you have you let's see how to say this really shortly so you you're we have a lot of representatives who I think you know represent us well and we say thank you for representing us but you have stayed so close to our community, in community with us, connected to our community in ways that I don't always see with elected officials who go to Sacramento, which you know really <laughs> is the center of the universe for um, for uh, a lot of people. And you just that maintaining that connection. I mean, I see you out there. You show up um, not for fanfare, um, but you show up to really meet people and hear from them and listen and take action on that. And um, I just wanna th take the opportunity to thank you again. Uh, so uh, we wish you all the best in your future endeavors. I know you're retiring from the legislature, but not retiring from uh, all the wonderful work <laughs> that lies ahead. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Cummings. I'm not gonna reiterate everything that my colleagues have said, but do want to appreciate all the work that you've done over the years, you know, related to kids, criminal justice, environment, workers, affordable housing. Um, but I do also want to really thank you for being so accessible during 2020 when I was mayor, um, you know, when we were going through the pandemic and all sorts, you know, pandemic, George Floyd, fires, you know, our community was going through a lot. And I just appreciated being able to reach out to your office you guys being able to you know hear our needs um, and really being you know that accessible because you know when we all started 2020 nobody knew what was going to happen nobody knew how long it was going to take and what kind of resources we were going to need and it really helped me better understand as mayor during that time what my role was in terms of communicating our needs to you all and it was just really great to be able to reach out to your office and um, have that support and know that you were there for us so um, just want the community to know that you know you were um, a big part of us being able to you know meet our needs at the state level, um, along with you know Jimmy Panetta at the federal level and many of our other representatives. But just want to appreciate you for making sure that you know Santa Cruz was safe and that um, we were getting our needs met during that very difficult time. 
Thank you, Councilmember Cummings. A lot of love in this room and appreciation, and, and thank you for supporting Santa Cruz in the ways that you have. Um, I hope we've been able to express that today. We really appreciate you joining us, and I'd like to offer you a chance to say any words if you'd like. Thank you, Madam Mayor and Council Members and, and City Staff. I, I appreciate this quite a bit. The part that you really got right, though, was mentioning Maureen, Capital Staff, and those folks. N none of us are effective without strong staff. And the members of your staff who spoke, I, I very much appreciate. And you have really world-class staff here. In fact, I'm going to tell a story on Bonnie Lipscomb. When we were running that RDA bill through, there is a certain senator who can be a bit of a blowhard and started throwing terms out, not expecting, I think, anybody to understand. And she went down whatever rat hole he decided to go until he ran out of pomp because she just answered everything. Mark Duttle, when I first met him, was working over the hill. You were smart to bring him here and bring him into Santa Cruz, where he could have come home and provide his skills here. He's been a real leader for the city in the public work side for a long time. And Rosemary has been absolutely fabulous, and as you know, in the water area, which around here is just kind of quiet, not controversial. Nobody <laughs> seems to have a beef about water. Well having the right people in the right places. And, and that is sometimes your most significant leader as elected members of the city council is ensuring that you have the right staff, the right people to provide guidance for you. What you do is not easy. And in a city like Santa Cruz, where you have a very active constituency, a lot of people wanting to weigh in and, and work with you, but yet what you do is part-time. I know it doesn't feel like that. <laughs> But by definition, it is. And so you rely tremendously on your city staff. And you have one of the best city staffs around and, and always have for quite a long time, people to, who are looking out for your constituents in the city. And you should be proud of that. And, and the other thing, I just, just looking at the city council here, I'm really proud to see the diversity that, that is, even in Santa Cruz County, not as common as I think we need and we would like representative bodies need to look like their community. And this council really does. That's something I think to be proud of and something to be thinking about as this council changes over the years with the recent changes that, that have happened. So I, I've been very honored to serve in this area, both on the, well, on the board of supervisors, school board, and then at the state level, coastal commission in, in various roles, because this is a community that is worth taken care of and worth looking to the future with our kids, our next generation, but also the people who have decided to be here and, and want to invest. I've also long said that elected officials do have a sell-by date, and I think the trick is to leave before we each get there or before anybody else realizes we've gotten there. So this is my time <laughs> to move on and let others step in, and you'll have a tremendous representative State Assembly and Gail Pelle. I know I even said that before the final, before the election last week, but I was confident that she was going to win. And you have an amazing state senator in John Laird, two, two local people who understand Santa Cruz's needs, both the city and the county. So they are going to be a very strong representative for you. Appreciate the recognition, the day, Madam Mayor. So if I have any parking tickets, I'll, I'll <laughs> be sure to bring them by. But I just want to say thank you for your service and really the hard work that you do day in and day out as well. Thank you for the recognition. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us and speaking. All right, we're ready to move on in our agenda. Okay. I have a few announcements and then we will continue with the meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on Community Television Channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, 
cityofsantacruz.com. Our rules of decorum are on the window ledge here in person to my left. It's my job to keep the meeting running without disruption, and we ask that you respect your fellow citizens when you are inside or outside of chambers. For the consideration of our community, please stay home if you have any symptoms of a cold or flu or are feeling unwell in any way. If you wish to comment on an agenda item today and are joining us virtually, you may call in at the beginning of that item you are wishing to comment on and you will use instructions on your screen at that time. Please mute your television or streaming device when you call in and listen through your phone. Please note there is a delay in the streaming. So if you continue to listen, listen on your television or streaming device, you may miss your opportunity to speak. When it's your turn for public comment, you can raise your hand by dialing star nine on your phone or selecting the raise hand feature on the webinar controls of your computer. Please note that public comment is heard only on items council is taking action on and not on regular updates and reports. The items that will be open for public comment today are numbers agenda numbers 10 through 40. I'd like to ask the council members if there are any statements of disqualification today. Council Member Brown. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I um, do have um, a, out of an abundance of caution, I am going to recuse myself on uh, item 19. This is the For the Future Housing Inc. Uh, loan agreement. And so, um, because I live uh, in very close proximity to the, the parcel. Thank you, Council Member Brown. Uh, Council Member Cummings. I just want to ask the city attorney, I think this has come up before in terms of process. Um, should we pull that item then from consent? Uh, because comes? it's on the consent calendar, you can just abstain from that discussion. And, and if it does get pulled, then I'll just leave if that ha were to happen. Okay, great. Okay, I'd like to ask the city clerk to announce any additions or deletions. There are none. Okay, thank you. I'd like to call on the city attorney to provide us a report on closed session, please. Yes, thank you, Mayor Bruner, members of the city council. Let me turn on my video. Uh, yes, uh, this morning the council met in closed session in the courtyard conference room and via Zoom at 11.30 a.m. with council member um, Golder absent and discuss the following items. Item one was referred to closed session real property negotiations involving 890 River Street, 1000 River Street, and 1020 River Street. Um, the, uh, that item is also on your uh, consent calendar for uh, action uh, this afternoon. Council received a report from its negotiator on that item and gave direction. Uh, item two was a conference with labor negotiators concerning POA, police management, SEIU, temps, SEIU service employees, supervisors, and OE3. Council met with its labor negotiator, Lisa Murphy, on that item. Uh, item three were three items of real property negotiations. Uh, the properties at 890 River Street, 1000 River Street, and 1020 River Street, located at the Tannery Arts Center. Uh, item two was... Uh, Real property at 136 River Street. On those first two items, the council met with its negotiator, Bonnie Lipscomb, and uh, council received a report and gave direction. Item three was real property negotiations involving 24, 30, and 38 Front Street. Uh, on that item, the council met with its negotiator, Christoph Schneider, uh, and received a report and gave direction. Uh, item four was a conference with legal counsel involving liability claims. Uh, claims of Mitchell E. Swinton and Janet Cantillon. Those are also listed this afternoon on your consent calendar. Uh, and then the last item was a matter of existing litigation, case entitled Herman uh, versus 
City of Santa Cruz, uh, currently pending in the Santa Cruz County Superior Court. Council received a report from the City Attorney's Office and, and your direction on that item. I should just add for the record on the uh, River Street real property negotiations, uh, or rather for the 136 River Street real property negotiations, uh, as Councilmember Brown did just now for the consent calendar, uh, she recused herself and did not participate in that discussion uh, due to the proximity of her residence to that project or to that property. Thank you. Okay, I'd now like to call on the city attorney to provide any updates on city's business and events of interest. I didn't say that. I'm happy city to provide manager. those updates on behalf of the city attorney, if I may. <laughs> the city manager will now provide uh, updates, report and updates on the city's business. Thank you. Uh, thank you and good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Uh, Erica Smart, our communications manager, is going to pull up the slide deck for me. I've got a handful of updates for the Council and community this afternoon, so let's go ahead and jump in. Next slide, please. So as the Council knows, for the last several months, uh, we have had staff from multiple departments working on a phase closure of San Lorenzo Park. Uh, the closure of the park was officially completed on November 7th, and it's really hard to overstate how complex and challenging this process was, and I wanted to take the opportunity to thank, um, this is a big number, uh, our nearly 60 staff members that were part of the closure, um, as well as outreach to the individuals that were in the camp throughout the last several months, and that contributed to the success of this closure and restoration process. And by extension, I wanna also thank the council for your support and leadership throughout that process. Next slide. Now I wanna also point out uh, and note that this was more than a closure and a restoration process. Our outreach also connected over 170 people with a higher standard of shelter. And everyone in the park was given the opportunity to move to an alternative shelter location. Also, for the first time, in partnership with the county, we were able to enter the majority of the individuals in the camp into the Homelessness Management Information System, also known as HMIS. Uh, this may sound like a small feat, but in fact has been a challenge uh, in past camp closures. And what this information does, uh, it allows our outreach team to really provide a higher standard of case management services to better meet the individual needs of uh, folks that are living unhoused in our community uh, in ways that we've not been able to do in the past, and really in close partnership with our with uh, our county partners in ways that, again, we've not experienced in the past. So I just wanted to acknowledge that it's really taken a village getting to the point that we are, and I'm incredibly proud of the work the team's done to connect those 170 individuals to a higher, higher standard of shelter and on, on their way to permanent uh, housing. Of course, this process doesn't end with the closure and restoration of the park itself. The city team will continue to conduct regular assessments and outreach to people living unhoused in other areas. We continue to partner with the county and community partners in this work, and that includes Healing the Streets, Front Street, Housing Matters, and the downtown outreach workers. Uh, next month, the council will be receiving a quarterly homelessness response update from Larry M. Wally, um, our homelessness response manager. Uh, with more details as to what's to come as we move through this uh, closure and restoration process. Next slide. I'm sure uh, many of the community have noticed that there's a lot of activity underway at the mouth of the San Lorenzo River. Uh, this work is part of the San Lorenzo River Lagoon Culvert Project and is the culmination of many years of planning and partnership with multiple agencies. Those include the National Marine Fisheries Service, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the Coastal Commission, the U U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, the California Water Resources Control Board, and the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, construction was funded by $2.2 million in grant funding from the California Wildlife Conservation Board's Steam Flow Enhancement Program, and another uh, $650,000 that came from uh, stormwater general and liability funds. Uh, I also just wanted to acknowledge Councilmember Myers, who I know was a key part of helping to lead this effort on the council as this work came together. 
Uh, it's really an innov innovative project that uh, will do a number of things, and I wanted to highlight those for the community's uh, benefit. It will prevent excessive flooding of lower ocean and beach flat neighborhoods caused by the closed lagoon, a condition that has been exacerbated unnaturally by the construction of the harbor jetties in the 1960s. It will reduce or eliminate catastrophic breaches of the lagoon, which seriously damage the habitat for and can purge protected species, including steelhead trout and tidewater goby. And um, perhaps most importantly, it mitigates the life safety danger posed by lagoon breaches, which can sweep, sweep beachgoers into life-threatening uh, swift waters uh, that we've unfortunately experienced at times in our, in our past. So we're, uh, we're very excited to see this project moving forward and look forward to seeing it in action. I just wanted to also acknowledge our public works team that has been overseeing the uh, construction process. Next slide. In August of 2020, the council will remember that we executed an emergency declaration in response to the CZU lightning fires. Uh, while the declaration has been in effect for over two years, uh, we are gonna go ahead and extend it for an additional 60 days due to some of the high risks that still exist around debris flow for the burn areas. So just wanted to update the community and the council on that. Uh, we do expect that we will terminate that declaration uh, in January of next year. Next slide. So I know we've all been monitoring uh, the election results of the midterm election very closely. Um, yesterday afternoon, the county clerk updated the vote totals now representing about 61,000 total votes throughout the county. And I wanted to go ahead and provide some updates on some of the preliminary results. I'll stress that these are not the final outcomes, uh, but I did wanna provide some updates on who's leading in the polls, um, both for the initiatives and for some of our upcoming council seats. So as it currently stands, uh, Fred Keeley is leading in the polls uh, to be our first four-year mayor. Uh, Scott Newsom is leading for District 4 and uh, Renee Golder is leading for District 6. We've also had a number of important decisions on the ballot uh, this November uh, that, the, that uh, was, we were asking the community of their position on, and that includes uh, Measure N, that was the uh, empty homes tax as things currently stand. Yes on N is at 41% with no on O at about 58. No um, on N. Sorry, did I say that? Uh, no on N. Uh, measure O uh, would have included amendments to the general plan, uh, the downtown plan, and uh, was brought forward by our, by our downtown, our future. As things currently stand, yes on O is at 40.48% and no on O is at 59.52%. So that uh, appears to be going down uh, by a wide margin. And then lastly, measure P is the increase to our transient occupancy tax. Uh, yes on P is at uh, just shy of 80% uh, with no on P at about 20%. So it looks that that will also pass by a wide margin. Next slide, please. I want to also provide some updates on some upcoming events uh, that the community may be interested in. The first is um, November 13th through the 20th is United Against Hate Week. Uh, the Cold Water Classic is coming back after uh, several years of being dormant. That will be taking place November 15th through the 19th. Uh, Santa Cruz Trades Day occurred today. Um, I got to observe some of the activity. It was very well attended, uh, lots of interest. And then the Westcliff Outdoor Market is coming up on November 26th, the 25th through the 26th. And with that concludes my report. Thank you, that was great information. And I, I will just plug in that the Santa Cruz Public Libraries has on their website a list of events happening all week for United Against Hate Week. There's film screenings, bystander trainings, and um, many. there's a youth event at Capitola Branch Library on Thursday. So that whole list is available at the Santa Cruz Public Library's website. Thank you. Thank you. I will now call on the city clerk to provide any updates to the calendar. Uh, there are no updates, but just um, some reminders. November 29th, we have a special meeting, as well as December 6th, and then our next regular one will be December 13th. Thank you. 
Next up is our consent agenda. The consent agenda consists of agenda items 10 through 34. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if you would like to comment on any item 10 through 34, now is the time to call in. Instructions should be up on your screen. Please remember to mute your streaming device and raise your hand by dialing star nine on your phone or selecting raise hand in the webinar controls of your computer. All items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. Are there any council members who wish to comment or pull any items? Council member Cummings and then council member Kalantari Johnson. I have a comment <clears throat> on 17. I want to pull 30 and then I have a question about 19. Okay, council member Cummings, comment on 17, poll 30, and a question on 19. Okay, council member Kellen Tari Johnson. I had a comment on um, 30 and on 19. Question, excuse me, question on 19. Okay. Let's see, I'll check in with council member Myers. Okay, I don't see a hand raised, great. Okay, so um, let's see, since we pulled item, uh, council member Cummings pulled item 30, we will uh, come to that uh, after we proceed here. So we'll leave 30 out of the mix right now. And I will jump to Council Member Cummings. You had a comment on item 17. And if you could just state what item 17 is, or I can pull it up as well. Sure, this is, uh, so item number 17 is a letter to the Honorable Saida Cogliati expressing the city's condemnation of the vandalism of the Black Lives Matter mural. And I guess the comment, I would, first I would just like to thank my colleagues for working to bring this forward um, on behalf of the SC Equity Collab who has been well, they're the, the individuals who brought this to um, to the council initially when I was mayor and asked us to install the mural. And it's definitely been a topic of interest for many people in our community as to you know why we haven't repainted the mural. And so I just wanted to let everyone know that on Friday morning at 10 a.m. will be the sentencing hearing uh, for these two individuals. And there's an opportunity at that hearing to make public comment. Um, these letters. Uh, needed to be submitted uh, prior to the hearing, and so that's why this is before us today. But if people really want to, um, you know, hear uh, the final comments and hear that final verdict, they can attend the hearing at the Santa Cruz County Courthouse on Ocean Street at 10 a.m. So, thank you. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. We had a comment from Kalantari Johnson on item 30, was which was pulled. So we'll, you'll go to that when we get that item. And then we had a question on um, agenda item 19, and um, I'll start with Kalantari Johnson. Sure, yeah, comment question. Um, this is item 19 is for the Future Housing California Corporation Loan Agreement. Um, and I, was, I wanted to invite Bonnie Lipscomb to um, respond to this, just there, the, the interest in making these types of projects and deed restricted projects, um, having them be a local preference for the residents. Um, so if, if Bonnie could touch on what our policy options are for that for the future, that would be great. Sure, and I, I think the city attorney's office probably should weigh in here as well. Um, they did reference um, a resolution on the books that may enable a preference, a local preference policy. I will say it's been a challenge historically to have anything that has serious teeth to it because of um, typical funding sources for affordable housing projects, which include state and federal um, funding sources and fair housing laws and just the risk of discrimination is often um, very prohibitive for developers being willing to put preferences on affordable housing projects. 
Um, with that said, we have successfully in the past um, had a preference um, for some of our projects, specifically the Tannery Art Center. There is an artist preference um, that um, has has somewhat withstood the, the test of time. It is largely artists that live on, on campus, but it's more of sort of self-selected artists on campus. Um, there is recently enacted legislation. Um, we're just we're just learning about the governor just signed it at the end of September that would allow um, local governments to have um, a, a sort of a, a local tenant preference um, policy. Um, so we're going to look into that a little more. The process for that would be for council um, through an ordinance to establish this as a policy. And I think that would give a little more support um, for developers and others being willing to actually have a, a robust policy um, in place going forward. And I could just elaborate on that um, briefly. So um, the council has already enacted a provision that uh, that states that preferences for rental inclusionary units will be given priority to residents of the city, uh, but as limited by state and federal law. Um, there's also a resolution that has been adopted that includes uh, local preferences for potential renters or purchases, purchasers of affordable units. And I believe that language will be written into the affordability covenant to reflect existing policies as well. Thank you both. Thank you. Council Member Cummings, you also had a question on agenda item 19. I did, um, <clears throat> in the agenda report on this item, it was stated that money would have to be transferred. I um, can't remember which fund it was, but there, there was a need to transfer money um, to the Affordable Housing Trust Fund in order for that to go to the, um, to the developer. And people were just asking, how much money is in the affordable housing trust fund if we can get some kind of update on like where the how much yeah how much money we have in the affordable housing trust fund to date i'm happy to provide that we can come back at a later time i can just tell you right now um, with the three affordable 100 percent affordable housing projects that we have underway we have committed the balance of the affordable housing trust fund because we plan we planned it out and we're successful in getting matches at the state level to our affordable housing trust fund. So we were leveraged that for double matches. And in doing so, we had to commit the funding for the next three year period to those projects. So for PAC Station South, PAC Station North, and the Downtown Library Affordable Housing Project, we've committed the uh, affordable housing fund balance for the next three years. So while there is a balance um, in the funding, it's because we haven't drawn it, drawn it down yet for the project, but it's fully subscribed for the next three years. Um, with that said, we're, we're queuing up to apply for another local grant match um, to the fund. And then we also receive annually funding coming into the fund. We have some longstanding uh, development, agree development agreements um, we receive on a few projects, a little under 100,000 a year coming in on those agreements. And then, of course, um, we receive annually um, in lieu fees as projects move forward into the fund. So we do think uh, that we'll see um, the balance increasing over the next few years. And so our proposal is to have a you know, interfund transfer from the public trust fund to the affordable housing trust fund so that we can make the loan out of the affordable housing trust fund because it'll be a residual receipts loan um, back to the fund, but that we'll have the funding replenished in the affordable housing trust fund within, I'd say, the next five to eight years and we can repay the public trust fund. Thanks. And actually, you answered my second question because I was interested in where that funding had been allocated. So that helps for when we're um, having these conversations with folks if they're asking where's the money? It's like, well, it's dedicated. So, um, yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you. That concludes, uh, comments and questions on agenda items 10 through 34 with the exception of item 30, which has been pulled. Item 30 is Santa Cruz high school parking. So we will come back to that item. At this time, if that concludes that, I will go out to public comment.
and I will look to our in person. Uh, we have no members of the public here for public comment. I will look to our virtual attendees and uh, we are looking for public comment on agenda items 10 through 34, except for 30. We will come back to that next. Okay, our first hand raised. If you'd like to raise your hand, press star nine on your phone or choose raise hand in the webinar features of your computer. And the first phone number ends in 4844. Go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, council members and members of the community, uh, I would request, even before saying anything else, that item number 22 be pulled from the agenda for brief staff report and city council comment. It has to do with an issue of police misconduct, and I would request uh, that a council member, perhaps council member Sandy Brown, who's committed herself to uh, public and accessible activity on these issues, will do it. Now, I'll say no more until she indicates whether she's going to be doing that. Uh, I would ask if, she, are you going to do that, Sandy? Uh, Mr. Norse, we we did have a conversation about this in our closed session, and um, we got a, the rep appropriate report from our city attorney, so I'm not going to pull this one. I'm sorry about that. Um, I will maintain my commitment to doing so. In this case, um, I, it doesn't seem uh, uh, appropriate to me. It sounds like you're violating your commitment, but thank you for your explanation, Sandy. Um, yeah, well, then I'll mention very briefly in the two minutes that I have, uh, this is a, I, I wish I could speak about it at greater length, but in my attempts to get the information from uh, City Administrator Bonnie Bush, as I always do with these items, um, it, has been, it has not been placed on the agenda, as is unfortunately the case in spite of repeated requests, in terms of the actual substance of the situation the substance of the actual issue of uh, what uh, Mitchell uh, Swinton actually is having a problem with has not been made available to the public, even though it is a public record and can be done. And often uh, Bonnie is quite out, you know, helpful in doing this with a time lag, but this should be on the agenda so we know what's going on. And it's very nice for, you know, you can't actually comment on this item if you don't have the specific information about what exactly is the concern of Mr. Swineson. And that is not available. So we're in a situation here where the community is essentially facing a violation of the Brown Act because the city council is getting this information and it's public information, so it's not privileged. But the, but the community is not, and it is being intentionally withheld from the agenda, even though it is available. So I would ask that uh, perhaps uh, Bonnie Bush explain to us exactly why it is being withheld and why this is being done on a regular basis, because it seems to me that one cannot make intelligent comments at this very brief open interval that is allowed before the closed session. Well. I'm, I didn't make any comments on the at the interval because I didn't have any information about it, even though I requested it uh, earlier today. So I would ask someone on the council devoted to accessibility and transparency to request that all subsequent items who are that are claims against the city be put in full on city council agendas. And I think such an advisory would perhaps persuade uh, Bonnie to do that even though her own preference seems to be otherwise. It's within her power, but she's chosen not to do it. I can't say anything more about this issue because uh, Councilmember Brown has declined to pull it off the agenda, so we can't get a staff report. On, I, we can't even know what the specifics are about this. This is a violation. Of okay, our next public comment is the name I Am Watching You. 
Go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. Thank you. Uh, hey, I was disappointed you did not address any of the questions the public sent in letters on item 19. Perhaps you could do that later. Uh, as to item 17's open letter to the presiding judge on the BLM vandalism sentencing matter, I would point out restorative justice is most unusual, has roots in village justice, and shows an ignorance that the restorative justice doesn't work at all unless all parties voluntarily agree to participate with purely restorative and rehabilitative goals, not as extra punitive punishments, and not required to match the severity of the crime. I don't see any understanding of this in the plaintiff's letter. And since this was discussed 18 months ago, even before any hearings, I suspect there must be other motives at work. The equity cohab are radical activists known to promote public protest spectacles like showing up to direct painting in a Kiss My Black Arts t-shirt or end white supremacy t-shirts at trial and get their pictures in the paper. That and the obvious lack of understanding of restorative justice's voluntary component makes me question their sincerity and by your own public spectacle here and by association, your own sincerity. I do also have a problem with this being a public calling out of the judge by name and specifically listing unilaterally demanding really quite publicly some very unusually harsh sentencing expectations of what amounts to trying to force your sentence outcome by instigating a public outrage, even pressing with full civic and public force to pressure the court to invoke this involuntary restorative justice sentence. Maybe the equity cohab doesn't know any better, but you should. The judge decides what justice is, not you or anyone else. My guess is it won't matter what sentencing the court arrives at, it won't be enough for anyone involved with the Black Lives Matter movement. My worry is the BLM narrative follows the Marcus Malcolm X and believes in severe violent retribution for any grievance, large or small. Any violent protest that might follow from a different sentencing outcome from this will be very much also at your hands. Without a voluntary acceptance by the accused, this then becomes, I'd say, a purposeful public shaming spectacle, uh, recommendation, mud stirring aimed at judicial coercion, not so different than recommending use of medieval stocks for the public to throw garbage at the vandals' heads. This item is the modern day version of your version of the Water Street Bridge Lynching. Hasn't the city been used enough as a witless tool by the Black Lives Matter movement that is responsible for normalizing violence and enabled extra more murders and property damage than 9-11 itself? Why would you ever want to perpetuate a radical, permanent BLM glorification symbol of an agenda which resulted in the mass murder of an extra 3,000 black people in 2020 alone and three to five billion in property damage, countless arsons and assaults? The public has had enough of no justice, no peace protesting, Justice is what the judge says it is. I think you should modify the letter to state only the city's actual damages. Uh, odd, is any damage to you as plaintiff for just responding to the public when you get paid to do that job? I have something else to say about leaving the mess. Okay, thank you. Hall. Your time is up. Our next member of the public is the name Yoga for All Movement. Go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. Welcome. Let's see, we can't hear you. There you go. There you go, speak louder, I can hear laughing. Thank you, my name is Shandara Gill and I'm a member of the Santa Cruz Equity Collab. Can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you. Um, as I said before, I'm a member of the Santa Cruz Equity Collab as well as director of the fiscal sponsorship of the Black Lives Matter mural. Um, working with the Santa Cruz Equity Collab. And I wanted to start by thanking both Mayor Bruner and the council members that included this item on the agenda. We are so grateful for the full council's consideration of our As you all have read, we are asking you to send a letter on behalf of the city council to Superior Court Judge Saida Pogliati, expressing the city's condemnation of the vandalism of the Santa Cruz Black Lives Matter mural, which includes specific sentencing recommendations for the defendants that align with the restorative approach. These recommendations include community service um, being part of the painting and planning process and restoring the mural and the presentation of a public apology to the community at the restoration event, participation in the victim offender dialogue program through the conflict resolution center, participate in weekly professional therapy for at least two years, participate in a racial justice workshop that the Santa Cruz Equity Collab has co-created and co-facilitated, payment 
the full restitution amount, and most importantly, that they be prohibited from purchasing firearms for at least five years. This last piece is especially important for ignoring people's sense of safety after seeing two separate videos of one of the defendants naming Mr. Bochat, one with him holding a, a firearm, uh, real, maybe, maybe not real, doesn't really matter too much, still said, uh, little bitch, um, towards our Latinx community while holding what looked like a firearm. Uh, that's all available in, I think, a letter and examples of the transcript of the court proceedings as public information was made until last year. Bochat, at least, has demonstrated that I'm having a hard time hearing you. If you could speak closer to the phone, please. Thank you. I'm on the so I'm, I'm not sure what that is. Is there a port part you'd like me to repeat, Mayor Brenner? I'm not sure, but go ahead and continue and just speak loudly. Okay. Thank you so much. So uh, with that, I, the court pros court transcripts have been uh, made public, so you're welcome to look at that, and if you need it, we will send it to you. But naming Mr. Bochat at least has demonstrated that he cannot be trusted with a firearm at this point in time. So that's one of the asks. This is an opportunity to choose progress within this system through a restorative justice model to explicitly show the defendants in our community that we all understand and deeply care about the harm that has been perpetrated through this hate crime and the need for true amendments to be made, and to publicly demonstrate that as a community, we will not tolerate hateful, racist behavior. We appreciate the community and city council's Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next public comment is Peter Bashir. Welcome. Go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. Hello, City Councils. I, my comment is as um, representative of the underrepresented of the city community, the, the city of Santa Cruz community liaison, Peter Bichier. Um, I wanted to comment just briefly on the city manager's agenda. Is this the appropriate place? Uh, typically, we don't take comment on reports or updates. You're welcome to uh, email City Council at cityofsantacruz.com. Okay, thank you. And that looks like it concludes our uh, public comment. I do want to also add for anyone listening, we have oral communications. <laughs> it is also a time to comment on anything not on the agenda. And oral communications today will be at 6 o'clock, 6 p.m. So if there's any items the public would like to comment on that's not on today's agenda, you are welcome to um, either attend in person or join us virtually at 6 p.m. Okay, I will bring it back to City Council for a motion on our consent agenda. I'll go ahead and move the consent agenda with the exception of item 30, which has been pulled. No, I'll second. Great, we have a motion from Vice Mayor Watkins with a second by Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Uh, items 10 through 34 with the exception of item 30, which has been pulled. Okay. And may we have a roll call vote, please. Councilmember Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Boulder? Aye. Still absent. Uh, Cummings? Aye. Brown? Aye, uh, with the exception of item 19, which I'm recusing myself. Uh, Councilmember Myers? Aye. Vice Mayor Watkins? Aye. And Mayor Bruner? Aye. Thank you. That motion passes unanimously with Councilmember Golder absent and Councilmember Brown uh, abstaining from item number 19. So now we will move on to agenda, consent agenda item 30. This is an item, Santa Cruz <coughs> High School parking. Um, this is a public works item and I'm wondering if Assistant Director of Public Works, Nathan Ewan is available 
we had uh, Council Member Cummings and Council Member Kalantari Johnson who had a couple questions on this item. Yeah, so I pulled this item. Um, I just, the first question I had was um, if you could maybe um, provide any kind of update on kind of what the timing is of these conversations and um, when we might be able to get an update. I think the one thing that was left, the reason why I pulled this is because, um, you know, with all of the work the city has going on, some things can slip through the cracks. So oftentimes having some kind of report back date incorporated into the motion can help so that the community has an understanding of when we should, when we'll hear back from staff about, um, you know, the, the progress that's being made on these items. And so just wanted to kind of get a sense of where the conversations are heading and when um, folks can expect to see this item come back to council. Sure. Uh, good afternoon, council members. Nathan Wynn, Assistant Director of Public Works. Um, there's been ongoing conversations with Santa Cruz City Schools. We are in contact now with the uh, Director of Facilities, Trevor Miller. So we definitely have the right, with got uh, in contact with the right person to discuss um, potential parking changes around uh, Santa Cruz High School. I think our last contact was in late October. Uh, we do need to follow up with them to discuss uh, uh, potential changes. Um, as the staff report noted, um, it has been a kind of a long standing item in the sense that um, the discussions happened in early of fall of 21. And then as construction happened at Santa Cruz High, we uh, had ongoing discussions with several uh, members of the Santa Cruz City School System. But now I think I believe we're in the, in the right contact now. And so I guess the follow up would be um, what would be a kind of um, reasonable time frame for hearing back from staff on this item? I would anticipate in the coming year as we get through the holidays and we are still working on hiring a parking programs manager. Um, and so once we have uh, additional staffing to, to help um, uh, reach out and provide some additional um, support, um, I would probably expect some time in the, uh, I guess, early year or next spring to hopefully come to a, a, um, a, a resolution. So would it be um, acceptable if we had a report back date at the second meeting in April, on or before that. Yeah, I think that would I think that would provide enough time to allow staff to reach out, um, get these discussions to go proceed a little further. There are a couple options that have already been discussed with them, but uh, again, we'll have to kind of uh, tease out the you know, the process to see which ones um, seem most um, applicable for for the schools. Great, thank you. Thank you, Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Great. Thank you for your work on this. Um, I was really glad to see that we are working with the school district on the supply side of the challenge. Um, and I wanted to ask the city team as you're working with the school district to consider a transportation demand program to address the demand side of the challenge of this situation. So similar to what the city has with um, Go Santa Cruz program. Um, so just, uh, just that comment that as you're working with the school district, uh, to encourage and ask that they pursue or explore a uh, transportation demand program. Yeah, I appreciate that comment. And I believe we got that comment in a letter from our, our chair of the Public Transportation Public Works Commission. That's right. um, and I have to admit, I think it's a great idea to reach out to Santa Cruz City Schools and see if there's um, any resources that could also be provided to work on a TDM program. I believe the TDM program in our downtown parking district has been successful and will continue to grow. And so we'd like to see that that type of um, uh, shotgun approach, not just the one silver bullet out there uh, to address these um, parking issues. Great, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so that um, concludes uh, item 30 questions and now I will take it out to public comment. Item 30 is Santa Cruz High School parking. Um, and it, are there any members of the public here in person that would like to um, speak to item 30? Okay, I will also look to our virtual attendees. Seeing no hands raised virtually, I will bring it back to council and I'm looking for a motion on item number 30. Council member Cummings. It's like to move the staff recommendation <clears throat> and incorporate um, an update, um, an update on the parking issues at Santa Cruz High School to come back to council 
on or before the second meeting in April. And as part of the direction, encourage Santa Cruz City Schools to explore transportation demand programs. I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion by Council Member Cummings, seconded by Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Are there any other questions? Okay, may we have a roll call vote? Council Member Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Holder? Absent. Cummings? Aye. Brown? Aye. Myers? Aye. Vice Mayor Watkins? Aye. And Mayor Brunner? Aye. That motion passes unanimously with Council Member Golder absent. Okay, that concludes our consent agenda. Let me go back to our agenda here. I will take a 10 minute uh, break at this point we um, before we move on to consent public hearing um, just a quick bio break for anyone who needs it And public hearing items. These items are 35 through 38 on our agenda. If you are a member of the public streaming this meeting and you won't wish to comment on items 35 through 38, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. And you can um, raise your hand to press star nine when that time comes and we will let you know when it is your turn to speak. If you are joining us in person and wish to comment on items 35 through 38, you can line up here to the right of the dais. All items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. Are there any council members who wish to comment on or pull items 35 through 38? I will look to our virtual council member, council member Myers. Okay, just wanna make sure I don't miss you. Okay. So at this point then, We will now go out to the public for public comment. 
And if you would like to comment, please press star nine to raise your hand or choose the raise hand feature on your computer. And you will hear an announcement. The timer will then be set to three minutes. Are there any members joining us virtually that would like to comment on items 35 through 38? Seeing no hands raised virtually, none here in person. Okay, so at this time then, I will bring it back to council for a motion and deliberation. Vice Mayor Watkins. Yeah, I'm happy to move the consent and public hearing, items 35 through 38. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion by Vice Mayor Watkins with a second by Council Member Cummings. May we have a roll call vote, please? Councilmember Calentari Johnson. Aye. Boulder. Uh, Cummings. Aye. Brown. Aye. Myers. Aye. Vice Mayor Watkins. Aye. Mayor Brunner. Aye. That motion passes unanimously with <laughs> Councilmember Golder absent. Okay, thank you for being here today, being available. Next on, on our agenda is item number 39. This is public hearing for permanent outdoor dining program update related to public on-street parking spaces. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you wish to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions from council. We will then take public comment and then return to council for deliberation and for action. And I would like to um, welcome Rebecca Unit, our Economic Development Manager. Great, thank you so much. Good afternoon, uh, Rebecca Unit with the Economic Development Department uh, here for our second reading of the Parklet Ordinance. I'll share my screen for the presentation. So this afternoon, we are here to uh, seek adoption of our parklet ordinance, as well as the resolution to establish the parklet fee schedule and the parklet guide, uh, guidelines. Um, on November 11th, uh, following council direction at the October 25th uh, city council meeting, we were able to form an outdoor dining subcommittee and meet uh, on October, on November 11th, excuse me. Um, our attendees for that meeting included Councilmember Myers, Councilmember Kalantari Johnson, uh, Zach Davis, who's the um, one of the owners of the Glass Jar, Penny Ice Creamery and Picnic Basket, as well as Mike Bobadilla from Walnut Avenue Cafe, myself, my director, Bonnie Lipscomb, and Stephanie Duck from our city attorney's office. Um, we met to review the parklet ordinance in preparation for this meeting, uh, as well as the parklet guidelines and the fee schedule. Um, I just wanted to give a brief overview of some of the feedback that we were able to uh, take in from that meeting and uh, really appreciated the time that was spent uh, reviewing these and, and really helpful feedback that we were able to take away from it. Um, so in terms of the parklet ordinance, um, we just had uh, mainly clarifying comments around some of the components of of that ordinance uh, language. And so there was a question around the term of the parklet permit. So in our ordinance, it does um, state that the term of the parklet is for one year um, and it's an auto, an annual renewing process. Um, and so we clarified that the intent of that is really um, to be able to continually renew the parklet permits uh, after successful reinspection and payment of the annual park, uh, permit fees. And that this annual permit is the mechanism to collect the parklet annual fees and that the permit will continue to renew each year the business wishes to continue and operate in good standing. Um, we also had a question around the removal requirements that are stated in the parklet ordinance. Um, and so really there's a there's a, a section on the city authority and removal on, of parklets um, and it sets out the procedure for removal in the event a parklet goes unused for an extended period of time 
or an emergency occurs, such as a water main break or other emergency in the street. Um, and the intent of this is really to clearly state that the parklets are operating on city property and in the public right of way. Um, and so making sure that we have the, we retain the city authority over these spaces. Um, and in practice, it's really um, intended that we're able to take the action that we need to resolve any issue um, while still uh, retaining, you know, and supporting the business's ability to use their parklet spaces. Um, and then we also had a question around the inspection pro uh, process and more of a comment on just the value of that process and, and wanting to make sure that those inspections occur and that um, we're making sure that businesses are operating uh, to the standards and, and that everyone is in compliance with that uh, on that annual basis. And then in terms of the guidelines, there were a few other uh, clarifying comments, again, not necessarily changes to the guidelines, but um, just wanting to have a little bit more clarification of what the intent was. Um, and so some of those items included uh, questions around securing the parklets um, after hours and what is meant by um, where the guidelines state that parklets shall be closed or gated when not in use. And so we were able to talk through that um, the intent of that is to make sure that the area is secured since it is private property and, and not accessible after hours um, and clarifying sort of how that can be demonstrated for businesses such as locking up tables and chairs that are movable or making sure that they're removed from the parklet spaces. Um, there's an additional comment around um, defining the public space between the sidewalk and the parklet. Um, so making sure it's clear sort of what the authority is for parklet, parklet operators, um, as well as maintaining that public access uh, between the businesses and the parklet area. And so we talked through, um, you know, making sure that business owners know that they have the ability to sort of enforce their operation standards within their area. If they have sidewalk dining, that they have a cafe extension license agreement for that they're able to operate in that license area, maintain that public access along the sidewalk um, and, and maintain their operations within the parklet and that, um, you know, any impacts from folks that are walking through the area, you know, they really need to be able to ensure that they can have the full benefit and use of their licensed areas. Um, and then there was a question around live entertainment uh, in the ordinance uh, operating standards. We state that there is no live entertainment to be allowed in the parklet area, uh, but there was a question raised around if there could be opportunities for a special event activity or something where they want to use those parklet areas, such as a downtown wine walk or something where that could be a beneficial um, opportunity. So uh, we discussed that that would definitely be supportable through a special event permit and working with our colleagues in the Parks and Recreation Department to be able to allow that to occur on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and then we had a few questions around weatherization uh, in terms of lighting heaters and windscreens. Um, and this was a really helpful uh, comment as we're finalizing the uh, completion of our pre-approved designs. And so there was questions around um, how high wind screens could be installed on the platform and um, the support posts for lighting and shade sails. And so we're taking in um, that feedback and actually working with our designers to be able to add an option to include wind screens on parklets. So having a transparent uh, wind barrier around the um, upper portion of the parklets to, to block the wind. So we're gonna, um, we're adding that onto the pre-approved design so that that's something that people can implement easily. Um, and then finally, a question around um, platform design and just how to uh, ensure that the base of the platform is um, secured to the city standards in terms of um, limiting uh, rodent access or debris collection. And so just clarifying um, what that process looks like. Um, and what's needed to meet that criteria. Um, and following that review, uh, we did receive uh, unanimous support from the subcommittee to uh, move forward and seek council approval for the second reading of the ordinance, as well as the guidelines and fee schedule. Um, so just as a, an overview of the park ordinance, again, uh, just some of the core components that are included, included in the ordinance, this is really our legal framework for the parklet permit process. Um, it includes the, that permit review process, the design guidelines and operating standards, suspension, revocation, and removal processes, and the appeals process. And then additionally today, we're asking for um, approval of the resolution to adopt the parklet guidelines. And the parklet guidelines include 
the size and location, construction requirements, traffic and pedestrian safety requirements, design and furnishing standards, ADA accessibility, the application process and checklist, and the operating requirements and insurance. Um, and in the resolution, uh, it does have a minor typo in terms of the code section that it's referencing, uh, but we can easily correct that as a cleanup item. And then the uh, other portion um, as a resolution that we're seeking adoption today is for the parklet program fees. We presented this at the previous council meeting. Um, I want to provide a little bit more information about uh, the revenue sources for these fees. Um, and so our application fee, uh, you know, is proposed at $500 for the pre-approved design and retrofitted parklet. Um, and then a custom design would be that $500 application fee and uh, the actual cost related to reviewing for staff's hourly time. Um, those go towards the general fund. Um, and also we are um, wanting to propose an option on the application uh, to uh, provi provide a fee waiver for those application fees. So um, meeting a hardship requirement. So if businesses would like to have their $500 application fee waived um, we would complete a review of a, sort of a sales tax analysis to, um, to evaluate if they would qualify for that. Um, and then we have our annual inspection fee, $250 per year, and then the annual permit fees, uh, $2,000 per space for metered spaces and the $5.88 per square foot uh, for unmetered spaces. Um, the fees in the downtown parking district uh, in metered spaces go towards the parking district fund, uh, any fees collected on the wharf would go to the wharf fund and the other meter locations go into the general fund. And then uh, the appeal fee is set at $519 and that appeal fee is just for um, a business owner Sorry. appealing the city's um, determination, not for an appeal from the general public that is handled through our normal uh, code enforcement process. And then, um, any additional costs? And Bonnie, did you have a comment to add? Yeah, and thank you, Rebecca. I, I just um, wanted to, um, before you went on to the next slide, um, say that all the fees here, um, because the temporary program has been you know, recommended to be approved to go through October, none of these fees um, would be applicable until that time with the exception of the application fee. So the $500 fee at the top for either the pre-approved design or the custom design parklet. And then on the application, the applicant can request to be considered to have that, that fee waived. Um, so we are just really sensitive and hearing some of our businesses, some of our restaurants are saying, hey, we're still struggling. We wanna take that into consideration. Whereas there are some restaurants that are doing really well. Um, so uh, we just wanna have that in the context of the, the larger program. The annual inspection fee would take place in year two after their first year approval. So that's not applicable in the first year. And then the actual, um, you know, basically rent for the city public space, the parklet itself, um, wouldn't kick in until uh, the permanent program is in place next October. And it would be prorated just for the remaining portion of the year. So they wouldn't owe, owe the full 2000 you know, for the two months of the remaining year, it would be prorated. So I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. I just wanted to talk briefly about um, those annual uh, permit fees for the metered spaces. So the, the annual fee is really for the use of the public right of way. And um, especially in the metered spaces, that really is going towards the core city service. So the parking revenues that are collected uh, especially in the downtown, go towards the parking district. Um, and those funds are, it's not just a, a staff um, coverage, it's really for those services that are provided in the parking district. So maintenance and upkeep of the parking facilities, sidewalk scrubbing downtown, the TDM program or Go Santa Cruz program downtown uh, receives funding uh, through that fund, downtown public restrooms, security services, et cetera. So um, really being able to maintain that revenue source uh, for the use of those uh, parking spaces uh, to support the district services. And then just uh, wanted to provide um, the parklet program transition timeline. Uh, we presented this 
at the October 25th meeting as well. Um, if the council does adopt the second reading today, uh, the ordinance would go into effect December 15th. Um, we are uh, proposing to have a part of the permit application deadline of March 31st uh, to be able to receive the applications and provide the review needed to uh, allow businesses to complete their construction by the October 31st expiration date of the temporary program. Um, and at that March 31st date as well, as we know what businesses would like to move forward and proceed, we'll also work on uh, removal of any inactive parklets or reduction of underutilized parklet areas. Um, with that transition period being between April to October uh, as we move into the permanent program. Our recommendation for you this afternoon is adopt ordinance number 2022-15, establishing a permanent parklet program citywide and adopt a resolution establishing the parklet fee schedule and adopt a resolution adopting the parklet guidelines. Um, with the feedback we received, we're still finalizing some of the uh, pre-approved parklet design components. So those will be coming back to you at a later date for final adoption. Um, and I will welcome any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca and Bonnie. Um, and just to clarify, the pre-approved designs are not required, correct? That's correct, right. Those are uh, an additional uh, support mechanism that we're providing us. Just another option if a business should so choose. Okay. Um, okay, I will open it up for council questions. Council Member Cummings. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you for the presentation. Um, can you go back to like two slides back the timeline? I was a little conf I thought I was I thought I understood everything, and then when you put that up, I got a little bit confused. Um, so, so my understanding and maybe maybe I'm off on this one is that the um, direction that's given is that was given previously was that the that the temporary program would end October of 2023 um, and what I see here is that you have um, applications are open if people want to move to permanent those applications are due in March and then there's the removal of parklets in March of starting in March of 2023 but based on the direction that's been given the temporary use people have until October of 2023 so I'm wondering if you can clarify that because I think that there is an understanding that if people don't want to move to the permanent program that they have until October of next year to stay open but what is presented here makes it seem like um, they have to start removing their parklets in March of 2023 so can you clarify kind of what um, you know, if people don't want to move to term to, um, if people don't want to move to the permanent parklets, um, but they still want to use their permanent parklets, will they have? Will they be able to until October of twenty twenty three? Yes, absolutely. So the the temporary program is in is in effect until October thirty first, twenty twenty three. Um, what you see here in terms of the removal of inactive parklets, reduction of underutilized, that is just looking at. Um, any parklets that are currently out there, which there are a few that are not utilized on a consistent basis and are taking up additional parking spaces, being able to move forward with removing those or reducing the areas that they're not using, um, just as we transition forward um, in preparation, you know, as we head into the summer months, just, just starting that process, um, being able to move forward. But if businesses are actively using their temporary parklets and, uh, you know, they're operating within a compliance of the temporary program, we wouldn't be removing them. They'd be able to do that transition. Or if they don't want to move to the permanent, but they're still act, um, operating in their temporary, they have until the end of October, okay. if that helps clarify. Okay, thanks for that clarification. A um, couple other questions. Um, I guess what what will outreach look like to, to all these businesses um, to let them know about the opening of the application and the timeline for closing so that people can start getting you know their applications ready and are aware of what's happening? Yeah, um, so once the ordinance is adopted, um, we're, we have an application uh, for the permits that's uh, under review now, and so we'll be finalizing that uh, if, if it's adopted today, um, being able to have that ready once the ordinance is in effect. Um, we have you know, been doing a lot of email communication with businesses, and so definitely continuing that and having it on our website. Um, I would also like to have an application um, 
preview meeting, you know, doing a sort of a training with the businesses to go over the ordinance components, the application requirements, and, and what is allowed, and especially with the pre-approved designs, so we can uh, discuss those options with the businesses. Um, so having those um, public meetings and recording that as well, having that available um, so that businesses can um, can get all the information that they need to, to be um, prepared to apply. Um, and also uh, being able to, um, you know, do the in-person visits with businesses to answer questions, uh, having my team available to, to schedule those one-on-ones as well to answer questions, especially for businesses that are wanting to do a retrofit. Um, we'll have a checklist that we go through and can actually do an inspection to give them the feedback of um, what criteria they would need to correct to, to be able to apply for the permanent process. Um, and we can pull together a, a more formal um, outreach plan as well as part of this and have that available on the website too. I guess my next question is for the city attorney on this because um, my understanding is it's 90 days from the adoption of an ordinance before it goes into effect. Is that I believe 30 days from 30 the days. second reading. Okay, sorry, That's I just wanted to clarify that. I'm just, I was asking too, just because um, making sure that from when the ordinance goes into effect to when the deadline for applications hits is sufficient for people to um, have enough information and um, so that they can start you know, working on those applications. <clears throat> um, and I guess this is a combined question. I'm just curious, I, didn't, I don't know if we received an update on who was on the subcommittee because I just wanted to know that I thought, so there was just the two council members on the subcommittee? Okay, because that wasn't on there. And I ask that because I just want to let some of the small businesses know that I've been in contact with who those members are. So it's Mayor Bruner, Councilmember Con Kellentari Johnson, and then... Pat Councilmember Myers. Okay. Um, and then I guess the last question I have on this is that um, I know this came up at the last meeting, and I don't think it's been addressed yet, but there are some temporary or what emerged through the pandemic of um, outdoor dining or outdoor vending on the sidewalks, and that hasn't been discussed. And so I'm just wondering how that will be impacted by the sunset of the temporary ordinance, and if this is a part of the work plan of the subcommittee. And yeah, that's, that's a good question. So um, we do currently have our cafe extension uh, license agreement process for sidewalk dining um, that was in effect prior, and so that, um, that process is an administrative use permit review with the planning department. Um, my goal is that uh, when we get the park ordinance adopted and, and work through the private property as well, that we're able to um, modify that sidewalk dining policy as well to um, bring it up to the similar uh, staff level review as the park ordinance. So that is on deck to um, streamline that process as well um, with the goal of getting that accomplished before the October 31st deadline. Those are all my questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Council Member Brown. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Rebecca, for the presentation and all of your work on this. I, I know you have been, you've made yourself available and accessible to uh, so many stakeholders in this process and really listened. And I really appreciate the, the outcome. Um, I, I do want to ask a question about um, the, you know, I expressed concerns based upon conversations that we, some uh, council member uh, Cummings and I had had with a, a number of businesses um, in, in group meetings about uh, the timeline, and I really advocated for an extension of that transition period, hearing their um, kind of general concerns, but also concerns that were um, in, often site-specific and uh, you know, particular to the individual operators' uh, circumstances, resource questions as well, and um, and so I'm just, I guess I'm wondering, um, with the the deadline coming up now pretty quickly, and with the holidays, it's just going to hap happen very quickly. Um, what um, and the, and my concern that there are businesses that are are going to struggle getting through this transition. Um, what happens if they can't get it together by that deadline um, but want to continue? How will the city, how will we work with them um, to try to make, make it possible? Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you for that. Um, 
So the initial deadline is, um, you know, the intent of having that set at the end of March is to be able to, you know, know who wants to apply, get those applications in, um, be able to have enough time to review them and, and be able to enable businesses to construct by the October deadline. Um, if a business wasn't able to apply by that date, um, we're just, uh, you know, we would continue to review it. They would be, you know, in that process. It's the intent of this initial application deadline is so that we can sort of guarantee that they'll be able to uh, not lose their temporary permit operations, you know, not have a break in operations of the parklet um, by that October 31st deadline. Um, so we're certainly, you know, happy to continue to support. It's going to be an all hands on deck, you know, process to make sure that people have the information that they need to complete that application and, and get through the process. And so um, sort of that initial batch is really to have us focused on who is applying and help shepherd them through by that deadline. Um, but, you know, supporting businesses as they can enter the process as well. Okay, if there are no further questions from council, I will bring it out to public comment. And I will look to our virtual attendees. And if you're joining us in person and wish to comment on this item, you can line up to the right of the dais. We have one hand raised virtually, the name I am watching you. Go ahead and press star six. Okay, uh, of course, absolutely none of the justifications used to justify temporary parklets will have any validity after the last state California removes official COVID emergency declarations. French Laundry Emperor Newsom has stated expiration will happen early next year. This is perhaps before your extended temporary permits will expire, meaning they may exist without those justifications. My opinion is for about 85% of the people, there never was an emergency COVID mortality risk as the real risk to them from COVID was no different than any bad flu season was, and less so now that the virus has evolved. For the other 15%, far more extreme measures than parklets never stopped the spread of COVID. Therefore, you need some new justifications to violate the public right away as you intend permanently. In the simplest sense, you should not be essentially renting out for annual fee exclusive use permits in the public right of way unless there is an overriding benefit to the public. This overriding public benefit must more than make up for the loss of the public right of way. And with a certainty, this extra benefit will exist permanently in order to justify any such permanent permits as you propose. Otherwise, it's like fascism, the government and business colluding where the public is the loser. Government business feeding like pigs at the public trough of public assets on the public right of way seems alarmingly likely. There are many examples of case law where courts invalidated permanent exclusive use concessionaire public property permits without an overriding public benefit. How sure are you that even the most paranoid COVIDian neurotic will even want to pay full fare to eat and drink, smelling exhaust in parking lots in a year or so? If that happens, no one will benefit at all except the government having sold out the public right away to line its pockets. It might even harm businesses who participated. It's not like the public has any actual permanent need for outside dining. They can just go inside where it's warm or air conditioned and wonderfully comfortable all year long. Um, while it is not clear to me what absolute individual rights apply to public property, I'm quite sure the American principles of equal rights, of equal public access, of equal opportunity to enjoy public spaces should apply equally to everyone as the public means everyone. The endless support for the COVID fear narrative so full of lies Convincing everyone to treat closeness to each other as if everyone is a leper should not have an extended permanent presence. The standard way to remove fear is exposure to that which makes you afraid. You are not helping but profiting from those lied to patrons consumed with a false fear. The pandemic is over, but it is still endemic. The day will come, though, when it is non-existent. With real limits to the total number of daily dining patrons, there is something unfair about increasing the number of seats for the few that can take advantage of this program. I see no limits to this not becoming a horrible public property right principle destroying precedent. Tell me you are not engorging yourself selling out the value of the public right of way to fund the city's underwater excessive spending habits. Thanks. Okay, thank you for your comment. Uh, it looks like that concludes our public comment on this item. I will now bring it back to council for a motion. 
Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Sure, I'll move and um, I have some comments, but I'll move staff rep recommendation to adopt ordinance number 2022-15, establishing a permanent parklet program citywide and adopt a resolution establishing the parklet fee schedule and adopt a resolution adopting the parklet guide guidelines. Great, I'll second. Great, um, and just the comment is uh, I wanna acknowledge Rebecca and Bonnie and the team that worked on this. Uh, it was really apparent in uh, the subcommittee meeting that uh, really the businesses that were there were really pleased with what they saw. They had some clarifying questions, but it's, uh, clear that you guys have done a lot of work and you've worked really hard and you've brought it to a place that feels right for the community. I specifically want to just acknowledge the work you did around the the custom design and bringing that fee down. I think originally it was like fifty to seventy five thousand and now we have the option of fourteen to twenty thousand. So you listened, you heard feedback, and you work hard to get us some different options that were affordable. And then um, the, the framework of being able to waive application fees for hardship, I think that speaks to what Council Member Brown was also bringing up earlier that you know businesses are in different places. So you've really just thought this through and I wanted to acknowledge and thank you for all the work um, and bringing us something that I think is really gonna be a great benefit to the community. Uh and I will just jump in with my comment as well. Um, I know that I've worked over the past year with Rebecca Unit and Bonnie Lipscomb and your team on um, how we can make outdoor dining, uh, you know, a more permanent way for folks to in and feel safe and to enjoy um, being outside and having that option for employees and customers and visitors has really made such a difference even as COVID is ongoing and cases are still coming it allows that breathing room and that um, really it adds ambience as well and um, so all of the work and time and comments and um, you've incorporated so much of the feedback from the businesses and things that I know I've passed along to you as well are all incorporated into a very fair, um, reasonable support system for everybody. And um, thank you for getting it to this point. And um, thank you also for Staying on top of the communications to the businesses, I think that's been really key. The emails going out that with the summaries, the updates, I think that needs to continue and it's been really helpful. Um, so thank you. Council Member Myers. Yeah, I just um, also want to recognize Bonnie and Rebecca. Um, and I just kind of want to mark this moment in time because, you know, you you basically have ushered through um, this horrible pandemic period into really kind of changing the face of how we are going to dine outside in Santa Cruz from here on out. So um, it's just a really neat change for our city. And I'm really glad that, um, you know, we're moving forward with it. And, and I think, you know, our residents are going to love this into the future. So thanks for persisting. Not an easy thing to do. Lots of complications. Um, I learned a lot um, uh, meeting with the other subcommittee members last week. Um, and I think you guys um, have a real pulse on what business owners are struggling with. Um, you know, our needs as a city and um, just really, really thankful for the work you guys have done. Thanks. Just take a second. I just want to um, and thank you for those kind words. And I just want to directly thank Rebecca because this has been the hugest lift. Um, and she has been balancing this um, in addition to, you know, bringing new team members on board and providing business, you know, outreach services, you know, with a lot on her plate. And I feel like she has just gone over and beyond in the outreach and the communication. And so thank you for acknowledging that. Um, that she has done that, but um, it's been um, such a, a pleasure to work with her on this, but it's the the recognition and the hard work has really all been done by, by Rebecca. So I just wanted to say thank you as well. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, Council Member Cummings. Yeah, I just <clears throat> wanna thank you, Rebecca and Bonnie for your, and your team 
for all the work over the past two years, you know, since this all hit with the pandemic and then figuring out how we're going to do outside, you know, because everybody started coming to us like we need outside dining and we're like, we have to figure this out. So, um, yeah, you really got up to speed and we had a lot of different options and we've gone back and forth. Um, but it looks like, you know, I haven't gotten any feedback from the businesses as I was getting before. So it looks like we've, you know, gotten to a place where they feel comfortable with this as well. I do want to, um, I think, you know, Council Member Brown brought it up around the applications and what happens if the, um, you know, there's a backlog or people aren't ready. And I think that's definitely something to keep in mind with moving forward. And also, um, it does sound like, you know, with trying to do the outreach around the applications, review those and implement that along with the sidewalk vending, along with the permanent on private property, just to keep in mind, you know, if there's the need to uh, have extensions um, that that is a consideration because it does sound like you've got a lot on your plate now with this and I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm sure you have other things on your plate as well and um, so just you know um, just hoping to, that you keep that in mind um, but um, given that I haven't heard any you know um, pushback on this I'll be supporting the motion that's before us today. I also just wanted to briefly uh, give a shout out to the team that is also helping with this because it's not done alone, um, but Nathan Nguyen and Curtis Buesenhart and Tim Shields and John Derbisoni and uh, my colleagues as well, Sarah and Nathan and the ED team. Uh, it's definitely a, a, a full team effort, uh, but really excited to be able to get here and appreciate all of the support as well. Thank you. And Stephanie Duck in the city attorney's office. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we have a motion by Councilmember Kalantari Johnson, seconded by Mayor Brunner. May we have a roll call vote? Councilmember Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Councilmember Golder? Absent. Uh, Cummings? Aye. Brown? Aye. Myers? Aye. Vice Mayor Watkins? Aye. And Mayor Brunner? Aye. That motion passes unanimously with Councilmember Golder absent. Thank you very much. Okay, our next uh, item is a recess. Um, okay, so uh, we will return for our evening session at 6 p.m. and that will begin oral communications followed by our um, item number 40, Objective Standards. So we will return here at 6 p.m. Thank you. And if council members can turn your cameras off.
see if council members can turn their cameras on. And is the city clerk ready? I am, thank you. Thank you. Okay, welcome. Okay, here we go. Good evening and welcome to our 6 p.m. session of the November 15th, 2022 meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council. I would like to ask the clerk to please call roll. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Calentari Johnson. Present. Holder. Here. Cumming. Here. Brown. Here. Myers. <coughs> Vice Mayor Watkins. Here. And Mayor Bruno. Present. Thank you. I will now begin with oral communications. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not on today's agenda. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting and joining us virtually, if you wish to comment on oral communications, now is the time to call in. Instructions are on your screen. Oral communication is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not listed on today's agenda. If you're interested in addressing the council, you can raise your hand by dialing star nine on your phone or selecting the raise hand uh, feature on the webinar controls of your computer. You will have two minutes to speak. Members who are joining us here in person and you wish to address the council, please line up to the right of the dais. You will have two minutes to speak. We request that you sign in to ensure correct spelling of your name in the meeting minutes. However, it is not required. Please remember this is a time for council to hear from the public. We are not able to engage in dialogue with each member of the public. However, when we are able, we will address the questions raised after oral communications has completed. Our rules of decorum are on the window ledge to my left. It's my job to keep the meeting running without disruption. And we ask that you respect your fellow citizens when you are inside or outside the chambers. For consideration of our community, please stay home if you have any symptoms of a cold or a flu or are feeling unwell in any way. Okay, let me look to our virtual attendees for hands raised, and then I will look to our in-person attendees. Uh, I have one hand raised, the name I am watching you. Go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. Uh, yeah, okay. Hi. Uh, although the big red wave didn't exactly materialize on election night, I would publicly like to acknowledge the wisdom shown by Santa Cruz City voters who have had enough of leftist politicians trying to attack private property rights in the dismal showing of Measure N. And it looks assured that not a single out leftist politician got elected locally this time around, possibly because of Measure N. It's saying people know the national leftist policies have led to crisis and crisis response failure over and over from the minute Joe Biden took office. Don't want those kind of failures locally here and are rejecting those of the globalist socialist communist persuasion. I suspect it's going to be a little lonely for any leftists left on the council. Isn't there going to be a vacancy on the council? Question. Then what happens? Anyway, while you consider answering that, the, the closet leftist leaners on the council need to do some self-evaluation and start to distance themselves from that equity thinking and high app. Surely, if you can ignore and violate city policy on not rating the public trust fund except to fund CIP projects as of not item 19, I assume you can just stop using high app policy for better reasons since human potential is unknowable, unmeasurable, and as unpredictable as our life outcomes. People are different, not equal. Attempts to make them equal by force will not result in a better world. Who knows? Leftists might eventually suggest blowing everyone's brains out, reaching age 76, since then we could all be 100% assured of an equal life outcome, you know, instead of the good old equal opportunity. Sound good? The leftists are nodding yes. The real source of increasing inequality is that the federal government rulers and moneyed interests are corrupt, immoral, sociopathic, and fascist. But that is not the fault of capitalism or the free market or the founding principles of America, but the people who elected those who could care less about any of those things 
there will always be bad guys. It's up to the voters to reject those. Thanks. Thank you for your comment. That concludes our uh, virtual attendees commenting during oral communications. I will now look to in person. Uh, are you here to speak to oral communications? Welcome. Hi. Thank you, everyone. Um, my name is Elise. I live in Santa Cruz, and um, I have been watching the uh, the library issue since um, years ago. I think it was six years ago or more. We voted for Measure S, and it was widely understood uh, that that measure was to renovate the downtown library where it is, and. Um, the amount that we were allotting, when I say we, I mean the public, public in general, and uh, the people who sponsored the measure, um, we were able to get $20 million roughly toward that renovation. Um, what, what I have seen since then is, first of all, the people who sponsored the measure kept the money and did not go forward with the renovation, quite against and betraying, I think, the public's goodwill and trust. That needs to be said first and foremost. What was proposed was a library garage. There was no housing attached to that so-called mixed-use project that then was put forward um, by certain people, Cynthia Matthews and others on the council and behind the council were pushing this. This was enormously unpopular. At one meeting, the emails were four to one against it. And so what this group of powerful people did is attach so-called affordable housing to this mixed use project, making it largely irresistible to many, especially students and young people in the community who feel we need housing. I can't go into details right here right now about the um, deceptive practices that went into, such as stacking the so-called library group, I forget what they were called, bringing in a certain director to try to hoodwink the public. But the signs that were used for measure uh, no on no were very, very deceptive and sadly very unfair. We're going to have to live with the result, and I think that the hubris of these parties who feel that it was their Your time privilege... Is up. Thanks. Their privilege and power to deceive the public, I hope one day will be held accountable for this fiasco of democracy. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for your comment. Uh, we are taking oral communications. This is a chance to comment on anything not on today's agenda. Welcome. Can I, I'm just going to say the, the alarm didn't go off on our end. They couldn't see it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Sam Hughes. I'm a PhD student at UCSC. Yesterday, more than 48,000 graduate student teacher's assistants, uh, postdoctoral fellows, uh, individuals with PhDs and master's degrees went on strike from all 10 University of California campuses in the largest higher education strike in US history. Uh, this is the result of unaffordable wages in coupling with the housing crisis that we're currently dealing with. According to the UCSC's own statistics on the available rental properties available in town for students, the cost of housing for a room in a home has more than doubled in the past two years, uh, despite the fact that they're offering us only a 7% wage increase, which isn't even enough to cover inflation for the last year, essentially a pay cut. Because of this, we're asking you as members of the council to please consider two things. First, please consider meeting with Chancellor Lareve to help her understand the struggle that we're dealing with as citizens in this city. Um, her inaction has led to the University Council of the, uh, the Office of the President doing very little in response to the strike. And second, we encourage you to consider coming out to the picket that's taking place from 7 a.m. in the morning until 5 p.m. each day of the week so that you can hear about hundreds of your constituents' struggles that we're dealing with right now in Santa Cruz. Um, please feel free to get in contact with me if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Our next member of the public, welcome. Uh, hello, my name is Isadora. I'm an undergraduate student at UCSC. I came out here. Will you um, bring the microphone to your mouth? Thank <laughs> yes, you. Yes, I'm short. Sorry. Um, yeah, my name is Isadora. I'm a student at 
UCSC, I came out here with him. Um, I think that the strike is going to go on for a long time. It, there's definitely a big support, both from graduate students and uh, the undergraduate student body as well. Um, and my concern is that if the strike is unaddressed, this will affect future enrollment from undergraduate students. And the economy of Santa Cruz relies so heavily on students, both for like purchases and also we work a lot of the jobs, like you know the Starbucks jobs, downtown jobs. Um, so if there's no more undergraduate students, that's really going to affect Santa Cruz. So I really think it's in your best interest to um, urge the university to make good faith nego negotiations with the TAs so the strike doesn't go on too long. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Hi, welcome. <coughs> Hello. Oh, Jesus. Um, I'm CJ Hunt. I'm a, I'm a UCSC undergrad as well. I came here uh, in solidarity to support the strikers. Didn't in originally intend to say anything, but another voice in the crowd seems to me can only be productive. Um, you know, this council, I'm aware, doesn't run the UC. You guys don't decide how much, how much TAs get paid, so I can't make you do anything. But it seems to me it would be good of this council. Um, it would be, it would be kind of this council in service to this community to go to uh, Cynthia Larive and other UC officials and to put in a good word on behalf of striking workers. You know, what they're demanding is, is really only the bare minimum uh, uh, that is needed to survive in this community according to the math they've done and they know their way around math. These people have PhDs. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's, it's perfectly fair to demand that they be paid enough to survive in this community. It's not a radical demand. It's not an alarming demand. And the UC can say they can't afford it, um, but that claim rings pretty hollow when it comes immediately after Larive has given herself um, pretty big, pretty pretty big raise, as I recall. So so. You know. The the promise of public universities, right, is that they don't function for profit; they function for the community. They're supposed to serve the students, uh, but when the people who do the very hard work of grading, of research. Of, of lecturing, tutoring, all these things that make the university work. And I know it's hard work because my parents are teachers. I watched them do it all along when I was growing up. It's hard work grading all these things. That's what makes the university run because the university, what it is, is a factory that produces education. When all the people that do this hard work aren't getting paid enough to live and the people that, that run the school are getting paid so much, it doesn't seem like a nonprofit. It seems like the workers are being squeezed for the profit of a boss class and that isn't very fair, and I think it would be good of this council uh, to speak in opposition to it. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, should I be giving a warning since the bell's not? Okay. That's okay. I'm going to go back to our virtual attendees. It looks like we had a couple hands raised. Um, the first name is Laura. Go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. We are taking oral communications on anything not on today's agenda. Well, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, okay? welcome. Yes. Thank you for taking our um, feedback. I want to jump to the point of the first speaker who talked about uh, the deceptive nature of the campaign against Measure O. Perception of the community, a lot of members of the community, is that the council and the staff are bought and paid for by developers. And it's very disheartening to feel like we have very substantial needs and, and desires to make our community a, a people-centered place. So I want to ask you to now to just, if you could please open your mind and be a little bit more curious about what the community is tell, um, telling you. We don't want pollution and more traffic and more congestion. We would prefer a people-centered, community-centered, developmental pl development plan. And I've been aware of this uh, since Measure O, 
and it took me about six weeks to come up with a wonderful book called Cities for People. I took a morning class on the new wave of urban development. I've learned that the other cities of California are by banding together to fight the state's RENA numbers. There is a lot going on that would the process so we weren't so adversarial. The community is asking you to listen sincerely with an open mind and curiosity about the direction of the 21st century urban building. We don't want to look back. We don't want parking lots that cause pollution, an unnecessary large library or skyscrapers or congestion. We want a community-centered living space where you don't go about tearing and destroying the beauty of our heritage trees or Thank you. Your time is up. Scrapers that you can't see the view. So please be a little bit more curious and thoughtful and inclusive. Our next uh, hand raise is Peter Behir. Go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. Hello. Hi, Peter. Hello, Mayor. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, um, I just wanted to just give a feedback from the managers, Matt Huffaker, about the, and this is Peter Bishi, by the way, the community liaison for the city of Santa Cruz. Um, just want to give a feedback from Matt Huffaker, city manager's report, and how, uh, as a spokesperson for Lower Ocean and Beach Flat, uh, uh, with the community is delighted about the project, the San Lorenzo River Lagoon Culver project. Uh, it definitely benefits them, and they've been very frustrated in the past with, and I have uh, experienced and witnessed the several basements. Believe it or not, there are basements in Beach Flat and Lower Ocean. And I've heard even downtown businesses as well, when the, you know, with the shoaling of the San Lorenzo. Uh, then the rise, the, the the level of the river rises, and it just affects uh, up to downtown businesses, and this will tremendously help them. Uh, we've had the, the garden also has been flooded with the with these waters several times, and people spend several months having at the beach flat garden having a crop and growing seeds, and then they all of a sudden they just get all swamped, and then they're even afraid to harvest um you know their their crops just because of these green waters uh, affecting at least three to four plots at beach flat garden uh, and uh, towards the climate action program and uh, tiffany wise west uh, we are having these slow meetings and we want more and more intercommunication with uh, members of the community from beach flat and lower ocean who most likely will be the most affected by climate action or by global warming we're making this little workshop to see how they can participate directly and help us to mitigate these problems and how to mitigate erosions. And uh, so we're having, we're starting this series of meetings, which is the first of five meetings. We had 12 members of the community showing up in the first one, and a lot of them were just concerned about the, 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 the San Lorenzo. So we were able to inform them that this project is going along. They were very happy, and I saw lots of smiles. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you for your comment. Our next hand raised for oral communications is the name Rafa Sonnenfeld. Go ahead and press star six to unmute. Hi there. Uh, yeah, um, I was just calling uh, because uh, you know, we've had a lot of discussion recently about um, the uh, uh, the challenge that our city faces with um, housing affordability, and uh, you know, there are a number of efforts that we are are working on to address that issue, um, including updating our housing element, and um, and part of that is the downtown expansion plan. Um, I think I wanted to address uh, and make a recommendation. Um, uh, our community seems to not be particularly well informed about what our responsibilities are 
um, under state law. And I keep on hearing suggestions that we somehow fight the state or, or, or uh, attempt to get out of our responsibilities. Uh, every city in the state has, to, has similar challenges as our own, and we all have a responsibility to plan for more housing. Um, so I, I would encourage the city to um, hold some community forums uh, to, to really educate our community about uh, how we have to grow uh, our housing stock. We have 3,736 units of new housing, uh, over half of which must be affordable that we need to plan for. And, and how if we don't plan for that, uh, uh, the state can actually take away our entirely our lo local land use decision making, and so um, I've been encouraging us to try to um, uh, achieve a compliant housing element, um, and there are lots of different ways that we could do that. Um, and I, I think people are in for a real wake up call if we don't end up um, with a compliant housing element at the end of the day. So I, I would just hope that you all uh, work on on better educating our community about about what we are what we need. To Thank you for your comment. Our next hand raised for oral communications is Kyle Kelly. <laughs> uh, hey all, thanks again. This is Kyle Kelly. Um, I just want to uh, raise a comment because I know everybody's going to talk about housing tonight and I want to point out a few figures just to kind of put into perspective, not the RENA allocation, but the number of students that graduate high school every year. Santa Cruz High alone graduates 250 students a year. We are not building 250 apartments per year, which means that we are currently, without creating enough housing, causing a displacement effect somewhere else or even here. Not to mention all the people that are currently overburdened on rent, currently living in overcrowded conditions or commuting from far away. Um, I just wanna bring it back to that human perspective because like how the buildings look, and everything else that people wanna talk about, it's kind of missing the point of, you know, what are the unfilled vacancies on, on public staff? What are the unfilled vacancies within our public schools like how do we recruit and retain people that are going to work here the people that that work here and live here and serve here um so i just want to make sure that we we bring that to the forefront as we think about housing for the future thank you thank you for your comment uh is there anybody else in the in person here that would like to comment for oral communications just want to make sure I get everybody. It looks like that concludes our virtual hands raised as well. Mayor, I'd left the post it on your. Okay, and so we have, um, uh, let's see, Ann Siegel, who, um, if you're able to unmute yourself, go ahead. Star six to unmute yourself. I can. Yes, are you able to hear me now? Thank yes. you. Thanks so much. My name is Ann Siegel, and I'm an applicant for a hearing that's set for November 29th. I first want to apologize. I'm so embarrassed that I am coming before you on a tangential matter when, and a not a substantive matter. And I, I just apologize for that. I don't like wasting anybody's time, but I am asking this council to consider resetting the hearing that has been scheduled for November 29th. The statute does permit and require a 60 day setting but does allow for an extension of that setting in circumstances in which the council uh, may not be able to accommodate. It's not an abuse of your discretion to reset this. It's a matter that's very personal to me and that it's the Tuesday after Thanksgiving and there's really no harm to anybody in having this matter be heard at a, late, at a, at a reasonable date a few weeks after. I've talked to the appellant, Watermark, I've left messages, I've called them, they haven't answered. I spoke to Miss, I sent messages to Miss Rusk. She did not answer. I sent messages to the, through a conduit, a, an intermediary to a person who was Mr. Bernstein, did not answer. I spoke to their attorney, he was interested, but did not answer. If their indifference is that great just to me in a reasonable matter, I hate to think of what Watermark will do when somebody has a broken water main or has another problem during construction. 
it is uh, just again, it's a reasonable request to have this matter be heard by the new city council so that there is not an, any appearance of impropriety, that there is not finding favor to one party or the other. The interest that I'm asking in extending it is not illegal. I'm not asking anyone to speed. I'm just asking for a resetting to a reasonable date so I can appear and my husband, Dr. Robert Siegel, will be able to come without expense. Did you want to speak to oral? Okay, oral communications, welcome. Thank you for taking my comment. My name is Susan Monheit. I'm a resident of Santa Cruz. Um, I understand that there is housing that needs to be built, and half of it needs to be affordable. And I want to say that we cannot build our way out of an affordable housing crisis if we do not build affordable housing. I also understand the Planning Commission has, on a couple of occasions at least, uh, recommended that the city raise the affordable housing component of new developments to 25%, and that this city council has not supported that. So I want to, str as strongly as I can, encourage this council to take that up and pass an increase in affordable housing in the developments that are coming forward. Um, and I would just like to say that the argument of supply and demand does not apply to a destination location like Santa Cruz. It works when there is not an infinite demand for housing. We cannot continue to, um, watching my time, to build market rate housing with increasingly smaller percentages of affordable housing, particularly once the bonus density is added to those developments. Uh, the, it, I call it an infinite calculation. It is skewing the median income on which the affordable housing is based astronomically higher. Thank you. Okay, we have another oral communications. Good evening, I couldn't resist. Um, this is such a huge subject and it deserves mentioning the students 30% of our town are students, and I don't see any kind of housing that's specifically tailored to them. And there's all kinds of great housing. In fact, there's New York Stock Exchange companies that that's all they do is build student housing, and they're very well financed, and we've never encouraged that kind of housing. And of course, it would be ideal to be next to the metro and along the most major transit stops, which go from the university along Bay Street. So it's really something to consider. Um, I also wanted to mention uh, Karen Chapel. She is with the Urban Displacement. She spoke at a keynote uh, a few years ago, and um, I attended that along with several people um, for a couple of three days. Um, and she said that this town needs 72% affordable housing. That's how great the need is. We are a small town. We're 12 square feet, I mean, 12 square feet. 12 square miles, and about 20% is green space, which people would argue is so much. But remember that Palo Alto is about 50%. So um, we need that as we found it provides some resiliency for fires, so it's very important to have this, the green space. And it's also very important that we address affordable housing, and especially the students, and especially, I might add, for those that don't use cars. And that would definitely be the case. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, does this, that conclude oral communications? I believe so. And that concludes our virtual attendees. Um, I would like to just briefly ask the city attorney on one matter that was called in. That was the matter of uh, Ann Siegel and the, the hearing. My understanding is there is a 60-day um, 
requirement per muni code from the to set the date is within the 60 day window yes that is correct um, the, the uh, 60 day deadline is specified by the both the zoning code and the general administrative provisions of the uh, municipal code um, and the unfortunately the convenience of the appellant is is not a grounds for continuing the hearing past that 60 day when <coughs> if there were another convenient time that the council could schedule for a special meeting within that 60 days that would be an option but my understanding is that the December 29th date was the only day available the next meeting in December the 13th is past the 60 day window as well thank you um, Okay, were there any other, does any other council members have any? Okay, thank you. Um, okay, we are, that concludes oral communications. And so now we are ready to move on in our agenda. And um, we are at agenda number 40. Agenda item number 40 is objective standards. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting and joining us virtually, if you would like to comment on objective standards, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and then return to the council for deliberation and action. In addition to public comment tonight, we will be hearing on this item, 63 emails were sent to city council at cityofsantacruz.com. I would now like to um, hand it over to uh, Director of Planning and Community Development, Lee Butler, and will Sarah Van Noisy and Matt Van Hua be joining us as well? Yes, they will. Okay. Great, thank you. Thank you and good evening, Mayor and City Council members. Tonight I'm pleased to be presenting to you on the Objective Standards Project that represents the culmination of three years of staff work and two years of community engagement, resulting in quantifiable design criteria for new residential development and new zoning districts that match the housing capacity that can currently be developed under state law and the city's existing general plan. Considering the, re the recent state housing laws, the project provides more transparency and more local control to require high quality building and site design for future residential development. While the city has always had some objective standards when reviewing project applications, it has also long relied on many subjective standards to influence design of new developments. Recent state laws have significantly reduced the ability of cities to apply subjective standards to new development, so it's vital that standards be made objective, and that's what this project is doing. In addition to proposed new standards on building form and site design, many others are proposed for things like street trees, open space amenities, and dark sky lighting protections that improve the city for everyone. The proposed standards were developed through extensive engagement with the community to reflect how the community wants new development to look and feel. In addition to several citywide community meetings, over 800 people responded to the 2021 Objective Standards Survey. Following the survey, our planning team met with and discussed um, with focus groups um, that included traditionally underrepresented groups for further input. To help identify what standards accommodate the growth allowed by the general plan, our consultant prepared test fit analyses, which modeled various buildings on a variety of sites. And the results of those test fits, including building heights and stories, were discussed by the Planning Commission at a public hearing in January of 21, and were discussed by the City Council at a study session in March of 21. That was actually a general business item and not a study session. Um, based on all of the analyses and community feedback, Draft standards were developed, and those standards, including the number of stories, were presented to the Planning Commission and then separately to the City Council in November of 21. And the latest versions of those standards have been available on the website since we prepared them in November of 21. 
multiple improvements have been made since that time based on community feedback that we've received. As for the objective standards rezonings, recent state law changes now allow maximum residential capacities in the general plan land use designations to supersede residential capacities based on zoning requirements. So that means where the zoning standards do not allow the maximum residential capacities of the general plan, the developer can currently waive the zoning standards. So a developer right now has a lot of leeway to dictate building heights, setbacks, parking, or other standards that will apply to their projects, even if they don't conform to our current zoning requirements. The Objective Standards Project rezonings address this inconsistency and shift the control back to the city. The proposed rezonings do not increase the amount of currently allowed residential development. They create zoning requirements that provide for residential development that is already allowed under the general plan and state law. The consistency between the general plan and zoning is both more transparent and it gives the community more control over development. Given the many improved standards proposed, the state mandated development restrictions and the increase in local control, it's imperative that the objective standards are, and associated rezonings be approved and in place as soon as possible. The standards do not apply to applications submitted before the new standards take effect. So the sooner we have them in place, the more control the city will have over ensuring high quality design and um, buildings. Our senior planner, Sarah Noisy, and various other team members detailed the changes in a two hour presentation to the council on August 23rd. We're not going to redo that entire presentation for you, um, but I do wanna turn it over to Sarah. She's going to um, provide an abbreviated overview and some updates, and she'll also be joined by Travis Beck from our Parks and Recreation Department. Thank you. Thanks, Lee. Good evening, council. It's a pleasure to be here again. I am gonna get right into it, so I'll go ahead and share my screen. Can everyone see that? Yes, thank you, Sarah. Okay, so um, this is gonna be a quicker presentation. I'm gonna talk more quickly. If there are any details here that you wanna pause on, please interrupt me. If there's any detail that you wanna go back to from the other presentation, I also have that available and we can get into it if you wanna get into it, but we're gonna try and keep it pretty high level this time since we were all here in August and we get, went through it all in a great amount of detail at that time. So, Can I ask you, Sarah, sorry to interrupt, to not go too quickly, to just pace okay. it and not rush through it. Okay. Thank you. So um, just a little bit of background, um, just to remind everyone, this project, this whole project to create all of these standards, the rezoning districts, the street tree standards, the public work standards that have come in, um, was, create, was initiated to create local controls under these new state laws that have come in for housing development that really limit the control that we are accustomed to having. So that includes both an objective review process that sort of steps in and replaces a lot of the subjective design permit findings we have previously relied on to control building form and site design. It also includes this action to reconcile the general plan and the zoning ordinance and address this um, inconsistency that has been in place since the general plan was adopted in 2012. And we had direction from the city council to reconcile that difference by making changes to our zoning code rather than address making changes in both documents or changing the general plan. So we had direction to not alter the land use pattern that's established in that 2030 general plan. So these rezonings that are part of the package, they set height limits, setback limits, open space requirements for new mixed use development and provide the envelope that all of the design standards can then stick to and, um, and then apply to um, housing development. And I just wanna mention here, we did hear some critique from the um, community is, as we were reviewing the 831 water project that we didn't have these objective standards in place to apply to that project. So here they are. These are the standards that will apply to projects like that in the future. I just want to remind everyone really briefly, the state is very interested in enforcing the existing housing laws. The governor is very interested in it. The attorney general is very interested in it. And so um, we are doing our best to comply and to be um, a responsible community in the state and meeting our obligations under that state law. So um, the general plan plans for multifamily housing throughout the city. So 
Um, it plans for mixed use development, so residential apartments or condos with a commercial component at the ground floor in areas that are currently used for commercial uses um, and areas that could be redesignated for mixed use. So um, all of the areas that are shown on this map are areas that are, are mixed use districts. And these are the parcels that are proposed for rezoning tonight. These standards also apply to all other multifamily housing that's built throughout the city in residential areas and neighborhoods everywhere um, in Santa Cruz. The state law has really reduced our discretion again. And so we're relying on these standards to create some of that control that we have lost through that process. So just to give an example of that, this is what's allowed today shown on the left side of this column in this um, areas that are designated um, in the brown, shown in the brown on this map, that's the mixed use high density designation from our general plan. So that allows a 2.75 floor area ratio, which is a measure of total volume that can go inside a building, a development density of 55 dwelling units per acre for larger size units of two bedrooms or more. Um, the general plan establishes that there's no density for small units, so single room occupancy units, flexible density units, one bedrooms and studio apartments or condos, those are not, um, there's no density limit that applies in these, in these areas for those uses. The general plan does not set a height limit, doesn't set setbacks, so setbacks would be dictated by the fire code, so they would be between zero and five feet, depending on the type of construction. There's no open space requirement in the general plan, there's no requirement for neighborhood transitions, there's no building articulation. So the rezonings and the zone districts that we're bringing in would create those standards that are currently missing in our regulations. So we would create a five-story height limit in this location so that we have a height limit at all. We would require a minimum of 20-foot setbacks at the rear. There's a minimum of 120 square feet of open space required per unit. And then we have a transition plane that's part of our design standards, an articulation of the building, um, plus all the other design standards that we have as part of the design. And so the, the first two, um, I'm sorry, the first three items that are highlighted in yellow here are really created in the zoning districts themselves. And the, the um, last two are created in the design standards. The design standards cover all of the issues that are listed here on your screen. There are um, a total of 14 different aspects of site development and um, building design that we cover and address. And we can go into the details of any of this if anyone is interested in getting into that. Um, so to get into um, the work that we've done since August, one of the primary things that we did was create a set of responses to the most frequently raised concerns at that August 23rd um, hearing. So there were five questions that we um, wrote up and posted to our website. So this first one, we're, we're really hammering on this, but I think it's really, really key for folks to understand this. Is the city upzoning property? We are not. There is no upzoning that is happening today. The proposed residential intensity is what can happen today and has been able to happen for the past two years since 2019. This is result of a change in state law, which really flips the script in the way that we do planning. So the zoning that we're up, that we are proposing at this point would create a height limit that does not exist today. And it would also create setbacks and open space requirements that do not exist today on all of those sites. Um, we heard some concerns about the, you know, the standards being complicated. And this is a big package of stuff. We want to acknowledge that this is really, you know, it's a lot. That's why we've had it available for a year through the website. That's why we walked folks through it last November so that they could understand these and give really um, thoughtful and um, understanding feedback um, on the standards. So these standards are based on a lot of community input. And one of the things that was really important to our local community is um, eclecticism. So many of our standards can be met in multiple different ways. So there's like three different ways you could articulate the facade of your building. There's several different ways that you could include um, architectural detail, right? So we're not just giving folks one option. We're giving many options to um, promote the idea that there are lots of different ways that something can look like it belongs in Santa Cruz. And so these are more complicated than some standards in some places, like Santa Barbara. Everything is just, you know, colonial mission style, and that's like one way to do it. And they're also just less, they're less complicated than other places. So, you know, the ones that are coming in some places like Palo Alto or, um, or San Francisco, they're just more complicated. They're more, they're different ty types of cities. <clears throat> So um, would this take away public hearings for development? So that is a, we heard that critique and we have brought forward some um, policy options for the council to consider. 
So a couple of things to note here. First of all, the streamlining option, and I'll talk about these more later, was recommended by staff and the Planning Commission in order to provide some incentive for projects to fully conform to all of these standards and really um, you know, create some, some reason for a project to fully conform if they can save some time and avoid going to a public hearing. We're also in a situation where if a project fully conforms and it includes housing, we can't deny it and we can't condition it to make it smaller to reduce the amount of housing either by square footage or number of units. So we'll get into those policy options um, next. What was the environmental review that was required? Um, most, the majority of this package is covered by the work that was done on the general plan and the environmental impact report, the EIR, that was created for that document and adopted or um, certified by the council in 2012. And then there are portions related to, um, you know, the miscellaneous zoning amendments that are sort of part of this that are really part of, more part of the common sense exemption is that they're very small changes and they're, um, there's no possibility that they could have any impact on the natural environment. And then lastly, like, what's in it for me? Why should I care as a, you know, Joe member, Jane Public of City, of City of Santa Cruz about doing these objective standards? So these are creating local control that really has been stripped away by recent changes in state law. These are creating design standards that reflect community um, input and community values about what design should look like in Santa Cruz in order to fit in and look like it belongs here and adds positively to the urban environment. They create transparency so people can actually understand what is allowed to happen and what can be built in parcels that are near them. We've, all, we've had several examples in the last couple of years of people being surprised by the amount of development that is actually able to happen. And so creating this zoning really ups the transparency of that. They give us these design standards that we really want to get in place quickly as we're um, receiving more development applications every day. We're also going to get more street trees by creating standards that require them and the sidewalk widths that accommodate them. We're getting dark sky lighting in all of our new housing development. That's a requirement that's included with these design standards. And then there's also things that are about really making the open space that's provide, provided with a project meaningful and usable. So it has amenities and it's um, appropriate dimensions and it includes a mix of private open space and common open space within a project so that we're creating really high quality places for our neighbors to live in. So let's get into the public hearing policy options. So there are three options that are included with your packet and I'm going to slow down a little bit here because this is really the place where your council has a policy choice to make um, and so this is pretty significant. So first of all um, I just want to emphasize for members of the community, none of these options make any change to our community outreach policy, which is the policy that creates notification of upcoming development projects. It creates community meetings, which are an opportunity for community members to meet and directly with a developer and speak with them. Um, and it requires noticing, like posting at the site. So none of that would change under any of these three options. Um, Public hearing requirements would continue to apply to lots of other things. Most commercial development will require public hearing. Density bonus will always require public hearing. The changes that we're propose, proposing are really here to reflect the limitations that state law has placed on this process. And so like that design permit process and those 10 findings that we currently have in our code, they just, they simply can't function in the way that they were designed and intended to function. So these design standards replace them. And so the process that we use incorporating those design standards needs to reflect that those um, findings have kind of been replaced. So we have to rely on objective standards for review primarily, and we can't have any net loss of development capacity anywhere within the city. So the three options, option one is the streamlined option. And this is the option that staff is recommending and was recommended by your planning commission. So in this situation, Fully conforming rental housing because, you know, doing a subdivision, so creating ownership housing requires a subdivision map and that is going to trigger, that's a trigger for a public hearing. So that will already have to go to a public hearing. So we're talking about fully conforming renting, rental housing. So it meets every single one of the existing zoning standards that apply and every single one of the new design standards that apply would go through an administrative review. So this is already the same process that we currently use for reviewing residential development in residential zones. Those projects have been for decades reviewed by staff and they only trigger a public hearing if there is some other reason, you know, one of the many other reasons that they would trigger a public hearing or if they're appealed. 
So that's option one, is that we essentially take that existing process for residential and residential zones and extend it to mixed-use and mixed-use zones and residential and commercial zones. Option two would be to, to create conforming hearings. So essentially saying that even though you've met every single one of our um, design standards, we're going to bring you into a public hearing um, to confirm that. And so that we're recommending that those hearings would happen with the zoning administrator. And then the third option is to sort of take both the prior two options and create a hybrid that's based on the size of the project. So um, fully conforming rental housing that has 50 units or fewer would go through our administrative process. And then um, fully conforming rental housing, if there are 51 units or more, uh, would be required to go to a public hearing with the zoning administrator. So this is really a matter of, you know, whether you want to incentivize conformance and, you know, sort of the value of that. Because if you're bringing a, if you're bringing an item to a public hearing for, to be fully conforming, they may as well go for at least five variations because it's the same public hearing process that they'll have to go to. So that's kind of our thinking is that, like, there's some benefit into creating some incentive to fully conform to the design standards. And that's why that's our recommendation. And this is just a policy choice that your council can make. So just to reiterate, this is the current process listed on the left. So community outreach notice and meetings happen with, um, based on the size of development. We have public hearings for most commercial development, for density bonus projects, for planned development permits, for variances, coastal permits, subdivisions, being close to a slope, and for residential and commercial zones when it's more than two units. So we also have a right of appeal currently and CEQA review applies. So these places where the highlights are, these are the only things that we are proposing any change to. So in option one, in the streamlined option, what would change is that um, only alternative designs for residential would go, would trigger that need for a public hearing. There wouldn't be a public hearing for something that fully conformed um, for residential in mixed use or commercial zones. In option two, we would require public hearings for conforming residential in commercial and mixed use zones um, and mixed use in mixed use zones. And then we would also still be requiring those alternative designs for residential. Those are always gonna trigger a public hearing in every one of these three options. And so then in our third hybrid option, again, we're separating based on size. So the public hearing would only apply to alternative designs or to projects with 51 units or more and those um, projects with 50 units or less, if they're fully conforming and they're rental projects, they could be eligible for an administrative review streamlined process. Um, so this is this is just you know a policy choice for your council to make about you know what kind of incentive do you want to create. So I also just want to address the, the findings are shifting. So because we're using these objective standards. The findings now really just focus on conforming to those standards. So that's really the first finding that the decision maker would have to make in any of these situations, whether that's staff or the zoning administrator or the planning commission. And then for alternative designs, um, the decision makers would evaluate the proposed alternative against the goal that's set for each for the um, standard from which they're seeking to vary. And I meant to place in a goal here and I forgot to do that. But for each of the standards that's set in the design standards, they have a stated goal about why are we why are we requiring you know new connections through sites to create pedestrian permeability and create walkable neighborhoods. Essentially, that's the goal. I'm paraphrasing. And so, if someone wants to propose an alternative design to that standard and somehow do it in a different way, that's the decision maker is going to be deciding if they are still conforming to that purpose that's stated for the um, standard. So we also heard a lot of concerns from folks who live in the neighborhood around Leonard Street. So we're just gonna talk about that um, briefly. I think you've heard from them and they've also requested some extra time tonight. So um, I just wanna point out, this is the map that was um, shown to the city council. This was from a study session on February 7th, 2012. Um, and it, it shows, you know, this is the land use map that was adopted that shows these three parcels, excuse me, um, right here. These three parcels are the ones in question for those who haven't um, you know, been following this process. These are identified for that mixed-use visitor commercial general plan land use designation, which does allow a higher intensity of development than these parcels that are here on Ocean Street, which are identified in the mixed-use medium density designation. 
Um, and all of our records indicate that this adoption was done properly and correctly, and we have all the records to show that. So, um, and we understand that there are concerns about this. So if the city council um, is, chooses to direct us to make a change here, there are to this designation, um, here's how that might happen, okay? So we could, our recommendation is still that we proceed with the rezoning because that is gonna create those height and setback controls, which as we've talked about, don't exist there today. Um, and then you could direct staff to consider the, these parcels as part of the um, updates we know we need to meet, make to the Ocean Street area plan. And those will be beginning sometime next year. So um, we also would wanna think about these in the context of our housing element update our downtown plan expansion. So if there is gonna be any transfer of density, you know, where is that gonna go in the city? Um, and so taking a look at the housing element update, the downtown plan expansion, and the Ocean Street area plan updates, um, kind of all together as a whole, allows us to really take a citywide look at these issues and think about this really holistically and comprehensively so that we can make sure that um, number one, we don't get slowed down right, if one, if one project ends up heading on a slower track for some reason, but then also that we can really think about, you know, are there other places that we may need to be adding capacity for housing, and can we incorporate this, you know, any transfer of density from these parcels in with that process? So, um, you know, we'd want to look at that in a really, um, in a strategic and comprehensive way. So another piece that we've added this time is a recommendation about transit passes. So the Planning Commission had made a recommendation about transit passes when we um, brought this item to them in the summer. And um, they were recommending that every project over 50 units require transit passes for everyone. And at the hearing in August, we were, we were recommending that we kind of um, hold on to that recommendation until we get to um, implementing the Climate Action Plan, which is also going to affect transit and parking a lot. Um, in the interim, the governor the governor has signed AB 2097, which um, eliminates parking minimums in locations that are within half a mile of transit for projects that include 20 dwelling units or more. <clears throat> and Metro has developed a program to ha create a contract to enter into with developers. So with those two pieces in place, it made sense to us that we would bring this back. Um, we would make this adjustment to add a condition um, add some code language that um, for residential projects, new residential projects with 20 units or more that are within half a mile of high quality transit, they must provide um, transit passes to all residents in the development and that that would be handled through a direct contract between the developer or the HOA, so the property owner or the HOA um, and Metro Transit. And then this is a map of where all of our existing high quality transit stops are within the city. So you can see it covers a lot of the Upper West Side and all of campus and most of, almost all of downtown and portions of Ocean Street as well. Um, and now I'm going to invite Travis Beck to join me to talk about the updates to the street tree standards. Thank you, Sarah. Good evening, Mayor, members of the council. I'm Travis Beck, Superintendent of Parks, and would like to bring to you some updates that we are proposing to the three portions of tonight's item relating to street trees. You can go to the next slide. Um, as just a refresher, uh, there we go. We did uh, bring a street tree master plan before the council um, last year and many of the changes we're proposing are building off of that. And the first of these is revisions to the tree ordinance chapter 1330. Most of the changes to 1330 were reviewed in the staff report and presentation at the August 23rd council meeting. But we are proposing a few additional changes in order to better coordinate between this portion of the municipal code and the heritage tree ordinance chapter 9.56. So those changes include adding some definitions, removing language around tree replacement from one section of the chapter 1330 in order to allow us to charge in lieu fees for heritage trees that are located in the public right of way. Moving that language, as well as information about in lieu fees into a new section, 1330.063. And then two notable changes that we are proposing adding to that section are giving the director the ability to waive the requirement to replace street trees, which otherwise applies anytime a tree is removed 
for example, in the rare cases where we have an overplanting of street trees and it's not necessary to replace. Also establishing criteria to waive the in-lieu fee for a property owner that may be experiencing economic hardship. And then finally, making more explicit the requirements of the coast, local coastal program and how those would apply in street tree replacement. And finally, clarifying when heritage tree and sidewalk removal permits apply as opposed to a street tree permit. These changes were all made since our last um, Parks and Recreation Commission meeting and therefore have not been reviewed by the commission. The second item before you is a new resolution establishing the street tree replacement in Lucy. This was fully presented at the last council meeting, but just wanted to bring it up here for completeness, proposing uh, fees based on the size of the tree in circumstances where replacement is not possible. And this was recommended for adoption by the Parks and Recreation Commission at their August 8th meeting. And then the third uh, item before you is a resolution establishing mitigation requirements for heritage tree or shrub removal. There is an existing resolution that we use today, which was adopted in 1994. And the resolution we're bringing before you tonight uh, revises that resolution and would apply one single mitigation standard to all heritage tree and shrub removal, regardless of the size of the tree, and regardless of whether the removal was approved or unapproved. And that mitigation would be to replant three number 15 container size or one 24 inch box container size tree or shrub in the case of removal. And that is the primary intent of the mitigation requirements that the removed tree or shrub be replaced. And in circumstances where there does not, that is not possible, charge a $1,705 in lieu fee, which is the same fee as for the larger size of street trees that we're proposing in the other resolution. And these fees are based on calculations of the cost to purchase plant and water to establishment a new tree. So this would allow us to charge the same fees for a heritage tree that's in the public right of way as we would for another street tree. And then in the case of unapproved removal, we would charge additional penalties um, if someone did that willfully or uh, egregiously in some fashion. So we did bring this resolution before the Parks and Recreation Commission at our October 10th meeting, and they gave us direction for a different recommendation, which was to charge the $1,705 in lieu fee in cases of approved removal, but a substantially larger fee of approximately $7,800 in cases of unapproved removal in order to disincentivize unapproved removal. The reason we're presenting uh, the recommendation above that we are is that after discussing the recommendations with the city attorney's office, uh, we were advised that using a fee to create the disincentives is a legally inappropriate mechanism and would not necessarily be defensible since fees are to be based on reasonable costs according to state law. And therefore, we're separating the fee, which is the replacement cost from the penalty, which would be the disincentive. And those penalties could be um, anywhere from $250 for a simple infraction all the way up to you know thousands of dollars if we pursued citations under Title IV of the Municipal Code. So I'm joined this evening as well by our urban forester, Leslie Keedy. So if you have questions during the question period, we'd be happy to answer those. We also have um, staff from the city attorney's office available. Thank you. Thanks, Travis. So I just want to let folks know about the additional community outreach we've done since the um, hearing on the 23rd. So first we created a frequently asked questions response and posted those to our website. So those were available to everyone in the community. And then we also um, grabbed all of the email addresses from everyone who sent correspondence to that item on the 23rd and reached out to them via email to make sure that they had the link to this FAQ document that was on the website. Um, and also to invite them to the community meeting that we had to go over the frequently asked questions and also then to answer any other questions that they might have. You know, they might read these initial responses and then that might generate some more thinking or more questions from them. Um, 
So we also sent that same email to everyone who had signed up on our website for um, email updates about the project throughout the um, two years that we've been working on it. Which, so it was a total of maybe 250 emails that we sent out. Um, so we also publicized the meeting on Facebook and Instagram for the city and uh, through the city manager update and through, uh, as I mentioned, those emails to um, participants. We then we held that meeting and then posted the meeting slides and the recording to the project website for anyone who wasn't able to you know, join, join us live. And then we also created a summary of the ordinance. So you know, this is over 200 pages, probably almost 300 pages of, of ordinance text, right? And the municipal code is not something that's very um, transparent to the average layperson, right? So <clears throat> what we did was we wrote up a summary table where we listed out each code section that was getting amended, which department was amending it, um, what the purpose of the amendment was, and then where to where which document to find it in. So was it part of the um, document that includes changes to the local coastal program or, or part of the one that does not include changes to the local coastal program? So hopefully people could scan through that summary table and um, you know find the code section or the pieces that they were interested in and then just go to those sections and know where to find them based on the code number and then just read the sections that they were really interested in. So those were available on our website. Refresher on environmental review, the objective standards and development standards, the rezoning, the public works standards, street trees implement the um, general plan and are covered by the EIR that was created for that document, certified in 2012, and then also um, so, so under CEQA guidelines, no further environmental review is required for that existing project. And then we also have these other miscellaneous zoning ordinance updates, and those are largely exempt from CEQA under um, the common sense exemption. So to bring this to a close, our next steps this, tonight would be the first reading, again, of these two ordinances, one for the sections of the code that are not part of the LCP, the local coastal program, and one for um, sections of our municipal code that are part of the LCP, just a procedural distinction for folks following along at home. Um, and so these ordinances would take effect in most of the city 30 days after the second reading, which will happen at the next available meeting. And then um, they, there are the one ordinance that includes LCP ordinance amendments takes effect inside the coastal zone upon certification by the Coastal Commission. So at our second reading, we will be bringing back a resolution for your council to direct staff to submit this packet to the Coastal Commission for review. And then um, we would get to work in the planning department on implementing these um, standards. And we would begin implementation in January. So our next, you know, next available re meeting for a second read would be December 13th. Um, and then we would 30 days after that be in the middle of January and we would these would start applying to new development projects outside the coastal zone. Um, and so we're already working on creating those implementation tools and figuring out and training, starting to train up our staff about how to use these um, and getting ready for that next step. So then we also know that we're going to need to come back and amend the Ocean Street area plan, to, and which, which will include needing to re, rezone 15 other properties that we couldn't um, or we aren't rezoning tonight um, because the height limits that are included in the Ocean Street area plan um, don't comply with the general plan. And so there needs to be some reconciliation done with those two documents as well. Um, we also have a cleanup to some text in the general plan that we um, had wanted to keep with this packet and it just sort of um, slipped through the cracks. So we know we need, still need to do that to remove some language that's no longer enforceable under the state law. Um, and so we'll be back with that sometime next year as well. And then, um, you know, this is the first time that we're using these design standards or that we've written design standards to be used in this manner. And so we're aware that we are probably going to find some kinks as we start applying these. And so we're already planning on somewhere between a year and two years from now, we're going to be coming back with um, some tweaks and updates and edits as we, you know, see how these really hit the ground on real live projects and, and notice that, you know, maybe some things aren't working the way that we had hoped and they need to be adjusted a little bit. So, um, we're anticipating that that was going to be sort of a, a normal part of, you know, implementing these standards. So then our staff recommendation, I'm not going to read this to you. It's printed in your packet. Um, but so this is our recommendation that you take action on this tonight um, on all the components that are included, that you select a policy option for the, for, um, requiring public hearings, we continue to recommend the streamlined option that incentivizes conformance 
with these design standards. Um, and then we're also looking for your direction about the options to consider for the um, 111 to 119 Leonard Street as part of the Ocean Street area plan. Um, and then, of course, you have resolutions to adopt relative to street trees and heritage trees. So with that, um, you have a lot of staff here available to answer any questions. We missed our mark of 20 minutes, but um, we're ready to talk about anything you want to talk about. Thank you, Sarah. I appreciate. And thank you, Travis, also for your presentation on the trees and the in-lieu fees. Um, I know that uh, today I received many emails um, regarding the five-story height. Can you talk a little bit about how that was um, came to be? There were a lot of requests for three stories versus five stories. And um, I know you mentioned currently there is no height limit. So um, implementing this recommendation of five stories, can you speak to how that came to be? Sure. So um, as Lee mentioned um, in his intro, um, you know, one of the pieces of this project, part of the analysis that we did was called a test fit analysis. And um, we brought the results of that test fit to the city council in March of 2021. And then we reiterated that again in November of last year. And um, essentially what the test fit analysis does is it takes this like the it tests the physical space of a site. So we have all of these standards. We have parking standards and setback standards and height standards. We have a floor area ratio set by the general plan. We have a density limit set in the general plan and the zoning code. Um, and like, so do all of these things fit together and how do they work? And what those test sets found is that in our residential zone districts, they do. All of those things work together just fine. And in these areas where we have mixed use, um, especially in these the MXHD, the mixed use high density and the mixed use visitor commercial that have that 2.75 floor area ratio, 2.75 FAR, um, the current zoning standards just simply don't accommodate that. And what happens when the existing zoning doesn't accommodate, what happens when those existing standards don't accommodate the development capacity is essentially that developers get to decide how to build their buildings. So. What the state law says is that any standards that don't, um, that can't accommodate that top end of the of the general plan, they just don't apply. And so, um, setting these height limits is really important because that is what creates the basis for being able to apply all of our other design standards. So, without that height limit, we can't apply. We, I mean, we could be in a situation where a developer could decide okay, like 2.75 FAR, I can do that in three stories with no parking and no setbacks and no open space. You could do that because that would fit on the site. It would be two, three stories with like a partially, um, you know, empty portion on the third floor. So it's not just height that we lose, right? When, when um, developers get to decide how they want to build, right? They can decide they don't want to do setbacks. They don't want to do transition planes. They don't want to do parking. Um, so it's really the whole zoning code is comes into question, and we don't have a lot of recourse to make those standards apply if we don't have an envelope that can fit the full capacity of the development that we know we need to do. So our test fits helped us figure out how to set those height limits and setbacks and open space standards so that all of these things can work together with the design standards to create the kind of development that we really want to see. So I know we got some correspondence that was really like, let's keep the height low and then just let them raise the height if they want to. But it doesn't really work that way because it's not just height. They could really decide that any of the standards, they just don't want to meet them. They don't want to meet any of the design standards. They don't want to do any parking. They don't want to do any setbacks. So this is a complete package. All of these things work together to create an envelope and then stick design standards to it. And trying to pull that apart, I think, is... Um, potentially leaves us very exposed and with very little control over development. Okay, thank you. I'm going to, I know some other council members have some questions, um, so we'll continue asking questions, um, and then we will bring it out to uh, public comment um, as soon as we're done asking questions. Uh, council member 
Older and Councilmember Brown, did you have your hand up? I did not. Okay, I, I, I wasn't ask, sure if I saw. I, I want to hear from the public. Okay, Councilmember Golder. What's going in my mouth? Um. <clears throat> so thank you for the presentation, and I heard that through the objective design standards, we're going to have a quantifiable design. It does not increase density. It actually shifts development control back to lo local jurisdictions. Um, some questions that have come to me, um, you know, in correspondence this week since the packet came out are, what would happen if we didn't make our arena numbers? And why do cities like Carmel, Pacific Grove, Capitola appear to not have to build as densely as we're proposing? And I know maybe it's through your... Sure. There, you so um, I may ask my colleagues to jump in on that as well, but um, I'll go ahead and get started. So the consequence of not meeting our RENA number. So just for those who may, are not familiar with that term, the RENA is an acronym, R-H-N-A, for the Regional Housing Needs Allocation. It's the amount of housing the city is obligated to plan for in every um, eight-year housing element cycle. Every jurisdiction in the state, state has a RENA number that they are obligated to plan for. Um, so part of the reason that some jurisdictions get um, numbers that in essentially equate to greater density than others has to do with a couple of factors. Um, so it has to do with um, the concentration of economic activity and jobs. So the state has a goal of putting jobs near housing near jobs. So they assign more housing units to places with good economies and strong job markets. So um, that is not Carmel. You know, they're just, it's a different place. It has a different kind of economy. Um, Carmel still has arena that they are going to struggle to meet because just like other places, it increased in this last cycle. Um, another component of um, how the arena is decided is based on um, what type of jurisdiction you are. So essentially, like, are you a suburban jurisdiction? Are you an urban jurisdiction? And just the place where we fall on that spectrum is another component of why Santa Cruz is going to look different than Carmel. So the, the repercussions of not meeting the arena um, are, there are a couple of, there are a couple of them. So um, the one that is foremost in planners' minds is the, our exposure under SB 35, which is a law that requires ministerial review of development projects if they meet a minimum amount of excuse me, affordable housing included. And so SB 35 has three tiers that jurisdictions fall into based on how well, how close they are to meeting their arena in different categories. So jurisdictions that have fully met their arena are not subject to SB 35 and are never subject to this streamlined ministerial process for affordable housing. Jurisdictions that have met um, the market rate portion of their arena are are only subject to SB 35 for projects that include at least half of the units, 50% of the units as affordable to low income households, lower, lower, very low income households on that spectrum. If you fail to meet the market rate um, requirement, uh, the above moderate RENA requirement, uh, any any uh, development proposal that includes 10% um, deed restricted affordable housing units is qualifies for that expedited, streamlined ministerial process under SB 35. In Santa Cruz, our inclusionary standard is at 20%. So every market rate project that comes in has to include a minimum of 20% affordable housing. So that means if we fall into that 10% tier, every development is essentially eligible for SB 35 and goes through a ministerial process. So there are some, we have some concerns about that because ministerial means there's no CEQA. Um, it also means that there is no chance to use subjective standards, which we can use subjective standards to a limited degree on other projects. And um, those are important because a lot of our area, our area plans are not objective. <laughs> um, you know, they have a, a few, the Ocean Seed Area Plan is probably the best, it's the most modern, has a few objective standards. Um, but a lot of them just really don't have any, and we would like to be able to continue to use those documents to some extent, as long as it's, you know, within the boundaries of the state law, it's not 
you know, changing how much housing can be built, but it could still be used to talk about how are we going to do the streetscape in front of this building and, like, how are we, you know, you know, sometimes these area plans talk about, like, the window treatments really specifically, like, the, at the ground floor. And um, we would like to be able to continue to use those. And in SB 35 applications, they just simply don't apply. So that's one of the biggest uh, ramifications of not meeting ARENA sort of legally. Um, the last thing I'll mention is that failing to meet ARENA means we're failing to plan for housing for future generations. And I think that's a very big deal. I mean, we have rental properties out here that are getting 40 applicants. I mean, that, that's just not a healthy housing market. And that's a market rate rental, right, let alone what's happening in affordable rentals. So, um, I mean, I think all of that is really important, but it looks like Lee has something else he wants to add. Thanks, Sarah. Um, I, that's a, a great overview. And I also appreciate you grounding that in some of the realities that people looking for housing are facing today. Um, I wanted to, to point out one thing because um, Councilmember Golder asked, um, what are the uh, implications of not meeting the arena? And you spoke to uh, the uh, category of if we, if we have a certified housing element and we're planning for that and we're not meeting the arena targets. But I also just wanna take a step back and make sure that um, the council is aware, this was actually spoken to um, by Rafa Sonnenfield um, in the public comment, which is the implications of not planning for the um, full amount of arena uh, targets that we have. And the implications of that, if we do not have a certified housing element, then there are, there's what's called builder's remedy. And um, there are jurisdictions that are finding out about the builder's remedy right now. You can look at, um, at Santa Monica, for example, and see uh, the four or 5,000 units that they got um, submitted almost immediately when they did not have uh, a certified housing element. And local control is essentially lost at that point. Cities are forced to approve housing projects, whatever submitted, when, um, we do, when we fail to get a certified housing element in time. So I wanted to add that as well as a, a, a separate component of what happens if we're not meeting Rena. <laughs> and then there's just like two more things actually that I'll add that I thought I, I remembered while Lee was talking. We also are vulnerable to lawsuits. I worked at the county when the county was sued for not having a certified housing element and failing to provide affordable housing. Um, and then we're also, we become ineligible for lots of grant funding if we're failing to meet our arena or if we have, don't have a certified housing element. So there's lots of things. <laughs> Go ahead and ask your another question. So, some so from what I'm hearing tonight is the sooner we adopt, the sooner we'll get more control. I know there was a couple projects that came forward this last year, maybe last year, eight three one water and the project on Pennsylvania that people were really upset about. So, is that true? The sooner we adopt, the more control we will have ultimately. Yes, that's true. Okay. And then another. We're getting, yeah, we're getting applications now, and we can't apply these standards. Okay. They're locking in the standards that we have today, which are. You know, there are no design standards really today. So to that end, the one where Taco Bell was downtown, how many stories is that, or how would have that been modified if, if this was in place? Well, so that one downtown, so these, these standards apply everywhere except in the downtown. So the downtown already has its own design standards that are part of the downtown plan, so that project wouldn't have been, won't be affected, wouldn't have been affected by this. And then um, just another question, is there a maximum height? Uh, with the density bonus, or would it be five stories, and then you could apply the density bonus for increased height after that? So we can't apply maximums to density bonus. The way that density bonus works is that they have to bring in a conforming base project, and then they run the calculation of either a 35% bonus or a 50% bonus, depending on you know what they qualify for. Um, on the number of units that had they have been able to fit into their conforming project, and then they get to fit them on the site in the manner that um, they choose to. So they can do that by eliminating parking, by um, reducing parking, they can reduce setbacks, they can increase height. Those are waivers. So um, developers are entitled to an unlimited number of waivers to physically fit the number of units on the property that they um, are entitled to under the law. So. It's not a direct line. I know people have asked this question before. So we, 
there's a project down one of the projects downtown on um, on front street it has a 35 percent density bonus it went up one story so that was on it was a, it went from a seven story to an eight story building that was a 16 percent increase in height there's another density bonus bonus project downtown at 130 center that went from being a three-story project to being a six-story project so that's essentially a 100 percent increase in height so it's not necessarily like a direct line between like 35 percent increase you know is always this a number it really depends on the site geometry um and and the type of project that they're doing and so like how the you know how the building just fits together um i will say typically in in the past we've seen like most density bonus projects add one floor um that was true when we you know the density bonus maxed out at 35 percent um and we're still kind of figuring out what might be typical with a 15 percent a 50 percent density bonus we just haven't seen a bunch of those projects yet we've we've only seen a handful um and then just finally would there be opportunities to make changes to this in the future or is this set in stone no yeah all of our the the municipal code is a living document we come back at least once a year to adjust and tweak and make edits thank you that is do council members have any other questions at this time I just want to say I do have uh, quite a few questions, but I'd like to hear from the public who often wait until like nine o'clock at night to even begin to speak. Um, so, um, and I may have additional questions because I, as a council member, do want to hear from the community and take that into account before we make our decision. Council member Cummings. Thank you, council member Brown. I think council member Brown <clears throat> brings up a good point because I have a number of questions I want to ask, but if, we go about asking all of our questions. We will be sitting here for a pretty long time, and many people may need to go put children to bed or might not be able to stay up very late. So I'd be happy if we move to public comment, and then you know, we can continue with questions afterwards. Great. So at this time, then, I will bring it out to public comment. This is agenda item number 40, objective standards. There are seven recommended uh, parts to the motion um, that we will be considering. If you are joining us here in person and would like to comment on this item, please line up to the right of the dais. If you are joining us virtually, please raise your hand by dialing star nine on your phone or choosing the raise hand feature on the webinar controls of your computer. And um, I will begin with the first person joining us virtually, and that is Rafa Sonnenfeld. Go ahead and press star six and unmute yourself. Thank you very much. Uh, first, I just wanted to uh, thank Sarah for, for the really um, well put together presentation. I, I hope that it was clear for the public um, exactly what we're doing tonight and that we're not increasing the density or height limits or anything that is not already available to developers currently today under the law. Um, I think that's a, a really important point. And, and I also wanted to emphasize the, the part that she um, made about, or the point that she made about um, how uh, if we want to incentivize smaller buildings with less density, and uh, lower height limits, we have to provide some sort of incentive for them to uh, want to do that. And, and I think the, the uh, option one, um, the, uh, the streamlined process is really the best way to do that. Um, and that's because currently we have a 20% uh, affordability requirement, um, which automatically triggers density bonuses. So any developer today can uh, use a density bonus if they want. They can add more height, they can uh, change the setbacks, they can do all of that anyway. Um, and and really the only like reason that they might not take advantage of that is if they think that uh, the, uh, the streamlined process is going to be beneficial to them. So, so I think realistically probably very few projects are actually going to, to uh, 
to not use the the density bonus options that are available to them. Um, they're gonna they're gonna have more units. More units are more profitable, um, and and they're gonna uh, you know waive more 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 regulations to make it uh, uh, easier and uh, and more valuable for them to build. So I I think most of the projects that we're gonna see are gonna have a public hearing anyway. Um, if and so realistically we're not much is really going to change. Um, we're just going to have actually more control over our projects as a city. And, um, and, and I think we should have some incentive for, for people to, or for the, these developers to, um, have lower, lower heights and, and, uh, less dense projects. And that's the, the streamlined process that we're proposing. So that's why I think we should go with option one. And once again, thanks so much for the presentation. I, I hope it, uh, is clarifying to, to the other members of the community who are concerned about uh, development in, in our town. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. I'm going to alternate and I'm going to um, bring up the next person here in person. Welcome. Good evening. My name is Kate Achilles and I live on Leonard Street and I'm a resident of the Central Park neighborhood. I'm here on behalf of my family and also 100 plus neighborhood residents on Dakota, May, and Leonard who share similar concerns. Since 2007, residents of our neighborhood have been actively engaged with the city's planning department to develop an Ocean Street area plan that enabled development but also protected the integrity of our small, tight-knit neighborhood adjacent to the main corridors of Ocean and Water Streets. Therefore, when studying the maps associated with the objective standard proposal, we were shocked to learn that several parcels at the gateway to our community along Leonard Street had their land use designation changed from residential to mixed use visitor high density, which would allow for development that could have catastrophic impacts on our neighborhood and would be in conflict with the city's stated goal of neighborhood compatibility. Upon learning of this change, our neighborhood again engaged with the planning department and city council to discuss the potential negative impacts that these prior changes and the general plan could have had on our unique pocket neighborhood. From these discussions, we got an overwhelming impression that these prior changes, whether implied intentionally or as an oversight, do not make sense and should be remedied as soon as possible to minimize risk to our community. To that end, Central Park neighbors request that City Council make a motion to one, reject rezoning at 111 to 119 Leonard Street, and two, immediately proceed with an off-cycle general plan amendment to change the land use designation to low, medium density residential on those parcels to match the rest of the Central Park neighborhood and make any concurrent revisions necessary to comply with state law that do not impact our or other residential neighborhoods. We sincerely thank the planning department, especially Sarah and Matt, um, our mayor and all the members of city council who have taken time to come and visit our neighborhood, listen to our concerns and propose solutions that protect the Central Park neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. I will go to our next public uh, comment is virtual and that is Henry. Go ahead and press star six to unmute. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak. My name is Henry Hooker, and I believe that the council should pass the proposed standards as they come before you this evening. Um, the count, the uh, staff has done a great job of describing all of the reasons why it's good legislation. I agree. It's really just an opportunity to create the housing where we want it and what we want it to look like. I also agree with staff that the review process should be as outlined option one, which is the only option that provides a really strong incentive to follow the letter of the objective standards. I wanted to just say a couple of words on the inclusionary rate, which isn't necessarily included in this, but it seems to come up for discussion every time that we're talking about housing. And I believe that the effort to increase the inclusionary rate for new multifamily units is misguided. There's good reason to believe that an increase will backfire and discourage the production of new entry-level housing. It's tempting to think of inclusionary units as free, affordable housing subsidized by the developers. In fact, the affordable units are subsidized by the purchasers of the market rate units. 
Raising the inclusionary rate can make the market rate units unaffordable to the middle income people who earn too much to qualify for affordable housing and are in effect asked to pay a surcharge for their apartment. It's notable and also unfair that no such surcharge exists for the builder or purchaser of single family homes. If we truly want affordable homes and lots of them, which I do, we need to be serious about finding or creating subsidies for them. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next member of the public uh, here in person. Hi, welcome. Hi, my name is Emma. I live in Central Park neighborhood. I am eight years old and I am friends with all the kids in my neighborhood. Some of the kids are really young and some are older than me, but we like to play together. They are my best friends and we play almost every day. We love to play outside and play at Central Park. We love to ride our bikes, scooters, skateboards, and rollerblades around our block. There are not many cars in our neighborhood, so we can play in the street. We are worried that if you build a tall building that it will be loud and there will be too many cars. And we might not be able to ride our bikes around the block anymore. Of the, some of the kids in our neighborhood w would have to leave if you built the building where they live now. I also think that our barn owls might get scared and leave. I see and hear them almost every night when we walk around the block and they sometimes like to sit in the big tree where the building could go. Our neighborhood owls are named Dakota May and Leonard because those are the names of the streets in our neighborhood. We love the kids in the neighborhood. Wait, all of the kids in our neighborhood have signed the kids' petition to save Central Park neighborhood. Thank you for helping us save our neighborhood. I hope you like the thank you cards that I made for you. Thank you for your public comment. Our next uh, member of the public has a phone number ending in 5690. Go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. Hello. I want you to know that there's nothing wrong with the objective standards proposed tonight, but there is one area that does not need to be included in the objective standards, and that's the base height. The objective standards do not consider the density bonus. Why leave out the density bonus? It makes no sense. This is important. The density bonus will allow more affordable housing to be built in our town. This is critical. This is what we need so badly. The base does not need to change. It get the same results due to the density bonus. What a developer wants more height the staff and the council can ask for more from the developer, more affordable units, more common fit, more better design, better traffic mitigation, traffic lights, the things we need that will help existing residents because without considering what the existing residents need as far as all these things going on right around all of us, we need to think about this. And how are we going to get any of those things? You have to have an area to negotiate with. This is critical. The general plan can still be reconciled. The same height that are requested in the survey is yeah, um, And, you know, once it's zone, you know that there's a state law. You cannot down zone. So don't say one year we can review this. It doesn't work like that. So it's better to have the density bonus bring up the height than it's a win. We get more affordable units. That's critical. If we have too much market rate housing in this town, the AMI will go up. There's research to prove this. It also hurts the lowest income residents. And those are the ones that are very difficult to get the affordable units built for. We cannot make it worse on them. We can fully meet the needs of the subjective standards. And yes, we do want to speak up. We don't just want things to go to the zoning administrator if it meets all of the objective standards. So developers need to hear from the people who live here. It's still up to them if they want to change anything. We know that, but it's still important. If we don't know, how can they even accomplish 
accommodate anything. It's, it's very democratic. That's what we want. And the developer, they're not going to disregard as much as you think they're going to disregard. They're getting a lot out of these subjective standards. And they know that what's going on currently in Santa Cruz, they will be fine. And if they, have to, if they want that extra floor, yes, it will happen. You do not need to raise the bay of height. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. Our next public comment here in person. Hi, welcome. Good evening. My name is Kevin Steerhoff. I also live on Leonard Street and I'm a resident of Central Park neighborhood. Kate and Emma nicely outlined an overview of our concerns and has proposed a potential solution. We have heard the planning department's recommendation to allow rezoning because it affords some level of additional protections than what currently exists. However, we've been advised that a motion similar to what we've proposed is a better path forward for our community. We don't feel confident that if allowed to proceed as presently planned, the issue will be revisited in the future, and even if it was, it may be more difficult to remedy these zoning changes, more difficult to remedy if these zoning changes are implemented now. To us, the benefits don't outweigh the risks, which is why we wish to proceed immediately with an off-cycle general plan amendment to change the land use designation to low medium density residential on those parcels to match the rest of Central Park neighborhood. We understand that planning is just implementing the general plan that was established in 2012. But as we highlighted in our presentation during your visits to our neighborhood, the changes were subtle and obscure enough that even our most involved and diligent neighbors were not aware of the land use designation on these parcels had been changed because if they had, we would have tried to address this sooner. I want to reiterate that our neighborhood is not opposed to development that is adjacent to our neighborhood, but we do oppose potential development that could literally replace existing affordable housing and displace our neighbors, many of whom have called this neighborhood home for over 30 years. Within the entire city of Santa Cruz, these are the only residential parcels with existing housing that are being rezoned to a mixed use land designation and a designation that specifically encourages visitor commercial uses like hotels and motels. We've done significant research on the general plan, Ocean Street area plan, environmental impact reports, and much more, and it remains unclear when or why these changes were implemented. When we reached out to former Mayor Don Lane, he agreed that it was never the intent of these land use designation changes to have this sort of an effect on residential neighborhood and was likely an oversight. To paraphrase the incoming Mayor Fred Keeley when he visited our neighborhood last month, the role of government is to solve problems, not create them. This problem seems fixable and we should do so. Finally, I wanna reiterate our sincere appreciation to the members of city council and to the planning department who have taken the time to hear our concerns and work with us on a solution. Thank you again. Thank you for your comment. Our next uh, comment is virtual and it's, I am watching you. Uh, yes, hello. Um, as a serious standalone question, I ask you to consider sometime whether constantly prioritizing an oversized housing allocation for below average income poorer people will be an effective strategy to create a more prosperous Santa Cruz. Otherwise, I'll repeat myself as I personally see little change in this proposed ordinance regarding trees. I wonder as a matter of fairness, considering these fines and fees, if you've ever considered that some properties have a lot of trees, others perhaps none. It seems that those with a lot of trees would be more negatively affected by these fees and fines, uh, et cetera, than those with no trees. And given these new costs, maybe they'll never want any now. Nowhere does that fairness, as in who's doing their part to provide trees, really matter as far as tree removal fees go, but perhaps it should. As before, I object to the mixing of dual use of street tree code applying to both new developments and also applying these changes to existing trees, generally and in particular to their perpetual replacement fees that would never be applied that way to building codes as it presents ex post facto deficiencies. I additionally regard existing street trees and parkway strips bought, planted, maintained, and liability assumed by adjacent property owners to be their property subject to the appropriate permit regulation issued at the time of planting. I regard street trees for sure, previously planted to be the private property of those who paid, planted, and cared for them to do as they wish. The city has not earned any ownership stake in them. 
the adoption of large in lieu fee, uh, fees to fund perpetual tree replacement, including existing trees, is a kind of ex post facto law banned by the Constitution. The idea an unelected bureaucrat had sole authority to issue tree removal permits or not, or require perpetual replacement fees or not at whim, and without a detailed list of valid removal reasons requiring automatic no in lieu fee for permit issuance, including if a tree is dying or dead, for instance, Los Gatos has 17 such reasons, uh, can be quite arbitrary. Parkway tree permits are no different than the permits that could be issued to allow street parking of a private property car. Cars always remain the property of their owners. Perpetual in lieu fee tree replacement liability falling one to the grave and beyond is not going to promote tree plantings, quite the opposite. You should be down on your knees thanking people for planting trees and assuming care for them. Instead, it's all threats, it's all stick. I found the agenda packet staff a response to these kinds of specific tree code concerns dismissive, unresponsive, and void of any real address of my concerns, and overall also such in general. Uh, on a different issue, I'd add there's a 40-foot tree in the Beth Bethany Curve Bark Park near Delaware that's been dead for years. Why don't you just deposit that 1700 when you finally get around to cutting it down before it falls down? This ordinance should apply to the city also, shouldn't it? Thanks. Thank you for your comment. Um, I will now invite our next member of the public here in person. Hello, Elise Cosby here. I just want to say that I'm, I'm a very interested member of the community. I have gone to meetings that were noticed for the downtown area when I lived right at basically almost at, but very close to the intersection of Laurel Street and Pacific. It was really bizarre because the meeting, and this was about a parcel that was going to be developed on Front Street, where India Joe's is right there, right across from the metro station, I believe, in there. The notice went out months and months before the actual date of the meeting. I believe it went out in April, and the meeting was in July. Um, so first of all, I'm extremely interested, so I got the notice, and I held on to it in a prominent place for months and months. And then the meeting took place uh, the, like the day before 4th of July weekend. And so this meeting was noticed to keep people away. But if you were like me and you were really, really interested and you went to the meeting anyway, what you found out was that Owen Lawler and many city staff and the architects, and certain people who are very interested in making sure that this development was ramrodded through were present. A handful of activists, myself included, a friend of mine, Lisa Johnson from the West Side, and others who are really interested in what's happening in the city in terms of development, environmental concerns, housing issues, such as housing for many different classes in the city. We were about 10 of us, and it was all stacked. When I spoke up vocally about the lack of community participation that was clearly left out, the cl it was clearly not intended that the community really show up for that meeting, and I could talk more about who was there. People who lived in the area also came to that meeting, people who live on Pacific Avenue, for example. When I spoke out vocally about my objections to that design and tried to find out more about the design, like access to the levee and to the river, I was actually treated with such hostility that I, when I went to go to the bathroom in the back of the room later, I was hip-checked by one of the friends of the developer. That's where you go like this. It's a lacrosse term. I was physically assaulted by people who were pissed off that I actually showed up to the meeting to speak. So I just want to say that I think that an education process should be offered to people in the city who are regular folks and not developers or architects or um, city planners. And we want to know how you do this process, how it happens from the very beginning to the end. We want to know, I want to know what a lot of these terms mean without having to become a total expert in what they mean. I'm very disheartened about the de design processes that are happening, and I think you're excluding the community. Thank you for your comment. Our next uh, member of the public is joining us virtually, uh, Laura. Thank you again. I have a question about the bonus part. 
can we can you decide to keep it at like 25 or 20 percent bonus that way to limit the height that seems to be one of the uh, big, biggest problems of developers just trying to stack more height and it seems from just listening to this um, that the developers are in the driver's seat. They get to do anything they want. They, the, the bonus could be 35%. They can change the setback. So I'd like some more clarity of how the community can have more control over the heights and the w ways around keeping <laughs> development at ch in check. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next member of the public is here in person. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Mayor and uh, council members. Uh, Gary Patton, I'm speaking here for Save Santa Cruz. You've received numerous letters from us. And the last person who spoke in person and the last person who spoke online uh, really is why Save Santa Cruz exists. And that is, we have felt, and I think correctly, that the city has not been paying attention to what the residents of this community want and has not been involving the residents of this community in these very difficult planning decisions in a way that lets them participate effectively and that helps them understand what's going on. And we're here to ask you tonight, in connection with this item, that you change that pattern and that you do something different. If you will remember when the council, and some of you I think probably weren't on the council at this time, but when the council started the objective standards a process, you said, the council said, adopted a motion that said, the highest priority as you conformed zoning to general plan designations was to protect and preserve the residential areas of the city and to protect existing city businesses. When Sarah Noisy gave her very comprehensive report, both last time and this time, you never once heard about what was the priority for residential areas and how to protect them. You didn't hear about how these, might, these objective standards might change uh, things for businesses uh, in existing businesses in the city. Uh, Save Santa Cruz hopes that you're going to take action on that Leonard Street issue the way the neighbors uh, want you to, because in fact that is protecting an existing residential neighborhood, and if you notice, your staff wasn't interested in that. We would like the public to be included. The staff is recommending you cut back on public hearings. We don't think you should cut back on public hearings. We think you do need to do a little sequel review, maybe not a full EIR, but you need to see what has changed in 12 years uh, or 10 since the general plan and the general plan EIR uh, was adopted. Uh, we are asking you to break up consideration of this item instead of having seven items at one meeting. Take a bite size piece at several meetings and let the public really get into it the way the last speaker here uh, talked about. We want you not to rezone, uh, change the zoning to meet the general plan. Uh, our letter that we've submitted points out why that is an extremely bad idea if you care about the priority of protecting residential neighborhoods, and we hope you do. Our next public comment is via virtual, hand raised, Kyle Kelly. Go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. Hey, it's again. Yep, this is Kyle Kelly. Give me just a moment here. Pull up my notes. Uh, cool. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm speaking today in support of the objective standards. Uh, I support option one streamlining uh, for development review process and public hearing since it incentivizes projects to fully conform to the standards. Um, I think this is really important as we're leading into the six cycle arena 
um, because we we want to be able to have a compliant housing element done submitted on time before the builder's remedy. And, and I'll say two two main points of why. And it's kind of like these things are stacking in a sense. Um, if we get the pro housing designation, we get our housing element done on time. We show sufficient capacity. We get access to transit and inner city rail grants, right? We all we all voted no on D. We want to see the rail go in. I want to see us get those grant dollars. If we lose out on it because we decide that we want to have longer community process, that we think that you know we can tweak the numbers for how much money we're going to charge people for building a thing we need, housing, um, like all of those things are going to stack up. And the reality of, of what's going to happen is we're going to submit a housing element to HCD. And if this process becomes more convoluted, then I and many other people will report back to HCD and say, hey, they decided to make it more difficult. So all of these parcels aren't feasible enough. They're actually going to have to zone for even more because they chose not to just meet a bare minimum. Like what, what's on the agenda today is effectively to like facilitate development of, of more multifamily and mixed use housing, which is already allowed in the city um, and like create standards to help build the housing we need, ensure great urban design and, and, you know, align the zoning code with the general plan. Like we're going to be behind if we don't move forward and figure out the way in which we can streamline that housing. And, and I'll just point out again, like I think I said back in August, like this is for streamlining multifamily housing. We currently streamline the most expensive, most luxurious housing type, the single family home. And we don't put any IZ requirements on it. People can just build a new single family home all they want. And if you look back at our dashboard, that's most of what our market rate housing is. It's actually single family homes. It's not like housing for the workforce. It's not fourplexes or eight plexes or whatever. Like we're only seeing like a few buildings going up right now. It's barely enough to meet our needs. So again, like my recommendation, honestly, all the options are, are kind of great. You can figure out how you want to modulate between them, but I would prefer that you, you streamline multifamily housing. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next public comment is here in person. Welcome. Good evening. Uh, I forgot to mention my name last time. I'm Candace Brown from East Morrissey and Transportation Public Works Commissioner. Um, first of all, this is a very complex set of standards, and I wanted to mention that downtown update plan was done with a very different process, which is really unfortunate it wasn't done here, because it was done with the Planning Commission subcommittee. They sat down for six months. They met at least once or twice a week. They came back to the Planning Commission often. It went through an iterative process, and it was very carefully honed. And in this case, that was not done, which is, again, very unfortunate. But the point I wanted to make is three things. One, sidewalks. Sidewalks for collector streets are defined, the collector streets are defined by the state. So if you're going to define a standard based on a state criteria that's not clear to our public works department when I made my inquiry, I think that should be investigated before determining the sidewalk widths. Also, the uh, maps are, there's a disparity between the general plan maps and getting back to all these map problems and, um, and the Caltrans maps. Number two, um, uh, advanced planning has asked for five feet additional on commercial, saying that it's really to accommodate retail and that it has no impact on density or intensification of use. But in fact, that's not true. You can have five feet increase and have five feet below, five feet above podium parking, and then you can add another story. You could have uh, retail with mezzanine and lofts and you have more intensive use. You can have an office space with storage and you can have more employees where you have more patrons. These all increase intensity of use. So it does impact um, that. So I would think that should not be added. Also, I would like clarification on the general plan itself because I'm going to read you the general plan. It says, mixed high density designation allows a maximum FAR of 1.75 as of right, including a maximum of 30 dwelling units per acre. However, a project that meets a number of specific criteria 
as determined by the Planning Commission, may have a FAR of up to 2.75, including up to 55 dwelling units per acre. I'm running out of time, but I wanted to say that it's not clear that they're entitled to, to 2.75 in the general plan. You can have three stories at 1.75. It shows with the test fit. You can even have 2.75 with four stories, but they're asking for five stories because of economic purposes and it's not needed. And it's really important to consider the height because that does increase the intensity of use and has all kinds of ripple effects with traffic, parking, you know, the quality of life. I actually sit and look in a three-story building across a landscape and I'm not looking at the neighbors. Rough. But if it's five stories, you can look across the whole neighborhood. So it does really impact the nature of what we're doing. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next comment is virtual. Uh, Zenon Ulyate Crow. Go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. Hi, uh, my name is Zenon Ulyate Crow. I'm president of the Student Housing Coalition. I just wanted to call today in support of uh, these standards. Uh, I just want to emphasize on a lot of the comments that we're hearing here tonight that there's a lot of community concern about density. And speaking as a student who knows many people, actually 9% of our students at UCSC and countless numbers of students that are not able to afford the massive houses that are essentially the only mandated form of housing within the city of Santa Cruz, this fear-mongering against more neighbors, more people is simply a fear-mongering against people who otherwise would be excluded from these rich housing types. And so I really want to emphasize here tonight in a broader picture, both in support of these objective standards because they help facilitate the construction of more housing that can help provide for students, help provide for families, help provide for workers. Um, I really want to implore in general to the general public and also to the council members to keep in mind that when we talk about density fear-mongering, when we talk about the idea that, oh, there's too many people next to us, it really is gatekeeping at its finest. Speaking as someone who will probably not ever be able to afford a home in the city of Santa Cruz, just because I happen to move here maybe 20 years before some other people, it's a, frankly pulling up the ladder. It's making it so my generation and the generations that are coming after me are having to have the undue burden when it comes to the cost of housing. And so when you take this vote today, I really want you to think not just about the people that are in the room now, but the people that aren't there, the people that aren't born yet, the people in my generation who are dealing with midterms right now. I mean, I'm literally typing an essay in the background right now. Um, so I really implore you guys to please vote yes on the comments and uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for your comment. Is there anybody in person that would like to comment on agenda item 40? I'll continue on with our virtual attendees. Our next hand raised is Ryan Meckle. Hey, good evening, Council. Uh, I'm calling in support of the objective standards tonight, specifically in support of option one, uh, streamlining for multifamily housing. Uh, as previous callers have mentioned, uh, the only form or you know, the most expensive form of housing in the city is streamlined already, that's single family homes. We should be incentivizing multifamily homes, which are better for the environment, cheaper for families, uh, and just overall better for the community if we don't wanna see us sprawling out into our forests and open spaces. Um, the objective standards will give us more local control over what we see built here, as Sarah very well explained. Um, it was kind of funny to see the coin flipped a little bit, uh, and I would not be normally be the one arguing for local control. Um, but if we want to, you know, see the housing that's built in Santa Cruz look like Santa Cruz, we should be voting yes on these objective standards. Um, I was fortunate enough to be part of one of the focus groups when these were first being put together. Uh, and I thought that the consultants and staff did a really, really, really good job of taking feedback from all kinds of different people um, on all different points of uh, what now make up the objective standards. Uh, they have resulted in something that ensures really great urban design for our city. Um, and all they really are doing, they're just aligning our zoning code with the general plan. I think it's a no brainer to vote yes on these objective standards. And I hope you'll support option one when you do vote yes. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. 
Uh, I don't see any other hands raised virtually. I don't see any other members of the public in person uh, waiting to speak for public comment. Um, so at this time, that does conclude public comment. I will bring it back to council for action and deliberation. I know that there were some more questions to be asked, so um, I will, um, I see council member Myers with your hand up. Council member Myers, you're muted. Yeah, um, Mayor, I would, um, I would, yeah, I would like to hear questions. I had a couple of questions myself, but I'm happy to have other council members go first. I know some, I think uh, Justin mentioned he had a number of questions. So um, I guess one thing that I would like to clarify, I heard one of the speakers say, um, and I just want to make sure this is right. There was a statement that our inclusionary requirement automatically triggers density bonus. So I was wondering if the uh, staff could speak to that. And I have one other question. And then, um, Mayor, if you would entertain it, um, I do have a motion just for the Leonard Street um, group uh, or Leonard Street issue, I should say. Um, I'm wondering if we might be able to separate that out as a separate motion from the seven motions that the staff recommended. Okay. Um, that would be amenable to you. And I'm be happy That's to do that once to questions, me. possibly put that motion on the floor um, after questions have been uh, asked. But I'm just curious about that statement. I think it's very confusing for some of the public, this relationship between inclusionary numbers and the density bonuses and kind of how those two things interact. Um, Sarah, I don't know if you can help with that. <laughs> sure, I can, I can try. Thank you. So um, for those who may not be familiar, the density bonus is a state law that applies throughout California that allows developers to develop bonus density, so bonus market rate units in exchange for providing some amount of affordable housing. So um, the state law applies to every jurisdiction in the state, and not every jurisdiction in the state has an inclusionary standard, right? Santa Cruz does. The purpose of the density bonus was to encourage the development of like deed restricted, permanently affordable, or you know, at least for a long term, 55 year affordable housing throughout the state. So the way that that interacts with inclusionary standards in cities that have them um, changes things. So Santa Cruz currently has a 20% inclusionary requirement. So that means every development that comes in has to provide, every development with more than four units has to provide 20% um, of those units at a price that is affordable to folks that make no more than 80% of the area median income. And then that's um, uh, categorized based on household size. So larger units cost more, hold a larger family. Um, so when we have an inclusionary standard that's already at 20%, um, the state law and some case law that, that has come in to sort of clarify the intention of the state law, it says that that inclusionary standard um, counts towards the density bonus. So the density bonus says that at 20% of your units in your base project that are affordable to um, lower income households, you are entitled to a 35% density bonus. So essentially every project that comes in in Santa Cruz can request that. Not every, not every project does, so I, I think I wouldn't use the word trigger, but they are entitled to request that. And then um, we go through a process to evaluate their base project and ensure that it fully conforms. And then we consider the waivers that they're requesting. So waivers are um, can be used to, uh, to remove site standards that preclude development. So any site standards that wouldn't allow the full number of bonus units to be built um, the city's obligated to waive. So most typically that is height and parking, but it could also be setbacks, open space, other other standards that sort of physically preclude, preclude the amount of development. And then they are entitled also to a limited number of concessions, which are um, financially based. So design standards that might be too expensive to meet or a project like that that's providing affordable housing, they can request um, 
two uh, up to three concessions for most projects and four for I, I think for projects that are doing a hundred percent affordable so um, considering the density bonus is definitely part of you know what we're trying to accomplish here creating all these design standards means that we have more design standards that will apply to density bonus projects because they're only allowed to get concessions for four of them and I understand people are most concerned about those waivers right because those are the big ones height parking, setbacks, open space. Um, that is state law. That is not something that the city controls. We had for a while a local density bonus, but it has essentially been completely superseded by the state. Um, the incentives that the state program provides are much greater. And so that's, those are the types of applications that, we, um, that we're getting um, are using that state density bonus program. Did I answer your question? I think so. Yeah, I mean, I, it's it's complicated, but I think that's pretty clarifying. I, I just wanted to, I, I didn't remember, it was kind of the, the term automatically, and I didn't, didn't quite completely think that that was the case. So it sounds like you verified that for me. Um, that was one, my main question, um, uh, Mayor, um, and again, entirely up to you, but if you would be amenable, I'm happy to do, um, to put a motion on the floor regarding the Leonard Street issue when it's appropriate after folks' um, questions. Thank you, Council Member Myers. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Brown and then Council Member Cummings. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I, um, so I, I have a few questions that I, I guess there's some of them are follow-up to some of the discussion from the earlier round of Q&A. Um, so I'll try to be as clear as I can about it um, here. Okay, so the first question I have is that, you know, I'm, I'm hearing staff uh, frame, uh, you know, some of the community input that has been received as not, um, the, the concern is that um, our, our standards aren't understandable, the package is is too complex and it's not understandable. Um, and then kind of explain why it must necessarily be <laughs> complex and comprehensive, uh, which you know I don't disagree with. Uh, but but what I'm I guess what I'm mostly hearing from people is not so much that the I mean some people who are really following this closely obviously have that concern. But what I'm mostly hearing from people is that the package does not help the community understand what the real impacts, like on the ground impacts could be for across a variety of neighborhoods and locations. And um, so understanding that seems to, I mean, that, that's, a, that's, that's a challenge. And, um, and I hear you saying uh, you wanna be, uh, have transparency. And so I'm, I guess I'm wondering, what are we doing to address that concern? Because what I worry about is that we are gonna end up with neighbors, like the Central Park neighbors, um, who are, are just surprised by this and um, not really, because it's it's just too much to, you know, and to be able to, as I think um, Mr. Patton said, um, to be able to engage effectively and productively as community members is what people want, I'm hearing people want, and that's what I want as a public official. I am working in the public interest. I want the community to be able to understand this um, and have a sense of what the impacts are going to be. So what are we doing to address that concern? Uh, the neighbor, the, the required meetings that the developers put on don't really do it. I've been to them. Um, they don't really do it. The meetings that the city has, uh, um, you know, uh, and focus groups, maybe the focus groups, I haven't been in those. So, you know, maybe those are a space where this becomes more clear. But I, I don't really get that feeling of clarity <laughs> when I attend the meetings. So, and I'm hearing from others that they're not. So what are we doing to address that concern so that we, um, we don't terrify the community every time uh, we, you know, some big change. I mean, these are major changes. And, um, you know, I, I think we have a responsibility to address that, to respond to that. So what are we doing? What, what, what do you, yeah. Sure, yeah, so I hear you, so I hear you. Um, So there's, there's a couple of things that I'll say relative to this project. And I, I will say, I'm not going to talk about how we handle, you know, new developments when they come in. Like that's, 
that's really not on the table right now. Um, that's, you know, that's not really what we're discussing. Um, but it, so in terms of this process, um, we have been working on this for two years. And um, I hear that, you know, a lot of people are just hearing about this now. I, I, I understand that that, that kind of happens, unfortunately, with these long processes that take a long time. Um, we know that this is a lot to, to kind of take in. And so that's why we've, we've done things specifically like a year ago in November when we had the draft of these standards and the draft of the zone districts, we had a community meeting where we walked people through it and showed them how we were going to be taking feedback. And then they, of course, could you know email us. There were lots of people who just wanted to email their comments rather than going through the structured process, which was fine, too. Um, and then we set up office hours so that as people were reading the document, they could check in and come to us and say, like, I don't understand. Why would you do this? What is this talking about? Like, what, what would this mean in my neighborhood? Um, so we wanted to make sure we presented those opportunities for folks to, to come and get that clarification if they were seeking it. Um, to, so I think your larger point of, like, you know, how do we kind of keep people from freaking out about what can be built adjacent to them? Um, I mean, I think this is a challenge that every jurisdiction, every municipality in the nation faces, is that what is currently allowed under a zoning code or a general plan anywhere, Iowa, California, Sacramento, here in Santa Cruz, is going to be different in most cases than what is currently on that site. And so I think there is just some amount of that that is just always going to be, we're always going to be encountering people who have never heard of zoning before until they're involved with um, a development project that happens right next to their home. We do feel that creating zoning standards that fully represent that capacity is one of the best ways to create that transparency because then um, if people ever do look at a map, they can look at, you know, this is what's, a, this is what could happen in those locations. So um, this is going to be an ongoing issue. Like whenever we go out as the planning department, we are explaining what we do. We're explaining land use 101 and private property rights and what we can control and what the state law is. And I think that's just part of the process. So, um, you know, we're doing that through our housing element update right now as well, sort of like bringing in a whole new group of people and educating them about, you know, what is a housing element? Why do we have to grow? Why do we have to plan for this many housing units? Why do we have to plan for those housing units at certain density levels in order to qualify with the requirements for um, creating zoning for, multi for um, affordable housing? So, um, I mean, I think that's just something that we are going to continue to work on. Um, so, yeah. Follow. If I, I just have, I have two more questions, and a little. It's kind of a follow up to, to this this past question. So, I, I hear you about the standards themselves and. Um, you know, and, and try the education process. Not everybody is going to spend time doing that, um, but they are worried that they're not going to have any sunlight in their on their home or in their yards. Or I mean, they're worried about a lot of things. And I, I you know, I don't think that it's fear mongering. I'm just going to say I'm. It, it offends me to hear that um, from members of the public that anybody who's concerned about the impact on their their neighborhood um, is fear mongering. That's just that's just an aside. I'm gonna, I'll stop. Um, but the 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 challenge is that the the standards themselves don't really make clear, um, and the and the zoning doesn't the rezoning doesn't really make clear actually what the impacts could be. And I heard and this um, and so I, I want to follow up on that because I I want to had a follow up question uh, to the response to Councilmember Golder's question about. Um, you know, how much height is, would really be allowed? Um, you know, so, and I had the question with a five-story height limit, how many stories will developers actually be able to build? So it was a similar kind of question. Um, and I, as I understand the response to that question, it was, we really, we must allow whatever the developer needs to meet their density desires up to 2.75 bar. And um, uh, oh. that that can mean... One story, it might mean, or, or really, so let's put aside the far, because I know that gets complicated. But that really, whatever it is they want, 
Um, and that could mean one story, it could mean three stories. That doesn't really make it transparent for community members <laughs> when they're thinking, well, um, we got a five-story height, you know, we're, we're about to adopt a five-story height limit. Um, and that could mean eight stories, that could mean 10 stories, that, you know, so <laughs> um, that, that to me doesn't seem uh, like it's really helping the community understand. So, how, so again, how do, we, how do we deal with that? Um, and maybe there isn't anything more to respond to. I'm just gonna ask it again as a rhetorical question sure. here. Um, and then I'm gonna ask you know, a, a question that you know, may sound a little bit glib, but if, if developers can build to whatever height is needed to accommodate their desires, then why are we even bothering with any height limits? Why are we even doing this? Sure, yeah, so I do have a response to that. Um, so I think, so, so we're mixing things again. So um, the 2.75 FAR, that's a conforming development. That's standard. That's without density bonus. Okay. So the response I was giving earlier was in the context of a density bonus, which, as I said, as part of that response, is a state law. And that is not something that we have the ability to change. Um, and yes, it's true. We cannot always predict exactly how tall a density bonus project will be, nor how big the setbacks will be, nor how much parking it has, or how much open space it provides. Those are not things we can effectively regulate under the state law. So the regulations that we are creating today are what will apply to um, conforming projects, so projects that meet every one of our standards. And I hear you, and I hear that the public is very concerned about density bonus projects, and it makes it seem like developers are winning everything, and it's really intractable, and we, no one knows what to expect out of any development site. And so there are two, there are, there are two policy choices that the city is making or can make that impact how often density bonus is proposed. The first is our inclusionary standard which we have set at 20%, which means, as I said earlier, every project is entitled to request a density bonus. They are automatically qualified for the 35% bonus if they request it, or they can just use that density bonus process to request waivers to site standards and not take the density bonus units. We get applications like that as well. So that's a policy choice that the city is making, and we're not recommending any change to that. The second piece is how do you process these different applications? So the, the two major incentives, as folks have correctly identified for developers, are money and time. So the density bonus increases profits for developers. It takes those required affordable units and it spreads those costs over more market rate units so that those costs are easier to bear for housing developers. The second thing that developers are looking for is a, is a predictable and fast approval process. So that is a big part of the reason that staff and the Planning Commission are recommending option one to streamline approvals for conforming projects because that's really the only tool that we have to incentivize conformance with all of these standards. So I understand that folks are concerned, have concerns about that, and again, that's a policy choice, and those are the ramifications that we as staff see as a result of those policy choices. So, height limits only work if you get a conforming project. That's right. Yes, exactly. Right. That's true everywhere in the right. city. That's true everywhere in California. Right. Okay. And so, another question I have, which is um, related because it's, it's about height. Um, so, your background slide um, on rezoning, I, I think I have it here, so you don't maybe need to pull it up, but I'll just see. Let's see. Um, the, so the slide says that for buildings above three stories, a transition is required for the, to the adjacent neighborhood. Um, does that apply everywhere for all neighborhoods? Because, and I ask this question primarily because I've been talking a lot with the Central Park neighbors, and it does not appear to me that they would have the benefit of that kind of transition were those, uh, those parcels to be developed as mixed, or, um, Visitor serve, I can't remember the acronym, but the visitor mm -hmm. serving mixed use. Sure. So, um, so, so the way that that. How, do, yeah. How does that work? Yeah. Okay. I'm happy to get into that. So, um, so 
so the way that that standard is written right now, it applies at property lines. So when property lines abut residential zoning, so it applies to mixed use and commercial development that's doing mixed use development. When there is um, a residential property line that abuts, then they have to put in that transition claim. And um, at this point in time, that standard does not apply across the street. So in the case of you know those those three parcels on Leonard, that's correct. They would not transition across the street toward the um, toward the other um, so surrounding th residential. So that's the kind of thing that would actually make this more transparent for the public to explain that um, clearly. Because when we put it out there as well, don't worry, we're going to have transitions. You know it. It, it doesn't feel to me like that is the case all over. And here's one caveat, right? The across the street caveat. So it it seems to me that we could maybe try a little harder <laughs> to again explain, you know, do the analysis and explain that in a way that people understand. Um, trend, you know, well, yeah. So um, that that's uh, it would just be so that that's one area across the street. So. What are the other circumstances under which this transition that people might anticipate would be helpful would not apply? So it applies when mixed use or commercial development is next to a residential development. So it wouldn't apply to two residential parcels next to each other. We have other standards that already kind of regulate those projects. So um, it doesn't apply between commercial properties. Um, You know, so I, it, it really only applies if your house is like literally on the other side of the whatever. If, your house, if, you're, if a residential property shares a property line, so behind eight three one water, it would apply in that situation. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, with respect to the uh, those parcels, I'm I'm going to ask this question. I know I've asked you this question in uh, our meetings, which I very much appreciate you taking the time to have those meetings. Uh, with the council members, but I want to just ask it again um, so that members of the public can hear this and I can also refresh my memory and try to make sure I understand it. Um, the, the, the land use designation for those three parcels is not housing, and, but there is okay. housing on those properties now, on those parcels. Yeah, the, the land use designation is, is mixed use visit, right? So housing doesn't have to be built there. But what I'm hearing the staff say to us is that we, well, we can't make any change there because we're not allowed to reduce housing, uh, you know, housing possibilities yeah. under the general plan. Um, and, but it, but the issue is that it's not, it's not gonna be housing that gets built there. Um, it, should this zoning go into effect and, you know, under the general plan now, apparently. So just again, how does that, why sure. can we not um, change the general plan for this small pocket neighborhood? Um, and why would we, what, what would we have to move elsewhere? because housing doesn't have to even be produced or built on that on those sites. So to say, right. I guess I'm just trying, maybe I'm not being clear, but to say, no, well, we can't it. do, okay, great, thanks. Yeah, sure, I'm happy to speak to that. So, um, so yeah, you bring up a good point, right, about these um, mixed-use zone districts. The whole point is that they are mixed, right? So there could be residential projects that include ground floor commercial, <coughs> but these are also in our existing commercial cores so they could be commercial developments that come in that don't include any residential development. Um, and so the zoning also reflects that. That's part of the general plan land use designation. And that's been also reflected in the um, zoning. So, um, and these sites have a potential for housing because housing is an allowed use, right? That's just, that's, true right so the um what the state law says is that anywhere where housing is an allowed use if you're going to reduce intensity on those parcels or change them in some manner that reduces the potential for housing so for example 
you could make a general plan land use change in this location that just removes the hypothetically removes the commercial component and leaves the residential in place and then we don't have to do any transferring of anything right like you'll want to think about the council want to think about you know the change of like removing some commercial capacity from the city but that wouldn't trigger the state law requirement so the state law requirement applies because housing is allowed so anywhere that housing is allowed if we're changing that or reducing the intensity um we have to find a place to put that capacity so that that potential isn't lost there's no requirement that any site in the housing in the city be developed at all right like it can be zoned for high density housing and just not be developed there's no requirement for that but if we choose to rezone that site to just be a parking lot instead of being a parking lot that's currently zoned for high density housing we would have to relocate that amount of density and so i understand this is um this can be sort of opaque to the layperson because this is about maps that that project a you know envisioned future and not about what currently exists on on the ground um but that's the nature of laws right they exist in on paper and we are obligated to follow them on paper and so this is what we're doing and the ideal like outcome of that would be that you know ultimately we do get this housing capacity that we've planned for that we do build the housing units that we know that we need so um we can make a change to the general plan your council can direct us to do that that is something we're allowed to do and we will have to find a, a receiving site for that potential residential development um you know somewhere else so that's and, that's where it starts to get a little complicated and this is my last question I, and if i recall that was um the said somewhere between like 45 and 60 potential units something like sure. that in our okay. conversation okay so not a whole lot yeah no that sounds about right got it thanks thank you council member cummings thank you mayor thank you staff for the presentation and for everybody for sticking around so late um i think it, I think the questions I had around height have been answered, so I'm not going to um, really ask about that. I did have a couple questions around the street trees, so if park staff is here, maybe they could answer um, some of these questions because this has come up numerous times in conversations I've had uh, the years that I've been on council, and it seems like if we're moving in a direction to change this ordinance, that you know we may need to bring some items back uh, for future consideration. Um, but I'm wondering if you can explain a little bit more about the requirement of private property owners to be responsible for damage caused by street trees to private or public property. Um, I saw this in, in some of the language that was outlined and was just curious if there could be any comment on that because um, it seems um, a bit of overreach to say we're going to require you as a private property, we're going to require street trees to be put on on properties or new developments but then the private property owner is responsible if anything if any damage occurs to the private property and and also there's a lot of mention about private property owners being responsible for the maintenance of those trees and so I'm just wondering if you could speak to that um, because I think that's a current concern and will become more of a concern with, with the direction we're going in I'd invite uh, both our a lot of people coming on here but um start with our urban forester leslie keady has experience on both the street tree and the public work side of this and then follow up comments as needed from um, city attorney tony and um our public works uh engineer nathan okay so leslie keady urban forester so um since the mid 80s there has been title 13 which is the street tree ordinance and I'm not sure of the date, but similarly would be Title 1520, which is a public works sidewalk ordinance. So, and Tony, of course, is a city attorney, can maybe clarify since I'm not a lawyer, but I'm the forester. So um, under those two titles, the adjoining property owner has been required to maintain all the street trees and all of the sidewalks, which is consistent with state law, which this community has adopted and we have implemented.
So I guess I could elaborate on that a little bit from the legal perspective. The state law is <clears throat> in the California Streets and Highways Code, and it makes adjacent property owners responsible for maintenance of sidewalks um, adjacent to their properties. It has since, I think, the 1940s. The recognition of the fact that um, cities, um, it would be a huge fiscal impact to cities if it were required to maintain sidewalks adjacent to individual properties. And the mechanism under state law allows the city to put a property on notice that their sidewalk is defective and then um, can direct that it be repaired. And if it doesn't, then the city can conduct the repairs and recover the cost of the uh, repairs as a lien on property. Uh, back in about 2004, in um, response to uh, changing uh, case law, the city council adopted an ordinance that also uh, makes adjacent property owners legally liable for failure to maintain streets and or sidewalks, including street trees, um, should they should they fail to meet their statutory obligation under the Streets and Highways Code. Um, and, and it specifically makes the adjacent property owner liable for injuries to person or property that results from the failure to maintain sidewalks and street trees. That has resulted in a substantial um, reduction in claims from li for liability from the um, for defective sidewalks, either when a tree branch falls and it's a car or if somebody's injured from tripping and falling on a sidewalk or that sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> so I think, and, and Council Member Cummings was kind enough to reach out to me before uh, the meeting to ask a question about that. I think if there is consideration of um, removing that requirement, it should also include a fiscal impact analysis since it will likely significantly increase liability claims um, city costs for um, inspecting and maintaining street trees and also um, insurance premiums um, based on uh, experience in other cities where uh, as a result of adopting ordinance like, ordinances like this, the city's experience modification factor or the formula that's used to calculate insurance premiums has gone down significantly. So um, I know that Public Works is also available. I think um, Nathan might have a comment uh, on that as well. Thank you. Uh, um, uh, one other thing that I would like to add that is that um, you know city staff isn't out uh, targeting uh, homeowners to repair sidewalks. Um, we, we do work to uh, apply for grants to do safe routes to school projects or other infrastructure improvements and and also use this utilize these objective standards to uh, uh, put, put the uh, improvements on development projects um, uh, throughout the city. Um, I would also note that a lot of the older street trees and, and sidewalks and infrastructures didn't really take into account some of the you know newer or more modern um, designs with regards to wider sidewalks or selection of trees uh, with roots that you know would grow down or putting in group bears etc and so um, you know with collaboration with parks and rec uh, the planning department you know the the what's being presented today as far as uh, proposed street trees and designs is to try to take that stuff into account so we don't have lifted sidewalks or bike or uh, asphalt and bike lanes etc I think, and I'll, and I'll just say, you know, part of the reason why I bring this up is because there are street trees that have been planted. When I was living in the Beach Flats, um, the building that I was living in down there had been owned since like the 70s, and the city went in and put street trees in in the late 80s, early 90s, and now those trees are buckling the sidewalks. And so the owner is like, well, the city is the one who came and put these trees in. Why am I now responsible when those trees that the city installed are now, you know, destroying the sidewalk? Because he had no decision over that, he had no control over that decision. So I just think that moving forward, um, you know, the city should take some responsibility in that. And so I have some some potential direction to see how we can address that, or at least have that conversation. But I don't want that to tie up everything tonight. It's just something that has come up as a concern, and um, I'm hoping that we can figure out a way to come together as a community and address that. Um, I guess the other. Um, question I had around street trees 
was just you know the fact that um, when plants are put into confined spaces, they can become root bound. That can have an impact on the health of the plant, and in this case, street trees could potentially be impacted um, by being put in these new boxes. And so, I'm just wondering if you could speak to that a little bit as to um, you know what trees are being proposed and um, you know, would people expect them to become root bound and therefore having impacts on their health that could, you know, come at a cost to private property owners who uh, have those trees on their sites or adjacent to their homes and properties? So, I think a couple of comments and and then by Leslie as well. Um, one is one of our uh, actions directed under the uh, street tree master plan is to work with public works to update our street tree planting details. So that's something that we um, are seeking to do as Nathan mentioned, so that we can avoid some of these problems, both for the infrastructure and for the trees in the future. Um, and additionally, Leslie and I are working this year on updating our approved street tree list and a consideration of species that historically have caused that sort of damage is something that we'll be considering as we uh, create that list. And Leslie, is there more you'd like to add? Uh, well, can you just uh, mention two of the points that I was going to make? Um, there is a product that we're looking into that other municipalities have looked at called structured soils, and that creates more root space underground and more porous space they're um, somewhat experimental. They're a little bit costly. We'd like to do some pilot projects in front of city buildings before we suggest that private development uses these uh, technologies. But um, there are some strategies that uh, work with that. And then also uh, to speak to your previous uh, comment, um, of course, we do have the Heritage Tree Grant Program, and that also helps cost share on sidewalk repair. Now, of course, with budget constraints, that's um, some a program that you know is constantly being questioned. But at this time, if you're saving your street tree, that's a heritage tree or a street tree, we would pay and reimburse 50% of the sidewalk repair costs. And then we also, I, I work when I give out free trees to people, I work very closely with them to. Um, select appropriate trees for the side of the or the size of the tree well that is there. Um, unlike some of the trees that were maybe done in the 80s and 90s, um, we know more about trees and tree species at this point. Um, but I'm also happy to talk to you directly, um, give you more information rather than talking about trees all evening. Okay, thanks. Um, those are all those are all thank you. And those are all the questions I have about street trees. Um, so I guess the, um, the other question I had was a little bit around um, kind of transparency and process. One of the, the concerns I've heard, not only on this issue, but even some issues that some of the uh, items that came before us was that, um, you know, much of this has gone to, for example, with this item in particular, has gone to our planning commissions, our planning commission, many of the items that are around traffic, what have you, um, that go to our commissions and come to council and one of the things that's been coming up is that council has not been receiving the recommendations that have been made by the commissions, and therefore we don't have an opportunity to take those recommendations into account. And in the case of the item that's before us, this has gone to the planning commission twice, and the planning commission has made some recommendations. I understand that some of those recommendations have been made, uh, staff disagree with, but I think it is important that we have those recommendations so that we can take those into consideration and the public can know what the planning commission is recommending. And so I'm just curious as to why those recommendations weren't included and if, and, you know, for city manager, if something, or if there's a plan for how we can address um, commission recommendations, you know, and, and having those come to council when we have um, the presentation of, of these kinds of items. And so that's a, that's a dual question for planning staff and the city manager, because I think this is a serious issue that needs to be addressed. Yeah, I appreciate the, uh, the question, Councilman Member Cummings, and I will uh, give Sarah and um, Lee Butler an opportunity to weigh in as well. I do know that typically when the planning commission or any of our commissions for that matter uh, make a recommendation that ultimately is not supported by staff, that's clearly indicated in the staff report, including referencing uh, the original recommendation that was made 
by the commission and why staff may be making um, an a alternative recommendation uh, under the circumstances. I also know some of the concerns that have been raised by the public uh, throughout this conversation also had to do not necessarily with recommendations, but motions that were made um, at the commission level, but ultimately uh, not supported by a majority of the commission. So I think we're, we're talking about two things, but I, I hear you in terms of wanting to ensure that uh, recommendations made by commissions are brought forward in a, in a transparent way. And uh, I would welcome um, Sarah and Lee to weigh in on that as well, if they have anything to add. Yeah, sure, I'm happy to talk about this. I know that this came up um, <clears throat> at the hearing um, on August 23rd. So the staff report that we brought on August 23rd actually included about two pages of text about the recommendations that had been made by Planning Commission and explained in kind of incredible detail <laughs> Um, why staff was not interested or not recommending the same thing the Planning Commission recommended, but their recommendation was included. It was discussed at length in the staff report and the, both the staff reports that went to the Planning Commission and the minutes from those meetings are attached to that item that came on the 23rd that had sort of the comprehensive background. The same is true of the um, Transportation Public Works Commission and the Parks and Rec Commission, we have included minutes or in cases where minutes weren't available, the meeting summary, you know, sort of draft minutes of those hearings because we do want your council to have access to all of those recommendations and really understand where staff is diverging from your commissions. That's really important. Thank you. And I guess I'd just add then that, you know, because this item was continued, it might be good in the future to have um, you know, the minutes or those, the previous agenda attached, because I think it was mentioned in the staff report that the um, agenda was attached, but then when I looked through the entire packet, it wasn't there. And so it would be good for us to see those minutes and, you know, what was discussed at the Planning Commission meeting, we can reference, you know, to staff's comments as to why they disagree. Um, but I think it's just really important because we don't necessarily always remember exactly what was in the previous packet. And if sure. we hear about it at this meeting, then we don't have time to look back to it and the community doesn't know as well. So it's just a, you know, um, piece of constructive criticism to, you know, really help provide that transparency and make it seem like the staff isn't hiding anything from the public. Sure, yeah, happy to do that. We, um, as we understand it, the um, process for attaching prior council items is to simply provide a link. That's the direction we were given by the city clerk. So that's what we did for this. Um, for this item, but in the future, we can be sure that we're always attaching those um, staff reports and minutes to you know every time it comes back. Thanks. Happy to do that. That's, I think all my other questions are answered. I know it's it's getting late, and we're probably going to have a little bit of time of back and forth. So I'll leave my comments there. I do have, um, yeah, I'll just leave my comments there. Okay. My questions there. Are there any other questions or discussion at this time? Um, Council Member Myers. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, yeah, I'd be happy to uh, put forward a motion. I believe I, I did send it to Bonnie. If you're amenable to maybe tackling the Leonard Street um, with just a specific motion and we can pick up the remaining motions um, to work through those. Um, <laughs> So I would uh, make a motion uh, that we remove 111, 113, 115, and 119 Leonard Street from the zoning map amendments. So that is uh, not the staff recommendation, but that is first part of the motion. Secondly, to direct staff to initiate a planning process through the Ocean Street Area Plan, Housing Element Update, and Downtown Expansion Plan to study 111, 113, 115, and 119 Leonard Street parcels with the goal of reducing the residential density and eliminating commercial use for those three parcels and accommodate the lost residential density in another area as required by state law. And then third, direct staff to return to the January 24th City Council, 24th, 2023 City Council meeting. Bonnie, maybe you can add 2023 there. Um, City Council meeting with project schedule for the planning process for the planning outcomes. Within one year of initiation, report out on the project schedule and return to City Council for potential direction to pursue the option of a general plan amendment if the three-part planning process described in two 
has begun to experience an extended timeline unforeseen by staff. So just a little bit of background for my um, colleagues. Um, I spoke a couple, many times with staff about the general plan amendment um, as an option to address this. I do believe very strongly that this needs to be fixed um, and met with these neighbors several times. Um, we also talked a lot about the complexity of what the city is faced with with regards to a lot of the new state laws. Um, but I do believe between the period of time that the general plan uh, map was and the general plan was adopted, um, and then the fact that the zoning and zoning code was never really not, uh, um, you know, immediately brought into conformance with the new maps that this issue sort of really was just remained on the books. And now with the new housing accountability act, um, piece of this, um, it's, we're really tied up, um, in terms of using a, a general plan amendment to pursue this. But I also want to make sure that something happens here, that this doesn't get lost in the mix again. And many years later, these folks are still worried about um, this use on their property. So I, I'm trying to combine um, the, the ability to address this issue because I do think it really is a mistake. I'm convinced of that. Um, with also the recognition that things, get, things can get complicated anytime we're talking about planning in, in Santa Cruz. So I'm trying to also um, provide a way to make sure that there is some some way to continue to per pursue this should these this other combined efforts between with the Ocean Street plan, the housing element update, and the downtown expansion plan, if those three part planning kind of process um, gets bogged down in legal or what other types of uh, delays that. Um, we, uh, again, look back at this general plan amendment as a possible remedy to, uh, to the issue. So that is my motion. And um, Okay, we have a motion by Council second. Member Myers and a second by Council Member Brown. Okay. And this is the um, motion to replace uh, number five essentially in in the staff recommendation yes okay um, I had a quick question for staff on this motion can you um, hi Sarah can you speak to um, the process of amending the general plan for these items when that work, um, like let me let me think about how I want to word this. Um, so there is a direction here in the motion to return to uh, council on January twenty fourth. Um, with a project schedule for the planning process for the planning outcomes. What does that look like to you, to the staff for you? Is that realistic? So, um, I want to set, set some successful outcomes here. So yeah, I just, sure, sure. So, so I think in terms of, um, reporting back with sort of a, you know, a plan of attack. Um, I, this seems like a deadline that we can meet. Um, you know, I think, and then on that date, we'll have a discussion about like how long it's going to take to execute the, the general plan amendment. Cause I think that's where we're going to, you know, there might be some rub. Thank you. That answers my question. Um, and then Bonnie Bush, can you add the year 2023 after the January 24th date? Just so we make sure that's in there. Thank you. Vice Mayor Watkins. Yeah, I, I just want to um, really echo what Council Member Myers stated and really thank the neighbors and the planning staff for all their time to help us really understand this unique situation. And that's what it, it feels like to me, really unique. And so I appreciate the motion on the floor. I also wanted to see if maybe we can make a friendly amendment to have um, maybe specific language around 
um, including those parcels being designated as low uh, density or low residential density? Or is that? I'm amenable to that. I, can we, yeah, I'm amenable to that if that's possible. I think that is the intent um, with regards to that particular outcome there. Okay. Mm -hmm. I just want to make sure. I Okay. Great. I just want to clarify in um, number two of this motion, it says with the goal of reducing the residential density, is um, that where you want it? To I just be didn't clarified, know if we wanted to have that, that thing too specified, yeah, to make it more specific of that, to have it be designated to be low. Designated as low density yeah. residential. So it would be with the goal of designating, of the parcels being designated as low density residential. Yes. Mm -hmm. Correct. So rather just. For those three parcels. Okay. Just for clarity. Sure. Essentially using a number two instead of having the term reducing, it would be just to have it the goal of designating the parcels to be low density or low residential density. If that works for the maker of the motion. That works for me. And is the seconder okay with that? Absolutely. Can I confirm with staff that that language um, may, is correct in this context? Uh, oh, Lee Butler, I see your hand up. Thank you for the opportunity to comment, Mayor Bruner. Um, I would just say that, um, and um, Bonnie, if I could share my screen really quickly, I could, um, I can show the general plan map. Thank you. So I just wanted to point out here that um, the surrounding area here, this neighborhood, you can see if we click on any of these, the general plan designation is actually low medium residential. Um, and so if you were looking for consistency, consistency. Yes, that's the what remainder. I'm for. Consistency with the Central Park neighborhood zoning. Right. Right. So then low medium residential. That would feel more reflective than yeah. to make it more consistent with that. Thank you, Lee. Sure. And that, if that works for the maker of the motion. It does. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. And the seconder. Okay, Council Member Golder. My only question is I know two of those parcels, I think, have an apartment complex on them. Is that going to change? I mean, what are they? They're in this. Well, that would be okay with that. Well, medium. Okay. Council Member Kalantari Johnson. But just a quick comment that um, I'm really supportive of this direction as well and wanted to thank and appreciate the um, members of Central Park neighborhood for taking time to meet, I think, with probably all of us on multiple occasions and uh, for staff to go out and meet and just it was a complicated and unique situation. And I also am in agreement that I think it truly was a mistake. Um, in terms of the, I'm supportive of the motion, um, but I don't know if we need to do anything about item four on the staff recommendation or we can get to that when we get to that because we'll, we'll have to exclude those parcels, but maybe we just cross that bridge when we get to that item. We don't need to do anything now. So item four is the um, ordinance introduced for publication and ordinance making the proposed amendments to the zoning map as stated in the ordinance and as shown in the associated map exhibit and parcels, parcels list for parcels outside the coastal zone. And so I think those parcels are part of that we'll need to map. But we uh, Lee Butler, maybe you can comment on that. Sure, thanks, Bonnie. Um, can you pull that motion back up again, please? I, I was thinking that the first um, <laughs> item within it. the motion covered that, but yeah, that's, that's, what, that's what I was yeah, trying you. to do with that. It, it does. Uh, Lee, do you mean the motion that was just made or the staff recommendation motion? The, the motion that was just made by Councilmember Myers. <laughs> Thank you. Um, scroll can, down can you bit. scroll up to the, uh, the first one? Uh, or is that it? The friendly amendment uh, here. Remove okay, 111113. Oops, sorry, the first one. 
Yeah, stay at the top. It looks like number it's one. There you go. go. Thank you. Remove one 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 three from the zoning map amendments. Yeah, I, I see that as inclusive of the um, ordinance that you're referencing, Councilmember McCallum Sorry, Johnson. Great. Thank you. Welcome. Okay. Are there any further questions on the motion on the floor? Can I just get confirmation that item one will then replace item five of the staff recommendation? Is that what you said? Okay. All of it will, yeah. Yeah. Is there a question? Not to create any more confusion, but uh, just to be clear here. So um, I think if I'm looking at the original staff recommendations and the proposal, item two would address item five, the original staff recommendation uh, five. And then um, item one would replace. Item one just pull, item one just just eliminates, but I think that other motion needs to stay intact because there are, it does need to stay intact. This just, I, I chose to just remove this, remove these Leonard Street parcels, but the rest of that, um, is it number four motion would, should stay intact. So again, I was trying to pull the Leonard Street out as a separate set of motions, and then I think the other ones still need action. Okay. I didn't. I wasn't planning to work through those, but if but I can if if another member uh, isn't. But I would the prefer another member. Number four of, would have to be amended to just say as amended. As amended. Okay. 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 To yeah. reflect so, that item one. Because it's sort of like the yeah. Correct. So staff recommendation number four would have to be amended to reflect council, Meyer, council member Meyer's recommendation or motion uh, number one. That's, that's, that's right, correct. introduced for publication yes. and ordinance making proposed amendments to the zoning map, et cetera, as amended. As amended. <laughs> yep. Correct. Uh, staff recommended. Yeah, five goes away. Yep. Okay. Was that clear to everyone? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, okay. So, any other questions on that motion? We'll move forward then with a vote. May we have a roll call vote, please? Councilmember Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Boulder? Aye. Cumming? Aye. Brown? Aye. Myers? Aye. Vice Mayor Watkins? Aye. And Mayor Brunner? Aye. That motion passes unanimously. And now we will continue with um, the rest of the staff recommended <coughs> motions. One, two, three, four, six, and seven. Is there anybody who would like to make a motion on those items? I'll do it. I'll go ahead. I got it. I just want to make sure I have it correct. Okay, so I'll go ahead and move the remainder of the items. I was just wanting to say that I'm supportive of the of, of the hybrid proposal. Um, now my papers are in regards to the processes, so let me make sure. Um, so I will move the recommendation to reflect the agenda packet as presented in item number one. Um, in item number two. And, and then I will modify item, the recommendation in item number two or Point number two, to not include streamline, but to include the hybrid option, because they have option one, which is streamlined, and I'm proposing the hybrid. For big pro bigger projects. For bigger projects, correct. And then item number, th number three. Number four, 
as amended from the prior motion. Mm -hmm. Removal of, of number five given prior direction. Okay. And proceed with six and seven. I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion by Vice Mayor Watkins, seconded by Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Are there any um, further questions, discussion, Council Member Cummings? I had a few comments, and I actually was writing, I was scribbling away, and <laughs> probably should have made this motion before, but um, I had incorporated some comments that I'd heard and you know I know that for many people myself included this has been a very confusing process uh, it's a lot for anyone to take in and provide feedback on and so going into this process I thought we were really focusing on you know the object objective design standards for new developments um, but it, it turned into a lot more than that including um, zoning affordability heights you know things that I think many people weren't really expecting so I hope that in the future um, when these kinds of items come to us we can have more of a better description of what exactly we're going to be taking on when we're making these kinds of changes um, one thing that was mentioned tonight that has me a little concerned and I think it's something that needs to be uh, like highlighted is that with regard to this you know process what was one of the things that came out in this discussion that was made clear is that the developers are the ones who are looking for a fast approval process, not the community. And I think it's really clear that, you know, if we want to have more community transparency, um, we really need to make sure that that option is available for people, which is why I'm supportive of option number two. Um, to clarify, also, there's a lot of discussion about regional housing needs assessments, the RENA numbers, and this really doesn't have to deal with RENA. Um, it really is to deal with the fact that state law has changed. It's taken away us, our ability to set objective and subjective standards on new developments. And so now what the state law says is that we have to create objective standards for new developments, which is around you know building articulation, roofs, things like that. Um, and so it really doesn't impact the regional housing needs assessment and our ability to meet those goals. <clears throat> um, I had similar concerns to the Leonard Street neighbors, and we took care of that unanimously, so I'm very grateful for that support of that community. Um, and then, you know, what was pointed out by the Save Santa Cruz group is that the council provided a previous direction that was voted upon to preserve and protect residential neighborhood areas and existing city businesses as the city's highest priority level and encourage appropriate new residential and mixed use development, specifically including enhanced affordable housing opportunities at appropriate locations along the city's main transit corridor. And what was in our packet that was never discussed was addressing the affordable housing issues. Um, there's a lot of things that were brought up in some of the policies, but that is something that we really need to make sure that we have included as part of our objective standards. So, and some of these recommendations were made by the Planning Commission previously. Um, I'm in support of them. I know that the staff had disagreements but I've proposed a motion, um, and I'm, I'm just gonna propose that as a substitute because there's way too much in there for it to be friendly amendments, so I'm just gonna propose as a sub, yeah, as a substitute motion. I'm, um, I think it's doubtful that I'll get um, support to approve it, but I just wanna make it on behalf of the many people who've been fighting for affordable housing um, and the statements that have been made on our behalf about supporting affordable housing, and so, um, I want to propose a number of uh, changes to language since this is our first opportunity to make those changes as part of this um, first reading of this ordinance. So, Bonnie, if you want to put the language up. <laughs> okay. Okay. So... Um, so I also want to add to this um, that we include, so within the motion we also include a direction that was previously provided by council, but move that the staff recommend, the staff recommendation be amended to add the following language as highlighted below to the ordinances. 
1.1345, establishing low and moderate income occupancy. Add where appropriate and change, to the numbering, change the numbering to include. The applicant shall arrange for the appropriate government agency to verify the rent that was charged the last time the unit was occupied. And affordability of those units uh, will be determined based on whichever tenant income or rent is lowest. Um, this has to deal with replacement unit housing. To number three, in the event that a tenant's income is not verified or the last rent charged cannot be verified, the assumption shall be that the unit is occupied by a low and moderate income unit household. Add language to be vacant unit. Number two, the applicant shall arrange to have the public housing authority verify the income of said tenant and arrange to have the appropriate government agency to verify the rent that was charged the last time the unit was occupied for the purposes of establishing low and moderate income housing units. Number three, in the event that the most recent tenant cannot be located or identified and or the last rent charge cannot be determined, the assumption shall be made that the unit was occupied by a low and, and moderate income household. 24.08.1350, relocation assistance. Add language to say that relocations, relocation assistance shall be defined as two months rent at an equivalent market rate and the equivalent market rate security deposit. 1A, the basic requirement is that 100% of all low or moderate income bedrooms demolished or converted shall be replaced either on site or elsewhere in the city of Santa Cruz or a combination of both. 1E, the basic 100% bedroom replacement requirement could utilize Section 8 housing vouchers to cover the market rate cost for providing the subsidized units and make projects feasible. Section 24.16.020.8, basic on-site inclusionary housing requirement. <coughs> Add the following language to the last sentence under number nine. Projects with a 30% density bonus shall have a 25% inclusionary requirement. Projects with a 50% density bonus shall have a 30% inclusionary requirement. And then number two, um, so that's, that's all the uh, language changes and it's largely to address the fact that um, the many council members, our incoming mayor has stated that, for example, in the new um, South of Laurel plan, that we would want a full density of those buildings to have 20% inclusionary affordable housing. The way we can get there is by attempting to increase the, um, the inclusionary requirement in projects that get density bonuses. What this also addresses is the fact that the way that the city determines whether or not a room that's gonna be demolished is based on the income of the person who lived within that room, not what that person's being charged. So for example, I live in an affordable unit, I'm not on section eight. If that unit gets demolished, it is not gonna be replaced by an affordable unit. The changes in this language would address that because we're gonna start seeing a lot of older buildings where people are being uh, charged affordable rents uh, but they don't fall into one of those um, like income, the, the affordable housing programs, we're gonna see a loss of a lot of those units and if our job and our goal is to, um, to maintain affordable housing, these changes can help address that. And so the objective here is to really get at us trying to maximize the amount of affordable housing that's gonna get built and require that if older buildings where people are being charged low rents are being taken offline, that they, we're replacing those units in our community. So that's the first part. The second is addressing the street tree issue. So move that the staff bring back an item to amend section 15.20.210 and 15.20.220 and 13.30.060 to require the city to be responsible for, uh, or sorry, it should be for the to consider the city to be responsible for damage to private property caused by city street trees. Uh, number three, uh, we'll skip because we just took action on that one, so that will be removed. Um, number four, move to amend the staff recommendation to not change the zoning designations along the major transportation corridors, except to conform to the specific density and floor area ratio designations in the general plan, and then, uh, Number five would be under the staff recommendation number two, selecting option number two for conforming hearings. That's it. 
I'm going to second that, um, and if I could ask a question. Um, so, well, first, thank you for diving in on the relocation piece, because we know that all of this new building is going to cause displacement. Um, we already see that. Um, we've seen projects come through and say, oh, of course, we're going to make sure that the, the existing tenant has, uh, you know, affordable housing once you approve our plans, and then guess what? <laughs> They just renege on that, um, and you know I'll, there are other many other examples that we can think of, or at least I can, um, spanning over 30 years now. So thank you for that. Uh, I do have a question though on the the street tree, the way that your um, your um, the la the language around the, the street trees, because I I do have a concern about the potential liability, um, but I also recognize that. Um, and, and do not believe it's fair to um, place the responsibility for new street tree planting on um, property owners, private property owners, without some, they have no say over what the city does in terms of the, that street tree planting. So I would like to see some way forward. Um, I do worry about the potential liability issues, and so I'm just wondering if we could um, hear about that and... Um, but I, but I am seconding your motion, so that that's my, my question. Can I make a quick comment on that before we jump in? I think the, the whole purpose was to, um, and the reason why it says um, bring back an item to amend and to consider the city is that um, I think that it, the way it's worded is a little confusing, but the idea is that the item come back for consideration to determine whether or not we want to see the city take on some responsibility for um, street tree damage to private property, so. Um. I'm probably not the best person to comment on um, how decisions relating to the installation of street trees are made, so I'll defer that to um, city staff. Um, but the way I read the motion, it would uh, eliminate uh, a liability protection that the city has and has had for uh, almost two decades, and so therefore, would um, <clears throat> have a significant fiscal impact in terms of increased liability, um, increased um, liability premiums, and, as well as um, presumably a staff time and equipment component that would um, be required to be implemented in order to reduce that risk. I think I'll just leave it there because um, the, rea I can, the reality of what's going to happen next year, is, you know, I don't <laughs> think that working this out is going to be particularly um, critical. Uh, I mean, but that I, being said, it's a policy decision yeah. by the city council. Um, if, if that's the council's direction, then that will just be have, have to be incorporated into budgeting. Sure. I, I guess all I'm saying is I, I'm interested in exploring what the city can do to try to reduce that. Um, you know, that potential challenge for property owners, um, but trying to get into the weeds on it here on a motion that uh, I believe the book has already been written on the vote. Sorry, <laughs> I just have to say that. I'm, it just, there's no, doesn't seem to be critical. Um, but I am very much interested in finding ways to um, address the concerns. Um, I'd like to um, ask uh, if, Bonnie Bush, can you also scroll back up? There's a lot of, um, recommendations in here, and I just wanted to um, bring Lee Butler uh, staff to comment on some of these um, impacts and how how that how from staff's perspective. Thank you, Mayor Bruner. Um, a couple of things that I would point out here. Um, First, um, the, the Planning Commission did make a motion related to um, inclusionary housing requirements, and I believe it's, it's fairly similar to the um, bottom part of um, number one in, um, in Councilmember Cummings' motion, um, right there with the projects with a 30% density bonus shall have 25%. It was, it was similar to that, right? So um, I, I think that that component is the the council can act upon um, I do have concerns with the um, the statements above 
um, being changes that um, any changes to the zoning ordinance um, that weren't contemplated that are, are substantive um, you know can require um, planning commission review um, I would also say that and so so those changes may actually require planning commission review and recommendation um, but what I would say is I'm just uh, looking at this for the first time this evening but in, in quickly looking at it, I believe that state law already covers many of those items. Um, and so um, I might ask um, Matt Benoit to come up here and, um, and, and taking a look at that, Matt, because he's one of our uh, experts on the recent state laws. Um, did you see anything in that, that that isn't currently covered in state law? That's not to say that we can't um, move forward with those changes at a later time um, if they do require planning commission approval to, to make sure it's built into both our ordinance and the state law. But just um, wanted to get your read on that. I, I didn't see, thank, thank you, Lee. I didn't see anything uh, directly that's not covered in our state law currently. The Housing Crisis Act of 2019 uh, which also passed with the Housing Accountability Act, which we've been talking a lot about tonight with the, uh, you know, no no net loss and things like that. Uh, and the objective standards were part of that too. The Housing Crisis Act uh, also uh, approved a number of these requirements as far as replacement, housing and uh, relocation uh, uh, assistance. So in, in each of these, uh, we are currently required under state law to verify rent uh, if there is a replacement uh, uh, unit uh, taking place as part of a development. And uh, if that if that rent um, is is considered a, a lower income or below um, below a market rate, then that is required to be replaced as part of the new development. And uh, if that if that rent cannot be verified, there is already a process in place as well uh, using uh, the, the federal HUD data uh, to determine what that what the percentage rent would be. So for a, for a project that was say was removing 10 units uh, currently and none of the incomes could be verified there are percentages provided by the federal government as to how many of those units would have to be counted as very low income uh, and low income in, in the future project. So according to this motion, this is saying all units would have to be determined. Uh, is that the difference? No, that would still take place uh, for any, any, pro any re project that's having replacement units every single unit being replaced would, would go through that verification process. And that's an important distinction. Um, it's the replacement units. So some projects, if they're not housing projects, then this wouldn't apply. Is that correct, Matt? That's correct. If, if it's not a housing project, but if, if it is, uh, if they are demolishing housing units and building new housing units on top of them, they have to go through that state replacement process. So there may be, um, there could be distinctions in this um, that we um, could look to pick up when we update our our ordinance. But um, I, I don't think that, I don't recall, and Matt or Sarah can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think that any of this was discussed at the Planning Commission. I don't recall that being the case, in which case um, you know, we would, and I can, Ask the city attorney to weigh in here on that as well, but we would need to um, send changes like this back to the planning commission. Provided this um, was not considered by the planning commission uh, when it when it um, reviewed the item, then yes, it would have to return to the planning commission for a recommendation. Can you say that again a little louder? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. <laughs> I didn't get that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yes. Um, if the Planning Commission has not reviewed this language previously, then it would have to return to the Planning Commission for a recommendation. 
and we can't determine that right now, or have we determined that I, the planning commission? I believe the planning director has looked at that and that it was not part of the material that was reviewed by the planning commission. Um, I have not verified that myself. Yeah, these were not um, areas that were discussed with the planning commission. It looks like Catherine had something to add. Yeah, this was, we did make some changes in the um, relocation assistance and state law has changed a lot recently and it's gotten incredibly complex and rather than reiterating all the changes in state law into our ordinance, we made changes that simply referred back to the state law. And I can't off the top of my head verify that each of these um, changes that Commissioner, that Council Member Cummings has suggested are in the state law, but it's very similar to what I remember. All right, so um, Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Um, I, I just wanted to clarify, there was a part of the motion that I thought I heard Lee say um, was reviewed by the Planning Commission. Was that um, approved? by the majority or not approved? Yes, the, uh, the part right there that's that highlighted. One. Okay. Um, and I, I would lean on the team to see if that's the exact language, um, but there was a motion by the Planning Commission to recommend um, higher inclusionary percentages for uh, density bonus projects and um, staff had included a, um, a significant amount of detail in the That's August right. 23rd um, mm -hmm. report speaking to that. Staff is not recommending that we do that at this time. The, um, the issues there are, are fairly complex as they relate to um, both uh, the, um, the amount of inclusionary um, but also how that relates back to the um, density bonus and the levels of affordability that we get. Because right now at a 20% um, inclusionary at 80% AMI, developers are often choosing to go to a 50% density bonus and providing 15% of the units at very low income. When we start upping that, um, that inclusionary percentage, then we are likely going to find that we're getting fewer very low income units. Um, but that interrelation, that interrelationship needs to be studied not only from what's gonna happen with those, but also what's gonna happen with respect to the viability of those projects and whether or not we're going to actually get um, projects that are um, uh, able to be built. So that's right. I am now recalling, and I and I remember reading the specific examples that you brought up. I think San Francisco might have been an example that was in that agenda report. Um, the other question: Did I hear correctly that this is the first time that you're seeing these proposed um, changes in language, Director Lee Butler? Yes. The the uh, we're just seeing these this evening so, with the um, with the detailed changes there. So in terms of process, I find that to be a little surprising given that we've had almost three months since the August 23rd session to meet with you um, and to dive deep into um, what we've heard, what we've learned, what changes we wanna see. This is a lot to digest that's coming in now when we've had three months. Um, and if I'm understanding your comments earlier correctly that many of what's been proposed in that first part of the motion is covered by state law. I, I haven't digested all of it yet. Um, it, I think that some of it might not uh, be um, because of that um, distinction in state law of um, only housing projects having to provide the um, replacement housing. But I, I think um, you know we would need to do a deeper dive into mm -hmm. that to confirm. And as as we all know, state law is very complex, particularly when it comes to this topic. So we would need to, to look at that very closely to see um, if there are things that aren't covered by state law or if there are things um, that um, we, need, we could change to go above and beyond state law. Thank you. I see Sarah Noisy also has her hand up. 
Yeah, I just wanted to confirm. I went and pulled the minutes from the Planning Commission meeting, and this motion did pass. Um, so this was recommended by a majority of the Planning Commissioners in July of this last year. And this was the same language. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you for confirming. Um, I have Council Member Cummings and then Council Member Myers. I was just going to um, say that it's a little, so what I'm hearing from city staff is that the state law changes occurred back in 2019 um, that would account for some of the changes that were made, but there have been projects that have come before the city council where we were told that the income of the individuals who lived in the houses, if the rent was affordable and those people were not a part of any kind of affordable housing program, that those demolished units would not have to be replaced as affordable. Um, in addition to that, the direction that was provided um, as brought up by um, Save Santa Cruz um, really you know, touched on the fact that we were supposed to work to make sure that we're maximizing the amount of affordable units in this plan. And so it's, I'm a little confused why that wasn't addressed. And since we have all this ordinance language coming before us, if state law changes were made, it would have made sense that that language was updated. And so that also addresses the concerns that were brought up this evening and is why I brought those changes before us today. <clears throat> I will say that I did also meet with the city staff and we focused a lot of that time on talking about Leonard Street um, and just getting information on a lot of these different things. We actually ran out of time to address some of these issues. And as we've seen in our emails, we've been getting a lot of correspondence kind of at the very last minute. And it's our job to try to incorporate that into our decision making process. That is partly why I'm bringing this forward today um, and trying to see if we can find some way to, to take action on it. And then again, to the point that was just brought up, the 30% density bonus um, and inclusionary increases uh, that was voted on by the Planning Commission, and so that has received approval. So just want to, you know, make sure that that's clear for people who are paying attention in the community. Okay. Council Member Myers. Actually, Mayor, I'll go ahead and pass. Um, uh, I, my question kind of was answered, so I'll, I'll thank you, though. Council Member Brown. I just want to add... Um, that language has been before this body on multiple occasions as well, so it's not new. Uh, just to be clear here. Council Member Kalantari Johnson. And I think the other thing that's been brought up is that we need to really do a study on this <laughs> um, and not pull numbers out of nowhere. So I don't know where that could fit in and if that could be a part of this motion or the housing element revised, but let's let's do a study and see what is actually doable so that we can increase if we can increase affordability we do that and we do it in a thoughtful way we do it with information council member brown we always propose a study um, when we don't want to do something i find um, and um you know, and I've, been, I've done that too. So, uh, no, you know, I'm just saying that's a reality. Um, but I want to just give a, a, just a little uh, a bit of a history here, uh, recent history, which some of you may not be aware of, um, but I'd like to just say it. Um, we did a study, uh, the staff commissioned a study to look at the inclusionary housing percentage and um, with the goal of reducing the inclusionary housing percentage, which a uh, five to two council, um, a different five to two council, uh, then supported. The city was then uh, sued and in a settlement agreement uh, agreed to return to the 15%, which the study told us would not be feasible for developers. They said 15% is not feasible and got the council to reduce the inclusionary percentage to 10%. Once sued and uh, settled, the staff came back and said, we've found a way to make this work. So I have to say that 
um, my faith in those studies that are done by, on behalf of, and for developers do not necessarily give us the reality. They give us one model of what might, what things might look like. They do not take into account uh, land values, land acquisition costs, other costs. Cost. They, they do not take into account variations across different um, circumstances. And um, I believe that the best way to find out if it's going to work or not is to try it. And if it doesn't, as uh, Council Member Golder asked earlier, we can always make a change. Can I ask one more time? Council Member Cummings. And I guess I'll just say my last comment uh, again is that um, these concerns have not only come up in the past, but we did provide direction uh, for staff to um, you know, encourage appropriate new residential and mixed use development, specifically including enhanced affordable housing opportunities. This has been going on for years, as has been pointed out by the staff. It's in our agenda. It should have been um, it should have been explored during that process, and so we lost the opportunity. If the if the idea is that we should do a study, um, and to Councilmember Brown's point, you know we can take action on this, and we can see how it works. And if it doesn't work, we can always come back to it. But um, there's a lot of housing in our community that's going to be demolished in the next you know few months to years, and uh, we keep saying we want to increase the production of affordable housing. We want to maintain affordable housing, and this was one way we can do it. Um, I'd like to call on Councilmember Myers and Director Lee Butler. Uh, I just, I feel like we're sort of off. I, I think we've drifted kind of into a discussion about affordable housing, which I think um, we've spent many, many years on trying to, we, I mean, we, we spent an entire year doing assessment of housing issues in Santa Cruz under a former mayor. Then we had a housing blueprint subcommittee and there was about, I believe about, I don't know, Lee, correct me. I wanna say there was at least 90 actions that came out of the housing blueprint, which was basically optimizing all these different issues that we're discussing tonight um, I believe that, you know, at least in my time on the city council, we have been methodically working through those, including new ADU laws, all kinds of things that were in the housing blueprint. So we, we have this blueprint and, and for some reason it doesn't seem to exist in some people's mind, you know, and it, and it's, it, it is a policy document that was established by this council. It has a number of actions in it that I know are, are know our planning staff have been diligently working through it. At the same time, every year, the state of California drops a whole nother set of regulations, some of which we then try to basically sort of put into a motion that basically state law is already taking care of it. So I'm kind of confused on kind of where we're doing, but we do have a policy document. It's called the housing blueprint. And it talks about preservation of existing housing. It talks about production of housing. And, you know, with regards to the, the Kaiser Marston study that was done, I know that was that had just been completed when I was got on city council. It was very clear why the 10 percent inclusionary was used for downtown and 15 percent, I believe, or it was either 15 percent downtown and 10 percent outside of downtown. I can't remember which one it was, Lee, you would know. It was a, I, no I read the entire report. Um, and the actual lawsuit that was re referred to was actually a lawsuit on uh, an approved housing development that we basically did settle. We then, due to a settlement agreement, we raised our inclusionary, despite the fact that we had a high housing financial study that said, keep your, I think it's 10% downtown, right, Lee? It was 15% it was downtown. 10% the rest downtown. of the town. So we, we get through a lawsuit, we get to this percentage that has no backing, but I want the public to be really, I want them to be very aware of what happened with that development. That development also provided a adjacent piece of property, which is next to the Pacific Station, Metro Station downtown, 
that piece of property was then utilized and put together with other parcels downtown. And we have 100% two, two, affordable unit projects going in because of that other development. So there's no more redevelopment agencies in, South, in, in California anymore. We're not using our tax dollars to build housing like we did for the tannery and other projects that were built years ago before the 2008 recession. Jerry Brown just killed redevelopment. So what we are left with is we are left with the private sector of building other affordable housing. However, I would also point out that the city has been incredibly successful thanks to our you know, housing, both housing group in uh, economic development and housing in our planning department. And we are getting affordable units built now. We are getting affordable units, you know, up and running. We hopefully will survive Measure O and we will have another 125 units of very low income housing coming into our downtown. So to say that the studies don't provide guidance, um, they do. There's examples of how this is working. Um, I just don't, I don't agree with, maybe that's, maybe that is true in some people's world, but it's, you know, ra ratcheting up our inclusion area is not necessarily gonna result in any additional affordable housing. Um, it, it, there's, this, we don't have a study that says that. And if we are spending city dollars to either help finance projects or buy property or do anything else, we better be under, we better understand that 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 the that the actual outcome is is what we need as a community but we have leveraged a lot of resource into over a couple of hundred units of housing for people who really need housing and i don't think we should overshadow that with this discussion around how we're not getting anything done we are getting a lot done and i want to recognize our staff for that um, and we do have a policy document. It's called the housing blueprint. So let's dust it off and figure out where we are, where we're at, because I know our staff's been working through that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Lee Butler. Thanks, Mayor Bruner, for the opportunity to chime in here. I'll try to be brief. Um, a couple things that I'd want to say. I've, I've got a lot of thoughts that I could share on the inclusionary hints and so forth, but uh, suffice to say that um, when that inclusionary rate was changed, um, what we saw as the implication of that was the vast majority of projects, particularly the large projects, um, are now using density bonus, right? And the density bonus, those um, affordable units um, uh, are, the inclusionary units do not apply to the density bonus units. They just apply to the base projects pursuant to state law. And so, um, there is a, an important uh, interplay between you know, what we do with the inclusionary and what happens with the density bonus. Um, and then I just wanted to state that the council has um, provided direction back in June of this year um, to include um, and uh, said uh, staff to analyze and consider the following policies or actions for inclusion in the housing element. And one of those was um, evaluate whether alternative inclusionary approaches may produce more affordable housing or deeper levels of affordability. Options to consider include alternative inclu inclusionary percentages based on differing levels of affordability or incentivizing land dedication versus provision of units on site. Following this evaluation, consider whether changes to the inclusionary regulations should be proposed. Now that that study itself, I want to be clear, that study itself isn't necessarily a part of the housing element and likely will not be a part of the housing element. What that, what the direction is, is to um, include that as a, a policy or action. And so there may be some ability to do some study, but um, essentially that would also be saying, like, this is something we should be doing. And, and frankly, you know, we, we can look at this on an ongoing basis. You know, Councilmember Brown's comments about things changing and uh, different parts of the city having different um, implications. We, that's, that's correct. That was what we found as part of that downtown analysis versus outside of the downtown. And there are also changes that affect this significantly with respect to like the state law changing with, uh, with regards to density bonus with market rate projects now being eligible for 50% density bonus, whereas Previously, they were only eligible for 35% density bonus. That's made a big difference in the ability for projects to move forward or not. So 
Um, just wanted to, to provide that additional information for the council's consideration. Council Member Cummings. Thank you, uh, Director Butler, um, and for reminding us about the housing element <clears throat> direction. I do again, though, want to point out that prior to that direction, the city council in, um, in relation to the item that's before us provided direction to encourage appropriate new residential and mixed use development, specifically including enhanced affordable housing opportunities as part of um, what's before us today. And we have that ordinance language before us. Um, the, pl the Planning Commission has you know, weighed in numerous times on this. And the reason why these changes are being made right now is because we provide direction and sometimes the city staff acts on it and sometimes they don't. And that's why many people have had issues with uh, trusting our city government. Um, it's why we continue to see division. It's why you know, our city employees don't trust um, you know, the decisions that are being made by council or sometimes what's being made, what's being said by the city manager. No offense, Matt, I know you're new. Um, but you know, this is the, the trust issue is something that needs to be addressed and we could have addressed this um, you know, over the few years that this has been studied and that this has been before the public and it hasn't been. And that's the you know, reason why this um, language is being proposed today and this evening. And it's not to say that we have, we have made a lot of progress, I will say, on affordable housing. And in part, we are actually getting the 15% um, within projects as a of, of inclusionary and new projects as a result of us passing the 20% inclusionary increase. Because before, with the density bonus at 15%, we were only getting a full, den a full inclusionary density of 11%. So I just want to make sure that that's clear to the public and then also just, you know, again, restate that we did provide direction on this um, previously, and a lot of people feel like that they weren't heard. Vice Mayor Watkins. Um, well, I have a lot to say on this, but I do know that we've had this conversation as far as I've witnessed several times over the, um, over the years, and I know that members of the community are really interested in, in the action that we're here before us to take. Um, I, you know, I don't feel comfortable bringing us back to the substitute motion. I don't feel comfortable with the language. I think that um, given what we heard from the staff in regards to some of the state law and um, not having adequate time to analyze it, as well as some of the legal liabilities associated with the proposed changes to the street tree ordinate or street tree direction, I, I personally, uh, if we're ready to kind of get going on that, I feel like I won't be supportive of the substitute motion. Um, I do want to speak to something that I keep thinking about that Councilmember Brown brought up, which was um, in regards to fear mongering and um, their, the accusation. And I, I, you know, I don't want to speak to anybody's intentions around um, what they're hoping to accomplish. But I will say, when something is phrased a certain way, like to save something from something, there is an implication of a threat. And so I think if we're wanting to be really clear with language, I think that's important for us to really be aware of. And so I just wanted to, um, to share that because it was something that was on my mind given that comment. But given where we're at in the evening and knowing a number of people are waiting for us to um, make, direct, make a decision here, I think I'll just state that I won't be supporting the substitute motion and I'm happy to go back to the original motion. Thank you. Are there any uh, final comments? before we take a vote on the substitute motion. Okay. May we have a roll call vote on the substitute Member motion? Member Johnson? No. Boulder? No. Cummings? Aye. Brown? Aye. Myers? No. Vice Mayor Watkins? No. Mayor Bruder? No. That motion does not pass. Five to two. And so now we are at um, the original motion that is on the floor. There was a, a motion that was passed by, uh, made by uh, Vice Mayor Watkins, seconded by Council Member Kalantari Johnson. 
and that was a motion um, with the staff recommendations um, except changing item two from option one streamline to option three hybrid. Are you raising your hand? <laughs> I didn't know if you were pointing or raising your hand. Uh, Council Member Cummings. Yeah, I just want to say um, I do want to acknowledge the staff's work on all of this. It's been a long time, and um, we do need to um, move forward with you know, building design objective standards so that we you know don't get gigantic cinder blocks popping up in neighborhoods. Um, so that part of this, I'm very supportive of, and the work that was done on that. Um, however, you know the density of what's before us today and. Uh, it seems like there were some pieces that were added at different points in time. A lot of people felt like uh, they didn't get the full picture with enough time to provide adequate comment. Um, I will also just say as a comment on um, what's before us and kind of the process, it's based in the, in, the, in the agenda report, I think it was mentioned that at the most recent meeting that was held on this, only 12 people showed up. And we've been receiving you know, close to 100 or more uh, comments on this item, which leads me to believe that, you know, when it comes to these kinds, the outreach that's done around these kinds of items, we really need to have a better way to communicate this with the community because we know that this is extremely important. Um, the Leonard Street neighbors have come out to us and they were shocked to find out about it think when this was heard back in August. And so, you know, we really, I think we really need to do a better job of trying to um, engage the community and if it seems like what we're doing isn't working, then maybe trying to figure out what's the best process to get better en engagement and better comments on these types of items. And so um, I'm, while I am supportive of the uh, objective design um, standards moving forward um, based on everything that's being incorporated into this and some of the feedback we've been hearing from the community, I'm not gonna support um, the motion that's before us. Um, and I'm glad that we were all able to come together around the how we address the Leonard Street neighborhood. So. I'll leave my comments there and we can go ahead and vote. Council member Kalantari Johnson. I just wanted to make some comments um, as well. Um, I wanted to just acknowledge the years of work that staff have put into this. I wanna acknowledge all of the community members who came here tonight and spoke and community members who called in. Um, and I think there is fear because things are changing and change is scary. Um, I know that we're not always in agreement with policy directions, but it's important that we acknowledge, I mean, I, you know, we, we just had a measure on our um, ballots that I think to some was trying to stop change and it overwhelmingly did not pass. So we have to embrace that change is coming, but how we work together and how we move forward with change can do a lot for staying in integrity with what we want for our community. So I just, I wanna acknowledge that, yes, there's fear because change is scary and it, the unknown is scary, but um, I'm hopeful that we can work together and, and make, create the community that we want. Um, there's a need for housing, there's a need for us to do it with as much local control as possible given what's happening at the state. That's a backlash of, of past policy decisions that we've made, so it's, it's moving forward and, and um, continuing to engage with the community. So again, just wanna thank staff and thank everyone who came out um, tonight and previous nights. And you know, we've had three months between the first session of this being forward and now, um, and I've communicated and connected with a lot of people. So just thank you all. Thank you. Um, this really is aligning our zoning code with our general plan. And I know that we've had a small percentage of community members very engaged in this process, reading the materials and taking time to give feedback and input. And a lot of that has been incorporated and taken into um, consideration. And um, we have to really, um, you know, with with the staff recommendations, I know it's taken many um, thoughtful hours of incorporating all of that um, into the recommendations. Um, um, I would have even voted for the streamlined option one um, because I really feel that would have given the most local control. Um, but I will be supporting this motion 
Um, the hybrid option um, is something that I feel comfortable for uh, a successful path forward for our community and for our housing needs. Um, it's very clear that um, our community wants uh, more controls and this is the way to get there. Um, and so thank you for the staff, uh, to the staff um, for getting us to some very clear points through lots of materials and um, I will pass it on. Did you have a comment? Anybody else? Council Member Golder. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I kind of echo the sentiments um, that you just expressed, Mayor, in that, <clears throat> and a little bit of what you shared as well, in that, you know, this is a path forward to get more control. Right now, the, we could have um, every single family residence could be up to, I don't know what it is, is it 30 feet or 28 feet? But it's not. And so it is scary to think that these things could happen, but I think in all likelihood, the town, the people acquiring these parcels and this development happening to what some people are afraid of, including myself, within my lifetime is probably slim to none. But I just think that moving forward with giving us uh, maximum control as allowed by state law will help keep neighbors and community members feeling the trust and um, with that, with that I'm supportive of the motion okay um, may we have a roll call vote please council members Kalantari Johnson aye Holder aye Tommy no Brown no Meyer aye Vice Mayor Watkin aye and Mayor Bruner aye that motion passes five to two. And that concludes our meeting for uh, today, November 15th, 2022. We will be meeting again for a special meeting on November 29th, I believe at 4.30, but that will be posted on the city website. Four. Four o'clock. Thank you, have a wonderful evening.